2021 has been a long year. A lot has happened. My wife and I had a kid. My network launched two new podcasts. And I finally got those old logs full of ants out of my yard. 2021 has been full of terrifying stories, too. So, I've compiled this episode, featuring 25 of the scariest stories I've read this year. These stories were included based on my opinion, and the opinions of some listeners who helped me out. Enjoy. Remember to send me your scary story soon, so I can have nightmares in 2022 as well. And check out Freaky Folklore and Redwood Bureau on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you need more horror-filled shows to listen to. Have a happy new year. Now, let's begin. Delivery to the Forest Ranch from Dollar Holler I lived in a comfy little town in northern Texas, where, as you drive along those winding roads, you would see gates with titling that would read such and such ranch. Basically, it seemed like everything other than some retail buildings was ranch land. Lots of cows, horses, and crops. It's nice if you like the scenery, but if you prefer having things to do, it's not the greatest. I mean, even if you like going camping or hiking, you'd have to drive quite a ways before hitting property that ain't private land. At the time, I worked as a pizza delivery driver. It wasn't a hard job, but dang was it stressful. Delivery just wasn't that profitable when each delivery destination was several miles apart. Driving so much every night really gets to you. In the future, I would come to realize that other delivery places in different towns had mileage restrictions far smaller than what we had at that little pizza place. No joke, I would often drive 15 miles between destinations, though now I know national chains like Domino's restrict their delivery to 5 or 6 miles or so, depending on drive time. Even with the roads having higher speed limits out in that area because of the wide country roads, it would often take me 20 minutes to get to someone's residence. I guess the good news was most folks in that area understood that ordering a pizza meant that the food wouldn't be hot and fresh out of the oven by then. Everyone was still friendly. Seriously, I don't remember a single order that wasn't positive or neutral with the customer. Regarding customers, I never had any holdups, complaints, or arguments. Nothing. Folks were just kind. In the summer, I'd have customers offer me bottled or canned drinks before heading back out. Sorry for the long setup. This brings me to my extremely creepy experience I had, delivering to a certain ranch I will not name. I'd rather not dox a friendly customer's residence just because something happened on their land. We got a call for two large pizzas, both Canadian bacon, my personal favorite. We prepared them, I jumped in my car, checked my gas, and headed out on my way. Always want to double check your gas before and after deliveries. The address was to a ranch 14 miles from the restaurant. Luckily, much of the road there had a speed limit of 70 miles per hour, so I could probably get there with the pizza still hot enough. It was 7.30 p.m. and completely dark by then. There was thunder and lightning on occasion with clouds covering the entirety of the night sky, so between flashes of lightning, it was nearly pitch black out. I got onto the highway and turned on my high beams. There was no oncoming traffic the whole way, so my high beams would be fine. They were practically a necessity, with how often deer would run out onto the road. Several minutes later, I turned right onto a dirt road. This road seemed to get thinner the further I drove along, to the point I was starting to drive extremely cautiously to avoid low-hanging branches and outreaching plants that threatened to scratch my car. I had no idea how close I was to the residence then, or how long this dirt road would go on for. I was so focused on avoiding obstacles that I nearly screamed when I saw something run across the road. It scared the bejesus out of me, to be quite honest. I saw flashes of fur and immediately thought, freaking deer. I breathed in deep and let my heart settle for a second, before continuing on the drive. The moment I stepped on the gas again, though, I heard something slap into the right side of my car. Again, I was terribly startled. 
I slammed the brake as before and looked over to the passenger side. It was so dark out there, I couldn't see anything outside unless it was being hit by my headlights. I couldn't even see the bushes and tree branches that were nearly close enough to my car to scrape the windows. Seriously? I wondered. What was that? A bird? Did a bird just fly into my car? I was determined to finish this delivery so I could get out of this place as fast as possible. After all, when two weird things happen back to back, a person quickly goes from focused or even bored to on edge. I eased off the brake, still scanning the surroundings on both sides of me. I began to push down slightly on the accelerator. Finally, I'm moving again, and for a few moments, everything seemed normal. Then slap, 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 something repeatedly and in quick succession slaps my window, the driver window, three times. I swear to God, I hit the brakes and heard someone running into the trees while laughing. I was sure of it then that someone was out here messing with me which possibly meant that someone ordered these pizzas just to make me the victim of their immature pranks. Too frightened to get out of the car, I rolled the window down a slight bit, leaning my face forward, then shouting, Knock it off! It ain't freaking funny! Then I rolled the window back up. The moment the glass hit the top of the door, signaling that it was back in place, I heard something that sent chills down my spine. Keep in mind, I keep my doors locked as I drive. I always have, always did, always will. And yet, somehow, the back passenger door had opened. Immediately, I heard someone hurriedly scoot across the seat to the other side so that they would sit in the seat directly behind mine. I even heard them giggle behind me. There was an undertone to their voice, like their vocal cords were all messed up or damaged, maybe from years of smoking or something. My mind conjured images of a druggie rather than kids messing with me on this dark dirt road. Have you ever been so scared that you're too afraid to look in the direction of what's scaring you? That's exactly how I felt. Someone was in my car with me. Heck, the back passenger door was still open. I could not only hear, but also feel someone's breath behind me. Yet, for a moment, I stayed motionless. Eventually, I resolved to turn all at once. I counted down in my head. Three. Two. One. I turned so fast I felt the muscles and bones in my neck ache in disagreement. My fist was raised, ready to defend myself as I looked into the back seats. They were empty. But the back passenger door still hung open. Horrified, I swallowed hard and rapidly crawled over through the middle of the car, yanked the door shut, then sat back down in the driver's seat, clicking the lock button repeatedly on the door to lock all the doors in the car but as I said before, they had already been locked. I knew I'd felt someone else in that car with me. I was certain of it. I couldn't just turn away from them again to keep driving. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to check the trunk. The back seats of my car had levers with which you could access the trunk from the interior of the car. My paranoia grew, telling me that this interloper was still here but they were now hiding in the trunk. Trembling, I crawled over the middle again and lowered one of the seats. I peered into the trunk. It was dark, but I had just enough visibility from the ceiling light that I could tell that there was no one there. I crawled over the middle again, sitting down in the driver's seat and breathing slowly. My eyes were watery with terror, like I was passively crying from feeling so shaken up tap tap. This time I didn't hesitate. Instinctively, I turned toward the tapping sound which had come from the driver window just next to me. Someone was pressing their face into the glass from outside. They were there only an extremely brief moment before they took off giggling. I saw them. 
I swear to God, their entire face was covered in hair, gray hair, and their eyes had been solid black. From what I could see, there wasn't an inch of bare skin on them at all. For the quarter of a second that I saw them, they didn't look completely human. I know it makes me sound crazy, but I saw what I saw. They, or it, took off into the woods so fast, they were lost in the dark before I could see much else. By then, I was flooring it through the dirt road. I'd never felt so horrified in my life, let alone confused. About two minutes later, I broke through the tree line. Suddenly, I hit the brakes as fast as I could, barely avoiding hitting a gate. I could see a two-story home about half a football field away beyond the gate. The lights were on. The gate was closed. Behind me were those darned woods. I would need to get out to lift the latch on the gate to drive through. Screw that. I'm sorry if it sounds bad on my part, but I blared my car horn over and over and over until I saw someone at the house open the door and begin to walk my way. The last thing on earth I wanted to do in that moment was get out of my car. Not with the woods so close behind me. A man who appeared to be in his fifties came out with a rifle and a flashlight. He opened the gate and walked over to my window. I lowered it. Jesus, boy, you scared the daylights out of me. Everything all right? Yes, sir. I... I just had some trouble getting up here is all. His eyebrow raised at me. You're the pizza guy. Go on ahead and drive through. I'll close the gate after you if you don't mind giving me a lift back to the house. Sure thing, was all I could mutter. Though I wasn't sure I was supposed to have any non-employees in my car while on the clock, at the moment I didn't care. Well, the man did just that. I pulled through, he closed the gate, and then he sat in the passenger seat after I placed the pizzas in the back. You look real shaken up there. You sure you're okay? He insisted. Uh, I'll be completely honest with you, sir. I was driving on the road up here where the road's real narrow and all. Then someone started running around my car, hitting it and giving me a pretty bad scare. I explained. Christ, I'm so sorry. He apologized. I glanced at him and he looked genuinely sad. I thought it was over. What? What do you mean? It's... Uh, it's nothing to worry about. Just, just some trouble we've been having around here. The man stepped out after I parked. We were in his driveway now. I grabbed the pizzas and walked with him to the door. He opened it, took the pizzas, then said, One sec. He closed the door. Even though there were porch lights on around me, keeping the darkness at bay, I couldn't help but feel watched by the forest in the distance just beyond the gate. The door opened again, and I nearly jumped. The man stood there, still looking as if he had something to feel guilty about. He still had his rifle, too, but he stretched out his hand to me. Here, take this for your troubles. I kid you not, this man handed me five hundred dollars. Sir, that's too much, I, I can't... I insist, take it. Get back in your car and follow me out into those fields. There's a separate entrance over there. Might take you longer to get back, but it's safe. I know it's safe. Okay then, thank you so much, I said. I got back in the car. The older man walked around the house and beckoned me with his free hand. I steadily drove over the grass. His backyard was a well-kept field of grass with a couple of different shed-looking buildings on either side. In the distance, there was another gate. But the closer we got to it, the more I realized it was far less maintained than the other. This entrance really was seldom used. I remember thinking, why didn't he just get back in the car with me and show me where to go? The poor guy was walking another two-thirds of a football field in the dark to show me how to leave. I got to the gate. He opened it, then walked over to my window, gesturing for me to lower it. Now this road is much more wide and the forest ends much sooner. 
but you'll be on an old logging road that takes a few minutes to get back to the highway. Just go left when the woods ends, and you're all set. Thank you again. I'm sorry if the pizzas are all cold by now. I didn't mean to take so long getting here. He shook his head and waved his hand at me. No, 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 D don't worry about that. I'm sorry for the trouble. We won't be ordering no delivery for a while. Not till we get this taken care of. Then the man walked away to the gate. I pulled through and kept driving as he shut the gate behind me. I did get a little spooked being back in the woods again, but he was right. A few seconds of a forest drive and there I was on a one-lane road. Ten minutes later I was back on the highway and the ordeal was over. I was able to head back to the restaurant. I couldn't help but wonder if they were having trouble with the front entrance. Why was the back seldom used? What was going on there? I can't honestly tell you much else. I never did get a call to go back to that ranch. None of my co-workers did either. Believe me, I asked around. In fact, none of them had ever gotten a call from that ranch in the past. I figured that meant the folks living there only made that one call then stopped calling for deliveries once again. This problem they had, that the man did not explain, it seems they'd been having it for a while. And for the next few years, I worked at that pizza place and none of us ever did get a call from that ranch. So maybe they never got that problem taken care of. I don't know what's going on in those woods, but I pray that family's all right. I've since moved to Missouri. I work in delivery still, but the drives are far more manageable. To all my friends out there who deliver, stay safe and try to bring some sort of protection. It could be worth it. Remember to keep your gas tanks filled, because if I had been stranded in those woods with that thing, I don't know what would have happened. The Cabin from Wolvesbane Even when I was little, I had a great love for Michigan. Ever since my parents decided on an impromptu spring vacation up in the vacation home that belonged to my grandparents, I was smitten. The secluded cabin, the field splayed out right beside it that I could play all day in. What wasn't there to love? That cabin was my safe place. There was nothing up there I didn't find absolutely breathtaking and wonderful. That was until a few years ago. In 2017, my husband and I had finally tied the knot after being together for five years, and that's when my parents gave us the news that they would be selling us the cabin. In only a matter of four days, after deciding to spend our honeymoon up in Michigan, before packing up our lives back home, Lee, my husband, and I were catching a flight to our new home. The familiarity of the gravel road crunching beneath the rental car's tires was what woke me from my unintentional sleep, as well as Lee's low whistle and amazement at the acres of land. Wow, hon, you weren't kidding. This place is something else. I laughed. When will you learn I'm always right? In the midst of our banter, Lee had parked the car in the middle of the large driveway, and the second the car doors automatically unlocked, I was outside, breathing in the fresh air. We pulled our luggage from the trunk, and I practically sprinted up the front stairs with my suitcase thumping up them behind me. Hurry up, slowpoke, our honeymoon awaits. Lee only shook his head and laughed. Elena, I love you, but we both know you couldn't give a crap about our honeymoon right now. You just want to get inside and bask in the memories of your youth. I rolled my eyes, taking the keys from my husband's hand once he reached me. Are you calling me old? There was no ounce of seriousness in my tone. I simply enjoyed pulling his leg. I turned the key in the lock, twisting the door handle. Dust particles floated in the air inside the cabin, cloth tarps covering the furniture. No one had been up here since my grandparents passed away in 2011. Even when my parents found out, they inherited the place. However, even with how untouched and unclean the place was, it was beautiful. I couldn't help but smile at the sight of the familiar feeling it brought. 
It felt like home. Needs a good dusting, but I think we can handle that. I smiled at my husband, wrapping my arms around his waist. Lee held on to me tightly, looking around the house as well. It's perfect. Oh, how wrong we were. The month of our honeymoon was perfect for the most part. Some light cleaning and relaxing. It was halfway through our stay there that Lee and I found out we were expecting. It hadn't been planned, but we were absolutely ecstatic nonetheless. In fact, my pregnancy was one of the reasons my husband left the night of my first encounter with this thing. Because my cravings came in full force, and Lee, being the great husband he is, drove the hour-long drive into town to get me my potato chips and mint chocolate chip ice cream. Alone, I was lying under my blanket on the couch, dozing off to the sounds of the TV, when the knocking began. It took me a moment to realize it wasn't the TV. Someone was actually pounding on the front door. Now, I've always been scared of being by myself when it was dark. I've never been able to place my finger on the reason why. All I know is that when night fell, my skin would crawl, and I would jump at the smallest of sudden noises. My body was frozen in its spot. My heart began to thump rapidly against my chest. My mind began to make up reasonable excuses. It was probably a neighbor, even though we were the only ones here for miles. Maybe it was Lee and he just forgot the keys. Elena, let me in. It was Lee's voice, but it sounded so wrong. Not comforting and warm, but bone-chilling, cold, like this person had been smoking for most of their life when Lee had never touched a cigarette. I couldn't move. I couldn't even twitch. The only thing I could do was lay frozen as I began to cry. When the banging stopped, I thought it was over, but I was entirely wrong. Sharp nails began to claw on the outside of the cabin, trailing over towards the living room. My eyes widened, and I realized my horrible mistake. The curtains right beside the TV were pulled open. I'd forgotten to pull them down. I soon realized that, as whoever this was grew closer, I'd be able to see them through the window, and they would be able to see me. What I did next, it made me feel like I was five again, but I pulled my blanket over my head and curled in on myself. I couldn't help it. I was terrified. Right after my vision was put into darkness, after I pulled my blanket over my eyes, a sharp tapping sound came from the window. I see you. It was taunting, menacing, and the voice didn't even sound like my husband anymore, but demonic. Evil is the only way I can put it. I felt like I was living in a horror movie. Whatever that was, it wasn't human. Scared? The thing let out a growl. God, it sounded like the embodiment of evil. As I was on the brink of sobbing out of fear, I heard keys jingling in the front door. My heart skipped a beat. He was home, Lee was home, but that thing still stood outside that window. It growled, seemingly out of frustration, and that was it. I pulled the blanket from my face, my eyes blinded by light, and my husband's amused chuckle brought me from my petrified state. What are you doing, you goof? Lee was smiling over me, but the grin quickly dropped when he saw my eyes swollen from crying and how much I was shaking. Hey, hey, it's okay. What happened? His voice was gentle. God, his voice, it was so warm and loving. Nothing like that thing. I tried to speak, but the only thing that came out was a sob. I wrapped my arms around my husband once he sat down beside me, and I couldn't stop until my eyes drifted to that window. Close it. What? Lee sounded puzzled, and I didn't blame him one bit. Close it, Lee. Freaking close it. I jumped from the couch and almost tore the drapes from the pole as I pulled them close. My hands were shaking something fierce, I noticed. 
Alina, honey, what's wrong? Come on, I can't help you calm down if you don't tell me. Lee grabbed me by my shoulders, turning me away from the window. There was someone, something out there, Lee. It was telling me to let it in. I was so scared, I, I thought it was going to get in. The tears came back full force, making my eyes sore. I left out the factor of whatever it was trying and failing to mimic his voice. There was no way he would believe me. When I looked up at Lee, he seemed mad. Not at me, but at the thing that had terrorized me when he was gone. My husband wrapped his arms around me and brought me into a hug. It's okay. They're gone, all right? You're okay. We'll call the police, and I'll go look around in the morning. The police arrived nearly two hours later, and of course they didn't find anything. However, one of them reported back to Lee that there were deep scratch marks in the wall outside, leading straight to the living room window. It took more than a bit of convincing from my parents, but Lee and I still moved into the cabin. I know it sounds stupid, but we made plenty of modifications after that event. We had a gate installed at the beginning of the driveway, and many security cameras put up. We even got gun licenses and purchased two firearms. Years passed and only mild things occurred. Strange screeching from the woods, numerous dead animals littering the field and the makeshift trail we had created. There was even one occurrence when a fresh rabbit carcass was left on the front porch. However, it was what happened only a month ago that made me and Lee start questioning whether or not we should move. Lee and I both worked as mechanics at the shop our friend owned. Sure, it wasn't the best paying job, but it paid the bills. A said friend, Chris, had called us close to five one day, saying that staff was shorthanded and he needed one of us to come down there. I offered to be the one to head over and Lee agreed to finish dinner for ourselves and our two kids. Yeah, that's right, two little troublemakers. Charlie, our daughter, who I was pregnant with during the whole ordeal, and James, our little boy, who came along two years after. I gave Lee a kiss and the kiddos a hug, and I headed into town. When I arrived, I had never seen my best friend look so guilty. Chris continuously apologized for asking me to work, but I simply laughed and waved him off. Let's just get back to work, ya big dork. Hours passed. Chris and I talked about he and Tori, his wife, had begun trying for a baby, and how Lee and I had been thinking about taking the kids back to our hometown to see the folks. It was around 8 when my phone began to ring, and I decided it was time for a break. I picked up my phone and the sight of Lee's caller ID made me smile. Hey you, what's up? However, my husband's frantic voice and the sounds of my kids crying cut me off. Linny? Linny, where are you? Lee asked hurriedly, and his question confused me, as I had texted him an hour ago saying I most likely wouldn't make it home until 9 or 10. Babe, what do you mean? You know I'm still at work. Lee, what's wrong with the kids? Are they okay? Why are they crying? No, 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 you can't be at work. You're... Elena, you're outside. It was that thing. I knew it was. It was there at my house, terrorizing my husband and kids like it did me. My keys were already in my hand, and before I could think, I was waving goodbye at Chris with a simple, I'm sorry, I need to go. It's the thing that was here four years ago, isn't it? Lenny, that's what this is. Never in my life had I heard my husband sound so terrified. Even though he was trying to cover the tremble in his voice, I could tell and it made my heart hurt. The crying of my children only made it worse, and I couldn't imagine how horrified they must be. I want mama. Daddy, I want mama. My daughter was practically wailing. I could hear her completely from the other end. Her sniffles and sobs were soon in my ear, and the fact that I couldn't physically be there to comfort her was agonizing. Sweetheart, it's okay, it's okay. I promise. You have Bubby and Daddy, they're right there with you. 
At that point, I didn't care if I was speeding. I could not drive the hour-long ride back home casually when I knew my family was in danger. Mama, I'm scared. Charlie had never been the kind of kid to cry on a regular basis. When she had cuts and bruises, sure, but never once had I heard her wail like this. The phone was soon passed to my two-year-old, who blubbered incoherently to me. However, I was able to make out bits and pieces. It was at the window. It sounded like Mama. It was telling Sissy to let it inside our room. No matter how much I tried to soothe James, in any way I could, unlike Charlie, his crying only got worse. After telling him to hand the phone to my husband, I could finally let my voice crack and the tears fall. The fact that my children were terrified of something that I was scared of myself and I couldn't be there for them, it made me feel helpless. Finally, our driveway came into view. It was then I realized that I'd have to go outside to open the gate. I cursed under my breath and quickly told Lee that I was about to be driving down the driveway and to have James and Charlie's overnight bags packed. My heart was pounding as I stared out into the woods, which was partially illuminated by my headlights. Something was wrong. I knew this thing was out there, but Lee had told me only minutes before that he could hear the thing walking around outside as well as the occasional growl. Everything in me was screaming not to take a step from my car, but that darned gate needed to be opened manually. What's wrong? Lee's voice came through my phone as I'd gone completely silent. My eyes were lingering on a particular spot in the trees beside me, and I knew, deep down, I knew it was there. It's, it's watching me. I was terrified to speak, my voice barely above a whisper. I wasn't even sure my husband heard me. I... I need to open the gate, but it's out there. Lee, if I go out there, it's going to get me. I can feel it. I was no doubt crying once more. It felt as if I was back at that night four years ago. Listen to me. Do not get out of your car. Stay there, all right? We'll drive down in my truck and I'll open the gate from my side with the keypad. The way our gate worked was you could either open it with the keypad outside on both sides of the gate or open it manually. However, the entry keypad had been busted for more than three weeks, but the other worked perfectly fine. Be careful. With two quick I love yous, I reluctantly hung up the phone. I soon realized how dead silent the woods had become. Not the deafening sound of crickets, just complete and utter silence. Suddenly, I heard it. Sharp nails lightly tapping on the back window. My breath hitches, and my body went rigid. With my heart beating rapidly against my chest, I reached a shaking hand out to my radio, pressing the knob to turn it on. With the music blasting to drown out the tapping, I closed my eyes. Whatever this thing was, I knew it would look just as horrific as it made me feel, and I refused to let myself see it. I felt my car shake as it bumped against it, and I only clenched my eyes tighter. That's when it broke through the sound of the random music station, a growl so guttural it shook me to my very core. It was slow, drawn out, this darn thing knew what it was doing. It knew just how to make me feel petrified. It was then that I slowly grew more angry than anything else. This thing was on my property, terrorizing me and my family, and it was then that I decided enough was enough. I threw the car into reverse and shouted at the top of my lungs, Screw off! and floored it backwards into the thing. My car hit something hard, and it fell underneath my tires. Beneath the vehicle came an echoing scream, my skin crawling at the sound. I was halfway in the road when I slammed on my brakes and I summoned the courage to look at where the thing should have been. But there was nothing. Not even blood. I heard the gate creak open and the headlights of Lee's truck blinded me for a moment. I decided to take the lead and have them follow me to the closest gas station. It took 15 minutes, but eventually we both pulled into the parking lot. 
Neither of our cars were completely parked before both me and Lee, as well as our kids, were out of our vehicles and hugging each other. That night will always haunt both myself and my husband, but with my children being so young, I hope the memory will fade. We're currently staying at an Airbnb for the time being until we find a place. If we stay in Michigan or move back home, we'll just have to see. That night we stayed with Chris and his wife, and I researched about this thing until at least four in the morning. The two that matched it almost perfectly were a Wendigo or a Skinwalker. Heck, maybe even the Rake, though that's just a creepypasta. Maybe. However, one thing I do know is that the cabin that I once considered paradise was a nightmare that will forever haunt me. Hiding from a Blind Monster From Skeptic No More I live in Scotland, UK. I won't say exactly where, but it's pretty rural. I've lived here my whole life and never spent more than my uni years away. A born and raised Highland country girl for 29 years and counting. I'd never had any spooky supernatural experiences or creepy ghost stories, as my username suggests. I wasn't a believer in any of that. I'm no stranger to the woods or the glens. I camp, hike, and swim in nature for fun. Even when I'm at home, I like to chill out on the porch on my phone. I've always felt so comfortable with nature. I suppose it helps knowing that the UK has no especially dangerous animals, and the fact I live a good jaunt away from even the smallest town. So no people to worry about either. It was completely private and secluded, just how I like it. But a few days ago, as of writing this, I had an encounter, and honestly, I'm not really sure what happened. I've told a few close friends, one of which encouraged me to submit my story here. She says it'll help me come to terms with it. I hope she's right. Here goes. Despite these stereotypes about the Scottish Highlands, we do actually get summer here. It can get really hot and sunny on the right day. It was that sort of day, and I figured I'd go to the small lake about 40 minutes from my house and take a dip. The walk there was just like every other time. Woods, field, hill, more woods than a clearing and the lake. It's my little slice of heaven. It's so beautiful. The water trickles down from higher up, so it's really clear. Honestly, it looks like something out of a fancy commercial. I threw off my clothes just down to my swimming suit and jumped in. The lake is about the width of an average canal, for reference, and deep enough that I can only just touch the bottom on my tiptoes. Though granted, I'm not the tallest lass. I swam for a while and just enjoyed cooling off. For the record, it was about half eleven in the morning, and that's when the first weird thing happened. A loud ruckus in the bushes made me jump, as, all of a sudden, three deer came tearing through, jumping through a shallower part of the water and off into the other side of the woods, the way I'd come up from. Now this was really, really strange. I'm not quiet when I swim. I splash around and typically sing to myself if I'm in the mood, and I was. The deer around here aren't used to humans, so they avoid coming anywhere near you. I'd only ever seen a few from miles away through my whole life. So for them to run towards my noisy self without even giving me a glance was really off. In hindsight, I know now why they were running so blindly, but we'll get to that. I was a little uneasy after that. I knew that, rationally, they were probably just in season or something, but it didn't sit right with me. After a few more minutes, I got out of the water and decided I'd walk back home. Usually, I towel off by the river, get redressed, and then head off. But this time, I just didn't want to hang around there any longer than I already had. 
I threw on my shirt and trousers as quickly as I could, and I made a move back down the way I'd come, the way the deer had gone. And yes, I was still soaking wet. I figured the warm weather would dry me off, but I'd made one really stupid mistake. Thanks to not wanting to faff around, trying the laces, I'd left my boots in my bag and opted to walk home barefoot. Heading back through the woods seemed very strange. Birds were very vocal, bugs were buzzing like mad, and I kept catching glimpses of wild rabbits. Everything was heading away, downwards, downwind, and in quite a hurry, just like the deer had been. I was getting more and more freaked out, which is very out of character for me. I'd picked up my pace from a casual walk to just shy of a jog. I found myself looking around frantically, as if I was trying to spot something, though I had no idea what. I can't say I had some feeling of being watched or stalked. It just felt as if I was unwelcome, in the wrong place kind of thing. Thanks to the animals going nuts, mainly the birds up in the branches, I couldn't hear much of anything else. That's why it took me so off guard. I was looking around like I'd been for nearly ten minutes, but this time, as I swung my eyes to the right, I saw something new. I saw a figure quite clearly. It was keeping pace with me, shadowing me, staring straight at me. I'm still not 100% sure what it looked like. It was very slender, had a thin layer of stark white hair, and moved with a smooth but loping manner. I know its head was turned to face me, but as strange as it sounds, I have no clue what its face looked like. It was like when I saw it, my eyes just slipped off of it, as if I instinctively averted my gaze to the trees and bushes. My heart skipped a beat, and I almost tripped over myself in sheer shock. I can't quite remember my thought process, but it was something along the lines of, What is that? How long has it been keeping up with me? What does it want? What should I do? All at once, some trees came between me and the thing I'd glimpsed, and I just stopped dead. Every fiber of my body was screaming like alarm bells that I was in danger, but I was not to run. I don't know why, but my immediate thought was to climb the nearest tree and take it from there. In equal measure, I both wanted to see it again to figure out what the heck it was, but also not to set my eyes on it again. My whole body was shaken to the core. I felt sick and dizzy, trying to wrap my head around it. As strange as it sounds, when I'd seen it for that split second, I felt offended, like subconsciously deep down I was genuinely disgusted that this thing was there, that it actually existed. So close I could see the bushes being pushed down as it clambered through them. My messed up state aside, I made it up the tree and tried to catch my breath on a decently large branch. I had to sit on the larger part and balance myself by using my feet to press against the other part of the trunk. It was one of those trees that grows into a kind of Y shape. For a few moments I sat there, slowly scanning the forest floor below, looking for anything. It was dead silent now. All the freaked out animals had booked it far away. It was just me, my tree, my pounding heart, and the consuming fear that it was still around. I didn't know if I just hadn't heard it approach because of the birds or if it was just that silent. The idea only made me feel even more queasy. After what felt like ages, I spotted the slightest rustle in a patch of bushes, and then I heard it. Breathing, or maybe sniffing. It was dog-like but very quiet. It almost seemed to be coming from all around me. Then the bushes rustled again, and it stopped. I was petrified, staying as still as I could, desperately listening for anything at all, stuck in that darned tree. 
Now, this is where my haste in leaving the river came back to mess with me. I felt something on my right foot, something small, barely even noticeable at first. But then another, and another, and more and more, like tiny little touches, super light, but moving. I tilted my head to see, only to realize the cause. It was ants, tiny black specks pouring out of little holes in the bark and towards my feet. Thankfully, the ants here in the UK don't tend to be the biting or stinging sort. I almost wish they would have been, in retrospect. It would have been easier to ignore. No, these little guys did something far worse. They tickled. At first, they were only just noticeable, but as more and more climbed onto my feet, it quickly became unbearable. You'd think when you're scared to death, you'd be able to ignore something so silly. Heck, normally I'm not even a ticklish person, but my senses were heightened to the max, paranoid about this thing that was still down in the woods somewhere. Just as I was going to pull my feet away and relocate how I was sitting, I saw it again. It just strolled out brazenly into the open. It held its head high, sniffing the air again. My eyes tried to move off of it, from sheer reflex, but this time I forced myself to look at it. It was huge. Even hunched over, it stood taller than anyone I'd ever met, long bony arms resting on the ground like a gorilla, a visible spine pushing against the patchy white fur. Its face, though, I've never seen anything like it. I can't even think of an animal to compare it to. I guess the best comparison I could say would be like a very, and I mean very, malnourished cow. It had no horns and large pointed ears like a canine, but the facial structure was just pure disfigurement. That's when I noticed several things all at once. Its mouth was slightly open, drooling and lined with mismatched, jagged teeth. Its nostrils were bloodied, with one completely collapsed, and finally it was looking straight at me. Here's the thing, though. It was blind. It had these sickly, pus-filled, milky eyes. It was looking straight at me, sniffing, but had no idea I was a few meters away. I could have spat and probably hit it. I tried to stay as still as humanly possible, staring at this abomination. The ants, however, had different plans. When I say they were covering my feet, I mean it. I was having to balance myself by pressing just my toes against the bark. Like I said earlier, I'm not a tall girl, and this meant they were all over the undersides of my poor feet. I couldn't even move a hand to cover my mouth with how I was balancing. It was insane. I was staring down at this completely unnatural thing, and all I could do was try not to giggle. I tried to move one foot away, but the second I so much as knocked a leafy branch, the creature's ears twitched, and its head snapped to where the sound had come from. Putting my foot back, however, only seemed to shake the bark and caused even more ants to come exploring. The creature was coming closer, slowly walking towards the tree, sniffing so loudly it was almost wheezing. It reached the bottom of the tree and lifted its head up. Then came its first arm. It was so long, it almost reached where I was immediately. I saw its hand, a gnarled mess of curved claws jutting out of knuckles, almost like that of a sloth. Its claws sunk into the bark like it was nothing. Then it reared up, and from what I could tell, prepared to climb. I was weighing my options. Should I jump out of the tree and make a run for it? There was no way I'd outrun this thing, and from this high up, I'd probably break my ankle. Then I'd really be done for. My other option seemed to be staying still and hoping it would somehow miss me. But I knew from so close, it would likely manage to get my scent. Then ever present were my little tormentors. Just as I thought I was going to either pass out or let a few giggles slip past my trembling lips. Something no short of a miracle happened. 
In the distance, a sound rang out. It was quiet, but in such silence it could still be heard. It was a car door slamming shut. The creature's whole body twisted, and it tore off into the woods at a terrifying speed. It even ripped a fist-sized hole in the tree where its claws had been. No sooner did I have the chance, I snatched my feet from the ants and covered my mouth to let out a mixture of long-repressed hysterics, both laughing and crying. I climbed down the tree with less care than I should have, cutting my palm on some of the broken bark on my way down. Once I was on Sky's ground, I shook the remaining ants off and made a beeline for home. I desperately wanted to run, but I knew I couldn't risk making a sound. Though jumpy and paranoid, I closed the distance and got out of the woods and into my house. I was even careful to shut the door quietly. After all, that slamming car door sounded like it was ages away and my house was only about 10 minutes from where I'd just hidden from it. I haven't seen it since, though I've hardly been outside since then too. The few close friends I've told all believe me. Thankfully, they know I'm not the sort to joke about and prank people. I don't know what happened with that car and whatever poor person was getting in or out. I hope they're okay. I also must admit that I'm kind of worried about cutting my hand on the bark. What if that thing gets my scent from it? Maybe I'm still just too shaken from it all. Just be careful in the woods. It doesn't matter what's supposed to live there. Nature doesn't play by our rules, and there are things we don't know still out there. This has cemented it for me. There really is no such thing as a safe forest. Why I Don't Go Into Hospital Morgues From Your Creepy Uncle Jeff I work in the field of funeral care. Specifically, I work for a company that picks up and transports the bodies of deceased loved ones from hospitals, homes, or anywhere else someone has died to the funeral home, where they'll be kept and processed until finally being put into the ground. I've been in this job for many years now, and honestly, I love it. I get to have a part in helping others during what is often one of the hardest and darkest moments in their lives. Some of the best calls I go on are the ones where the whole house is filled with grieving, crying people because you know that person was loved and will certainly be missed. Though the job is certainly rewarding, it has its days that one could never forget. Like the day where a man had been found dead on his floor for days with his face melting into the heat register that he fell onto or the time a 650-pound woman was found in her room that had so much rancid food, the entire building was found to have a maggot infestation and had maggots falling onto us from the ceiling. Or the 15-year-old boy who hung himself because of his parents' daily reminders of how he wasn't the perfect daughter they always wanted. I could go on, but I think you get the picture. Work can be great, but it can leave dark spots in your memory forever. Getting to the story. One of the most common runs I find myself on is going to hospital morgues, taking out as many people as possible, and taking them to be delivered for embalming or cremation at the many funeral homes around the state. This particular hospital I've been to many times, so many in fact that I knew most of the security guards by name. The guard who came to meet me, who I'll call Jed, escorted me through the winding halls and maze-like labyrinth that seemed to make up the lower levels of hospitals. We talked about our lives, how work was treating us, and swapped stories of the crazy experiences that these jobs will occasionally bestow upon us. When we got to the morgue, I went through the usual procedures. Sign documentation, draw up ankle tags, put on gloves, confirm all the bodies are exactly who they're supposed to be. Typically, Jed will stay with me the whole time, in case I need any help moving someone, 
and to make sure that everything is locked up again when I leave. This time, though, Jed received a call on his radio about an angry woman who had just attempted to assault a nurse for telling her some information she didn't like. Jed told me he had to go, and that he'd be back as soon as possible. He rushed off and left me alone in the cooler. I didn't mind. Some people find being alone with dead bodies a very unnerving experience, always wary of the haunting gaze of their glazed-over dead eyes, but not me. I like talking to bodies, venting about my day, entrusting important secrets, or just simply telling them how good my lunch sounds, all of which falls onto ears that will never again be able to retell the words I impart to them. As I was detailing the lunch I would be having as soon as I got back to the van, I noticed a sound. It sounded like someone brushing against the plastic of the body bags that the bodies were stored in. I looked around the room, expecting Jed to maybe have come back, trying to startle me like he'd done numerous times before. There was no one else in the room, so I chalked it up to one of the fans rustling some of the plastic. I moved the first body without issue, but when I went to pull out the second one, I heard that sound again. It sounded just like someone slightly moving the plastic shrouds, but in a quiet way, like they were trying to keep me from noticing it. I decided to just load up this last body, and then to make my exit whether Jed was back or not, I opened the bag to compare my ankle tag with the one the hospitals put on the toe. When the lights began to flicker and the fans started to pulse and shudder, it lasted for a long moment. Then everything suddenly went dark and silent. I cursed in surprise, then began to slowly shuffle my way across the dark, cold room. I froze in my tracks when the silence was shattered by a quiet sound, seemingly amplified by the silence of that room. The sound of a zipper slowly unzipping from the back of the room. I internally screamed at my body to get to the door to put as much distance between me and the sound as possible, but it refused to listen. The unnerving sound of the zipper cemented me into place. After a long, tense moment, the sound ceased. My mind was racing to come up with an explanation for the sound. Was it a prank? Perhaps another sound just misinterpreted in the dark room. My panicked thoughts were interrupted by another sound, plastic shifting, then the slap of something smacking onto the floor. Control rushed back into my body as I heard footsteps slowly smacking one after another on the hard concrete floor. It was coming closer to me. I ran across the room, desperate to find the door and escape this new chilled prison, but the room seemed longer than it should have been. The further I ran, the faster and closer the footsteps sounded to fall. Just as the footsteps seemed to put whatever was chasing me just a few feet behind me, my feet seemed to just fly out from beneath me. I fell to the floor with a painful thud, and once again all sound ceased. I lay there for what felt like an eternity, waiting to hear something, anything, that would tell me where the source of the sound had gone. The dark and cold were the only things my body could register for a few moments, before I became aware of the sensation of something hovering inches from my face. Once again, my body froze in terror of what unseen horror had placed itself directly in front of me. I felt an icy breath exhale onto my face, the stench of decay and death briefly overloading my senses as the wet sound of a mouth slowly opening began. I felt whatever it was lean closer toward me, just about to touch me, when the door to the cooler burst open. The room was suddenly flooded with light and the sound of fans whirring ceaselessly. Jed asked me if everything was okay as he looked into the room. I was sprawled across the floor, pale and breathless, with a body on the floor on the other side of the room. 
I told him I just tripped and fell as I was coming out to get him to help me pick up a body that I accidentally dropped. He laughed at me as we picked up and returned the fallen body to its crypt table. I loaded up my last body and bolted out and away from that hospital. I don't know what happened in that room. If it was a hallucination, or if I was witnessing some kind of paranormal encounter, I don't know. I still work this job, and I still go to hospitals all over the state, but suffice to say, I don't go into any morgue coolers anymore, without someone with me the entire time. The Wide Man by an anonymous poster on 4chan. Sunday, my father passed away. He'd be 55 come April. He and I were never close, although we had no bad blood between us either. We just had nothing in common, and I never cared, perhaps assuming we'd always have time to form a relationship later on. He wasn't unhealthy, so I never put much effort into going out and visiting him, and in fact I hadn't seen him in three years. Possibly I'm feeling guilty for never showing interest in my father. Perhaps I'm just missing him and want to talk about him. But tonight I want to tell you a story about my father, and maybe get some information on a thing he called the White Man. My father was a very typical suburban dad, and frankly, very boring. He had typical dad interests, like fishing and hunting and bowling. He would wear crocs and turtlenecks and drove a hatchback with a custom license plate. Despite his very upper middle class white dad exterior, he was a hick. A major hick. You see, my dad grew up in the upper peninsula of Michigan in the 60s in a family that was dirt poor and very religious. I never met most of my extended family on his side, aside from his brother Philly, but from what I heard about them, I gather they were deliverance on ice. They lived in what had once been a cabin in the woods. They raised pigs and chickens and sold lumber for most of their income. His father beat my father and his siblings during drunken bouts, which left my father with some major scars, most physical, but a few pretty obvious mental ones too. What's important to note is that my father wasn't bright. He wasn't creative, he wasn't a storyteller, he could remember things and repeat them, and he could focus his energy into things, but he wasn't bright. Brains were not how he got where he was. So it's with this in mind that I ask you to handle his stories. My father used to talk freely of the white man to my sister and I. More her than myself, as they were much closer but was always careful to not mention him in front of my mother and Philly. Philly would make fun of him relentlessly for his boogeyman, and my mother never knew any of it. I suppose he was afraid of her thinking he was crazy. I grew up hearing about the white man, who seemed to be a combination of all your typical boogeymen. He was capable of changing shape, but not color. In his regular form, he was vaguely humanoid but featureless, However, he could change into actual people or animals. He was old and not stupid, but still more animal than man. He chose people, followed them, and brought bad luck to them. And most importantly, he liked to make deals. The white man wasn't a grim reaper of sorts, but he was a predator who showed up when a person was about to die or was hurt and it was such that my father first saw him. Pardon if this isn't told that well, I admit, I have little flair for stories and I've not heard any of these old tales in a long time, so a few details might be missing. One year about January, my father and Philly went out into the woods to go hunting. The two were about ten and nine years old, respectively, although Philly was apparently the leader. They wandered further from their home than usual, and it quickly got dark, which led to them getting disorientated and lost. What had initially begun as a simple afternoon hunt was now potentially life-threatening. 
for they didn't have the gear to easily survive the night. Things got worse, though, when the ground beneath my uncle gave away, revealing that in the dark they had wandered onto a pond, which had frozen over and been covered by snow. It couldn't handle the weight of the two boys. My father, being, as I said, a bit stupid, took a moment to react to the situation before he began to try to help his brother out. After a short struggle, during which time my father got soaked as well, they managed to get Philly out of the water, although they were both now exhausted and wet and truly had no idea where they were, for there wasn't a pond anywhere near their house. The two eventually managed to get off the pond and into the woods in an effort to find shelter or their home. Eventually, they found a crevice beneath a tree and ducked into it for shelter, although it wasn't big enough for them to both fit at once. Being the drier of my two, my father volunteered to take the first shift out in the cold while his brother tried to dry off in the crevice. Now here the story splits, the more reasonable one is Philly's version. He dozed off. My father woke him up a while later, told him they should keep moving. They did and kept wandering until they saw lights. Those lights were flashlights. The neighbors were out looking for them. They met up with the neighbors and went home. Their dad beat them. The hillbillies were all happy except my dad because he was crazy. And then there's my father's version. My father told me he sat out there, scanning the horizon and listening carefully for anything moving in the woods. Animals may mean better shelter or danger, and a person or some sort of vehicle meant rescue. After about 20 minutes, he begins to hear something. Footsteps. According to him, it sounded like a large man, and not all that far away although he couldn't see anything, which surprised him a bit, as it wasn't all that dark, and even back then most people wandering in the woods tried to wear at least one bright item on them to avoid getting shot. But despite that, the noise got louder, until he finally saw it, a figure as white as snow walking through the trees towards him. It was clear to him that it wasn't human, and he described it as being about nine feet tall and shaped like Gumby. It had two arms, two legs, and two eyes, but no features. Everything was rounded. Scared to move, my father sat as still as he could, although it was clear the thing had already seen him. Slowly it moved towards him and began to speak. When it spoke, it didn't speak with a mouth. Instead, it was just two words. One heard, and one responded the same. What that means is up to you to decide. The order of the conversation and the length I'm not sure of, but it told him that it was an old thing that lived in the cold and that it needed them. It came whenever people got too cold or too lost or hurt from animals or accidents, and it took them away if something else hadn't already. It had no interest in the dead, just the dying. Conversing with it was unsettling, but not unpleasant, according to my father. With that, it told him to get up, so he could get his brother. Then they were to follow him away. My father, of course, refused and demanded they be left alone. Why, though, the thing had asked. You'll just freeze anyway, so it doesn't matter. Still, though, my dad refused to move, and eventually the thing asked him why he was so stubborn. It sounded a bit surprised, as if most people didn't argue much. I just don't want to die, or have him die, was the best my father could come up with. Then we'll need to make a deal. My father told me the thing which never, not over any of their visits, told him its name, if it had one. It talked like a car dealer or game show host. It tried to convince him what he really wanted, what he really needed. Wouldn't it be easier to go with him? Wouldn't that be simpler? But still, my father refused. Eventually, they settled. They would get out, but their lives would be on loan. It would be owed interest, and one day it would still come for them. The thing, which he eventually began calling the white man, then began to walk off. 
although it didn't say anything to him. My father said he understood that he was being let out now and that he should follow it. He woke up Philly and the two headed off. Of course, you'd think he'd have been more suspicious of following a giant snow monster that had already tried to kidnap him, but my father wasn't bright or likely a great storyteller either. Before Philly was even awake though, the monster had disappeared, the giant footsteps vanishing in the snow. At first, my father thought for sure he'd been cheated or simply abandoned before realizing there was a trail of rabbit prints, which he began to follow instead, somehow understanding that those belonged to the monster. Occasionally, he'd catch a glimpse of an all-white rabbit, and it was then he understood the thing could change shape. After a while, they saw the lights of their neighbors in the distance headed towards them. As a kid, the story was a lot scarier, and I'm sure I'm missing a few details. Even then, though, I understood the plot holes, and how far-fetched it was. My mother used to tell stories of how her childhood home had been haunted, all while telling us ghosts didn't exist, so I assumed this was something similar. A tall tale. Now, I don't really believe my father's stories, although I think he believed them for some reason or another. I just thought that maybe there's some youper legend Google didn't pull up that he adapted this from. I want to say that my uncle again thought this was all a load of crap. When he would tell the story, it was just a story of how they got lost, almost died, and eventually got home to a butt whooping. A few things my father added in he did agree on though. There had been rabbit footprints, and possibly some bigger ones although these looked like indents in the snow to him rather than actual prints, and my father did end up following a rabbit, which could have been white or blue for all he remembers, which he thought was a stupid idea even then. My uncle also didn't hear anything of the white man, not until my father saw him again a year after they got lost. My father's excuse for not sharing this story with him was either he'd think he was crazy or think he was going to die and only the shock of the next incident scared the story out of him. A year passed, and my father began to think he had maybe gone crazy that night, or that he had fallen asleep and dreamt it, and just woke up without realizing it. That is, until one night, again it was winter, with snow on the ground, he was out tending to the hogs alone with his dog. As a boy, my father had only two close friends, Philly and this dog, a Basset Beagle mix named Shorty. This was a fact he repeated time and time again during many stories of his childhood, which always made me wonder how his sisters felt. Were they not close? Guess not, since I never met them. Anyway, they're in the pig barn, which was far enough away from their house that in the summer, implying there is one, the smell of crap and pigs didn't waft indoors. The barn was capable of being opened on both sides, and in the warmer months, the back would be left open so that the hogs could enjoy the outdoors, while in the colder months, it'd be closed up tight. So, of course, my father was a little surprised to find the back of the barn open wide. This had happened once or twice before over the years, and usually meant he had to run back home and get his father in Philly so they could hunt down all the pigs, who, even in cold weather, would head out in an effort to find food or get into something. But tonight, that wasn't an issue, because all the hogs were huddled as far from the door as possible, and very reluctant to go out, even on a clear night. Assuming the pigs had gotten a bit of sense and didn't want to deal with the weather, he headed through the pen to close up the door, with Shorty following him the whole way. He gets there and Shorty takes one sniff before darting out the door howling and barking the whole way, obviously chasing after something. Shorty, my father would say, was a bit of a tattletale. If something was misbehaving, he'd try to stop it. When sneaking out or getting up past bedtime, you had to make sure the dog didn't see you. This applied to other animals too. If a pig or chicken didn't do what it was supposed to, the dog would get into it. 
So with that in mind, my father didn't think perhaps the dog was after something, but that it instead was scolding a hog that had wandered off alone. As quickly as possible. After all, pigs all look alike, move a good bit, and my father wasn't brilliant. My father counted up the pigs and noticed that one in fact, an adult boar, was missing. So he headed out after Shorty to find the lost pig. In the still and the snow, it was easy to find Shorty. All he had to do was follow the dog's footprints, but that was when he realized something was wrong. Shorty's prints were in the snow, but they were not following the tracks of the hog. In fact, there were no prints from the hog, which there should have been. No new snow had fallen, and there wasn't enough wind to easily cover them. Furthermore, there were tracks. They just weren't from a pig. Instead, they were large, vague dents in the snow. These my father recognized. He had seen them before in the woods the year before, if only briefly. And there they were again, with Shorty on hot pursuit of the creature. Mustering up his courage, my father followed them as well. After all, he wanted to get his dog back, and, scared or not, he needed to at least look for him and the hog, or his father would kill him. The pen was decent-sized for a hog pen, but soon he hit the fence, which was made up of five-foot-tall hog panels. Shorty was capable of climbing these. I'm assuming his build was more beagle than basset, because the image of a basset hound climbing a fence is hilarious to me, and he could see that the dog had already gone over the fence and into the woods. Of course, the fence had not stopped the white man either. His track simply went right over the fence, as if he hadn't even had to break stride to get over it. So my father climbed the fence, and soon he was in the woods too. The upper peninsula is really just woods and cleared woods for pins and buildings, and it wasn't long before he heard the barks of Shorty and the squeals of a frightened pig. Running now, he came to the scene quickly. Standing among the trees was the white man, who had seemingly grown bigger over the last year. In one arm, he held the struggling and screaming hog, which had to have weighed at least 400 pounds. A few feet away from him carrying on was Shorty, his hair on end and teeth bared, acting as if he had cornered the beast. There was no communication or confrontation between them, just an impression, an impression that the white man had waited for him, that he had stood there ignoring the dog just so he could get a glimpse of him. There was a brief pause, then my father realized something terrible. The white man did, in fact, have a mouth. Below the beady black eyes was a slit, a long line, and it opened just a bit to reveal teeth as white as the rest of him that shined in the moonlight. As quickly as he flashed the grin, he was gone. The white man silently took off, running into the woods, gracefully dodging between trees with just the soft crunch of snow following him. Shorty took a few steps after him before my father had the mind to call him back, and the two headed home with my father sobbing the whole way. He got into trouble. He had the sense to not tell his parents what he saw, but he still got in trouble for losing a hog. He only ended up telling Philly because he couldn't stop crying, and even then he couldn't stop. Philly apparently didn't believe him much, but he didn't say anything to argue against it. Philly eventually began to write off everything as my father being schizophrenic and the white man being the manifestation of it. I know nothing of mental disease, so I don't know if that diagnosis would ever hold up. Years went by before my father saw the white man again although he claims to have known he was there during that time. Every winter without fail, one hog or a group of chickens in a single night would go missing. Only once was there an exception. One year, a local boy went missing in the woods and never turned up. That year, no hog went missing from the farm. It was the livestock, as well as the sharp teeth, that led my father to the conclusion that the white man had to eat, and that he wasn't a vegetarian. 
The white man, though, never once told him he killed his victims, nor that he ate them. Considering what he took, though, my father thought it was easy enough to figure out. When he was 16, he saw the white man again. The exact age I remember, for it was when my father began to drive. It was late at night, and my father was driving home. He had begun to work at the nearest gas station, sometimes not coming home until late. It's worth noting that my father had his own set of skills and talents, such as being a hard worker or an excellent cook. But driving, especially in the winter, was not on that list. Driving scared my father. He was terrified of slipping or crashing, and drove very slowly and very cautiously. Never one to yell at us, he would snap if we talked too loudly in the car, or turn the radio up too high, because it began to make him nervous. With that in mind, what I'm about to tell you shouldn't surprise you. One day he crashed. Granted, he crashed trying to stop and help someone else who had crashed, but he still crashed. Another car had slid into the ditch along the rarely traveled road towards his house, and in the process of trying to stop and help, he too had an accident, one that was much more violent than the one he was trying to help. Somehow or another, he ended up hitting a tree hard enough to seriously damage his car and injure his leg. The driver of the other car came out to help him, and after realizing he couldn't walk back to town, decided to walk back on his own and get help for the both of them. My father thanked him, then the man went on his way. Now, granted, it was hillbilly heck out there, with it being winter and in the middle of nowhere, but it would, by my father's calculations, take less than an hour for the man to get back to the gas station and find help, and less than an hour for them to get back to him, because then they'd be driving, right? So, in two hours, he'd be in the heated cab of a tow truck, either on the way to his house or a doctor's office. It was about midnight at that point, and my father had a wristwatch on which he'd check occasionally as he shivered in the dark. 1 a.m. comes around and 2 a.m. comes around. 3, 4. He eventually dozes off and wakes up shivering to the sound of footsteps, big and heavy like a man's. For whatever reason, he assumes that the guy couldn't find help, or that help couldn't get down the road, and he's come back to help him. Or maybe the guy just up and left and some other traveler has come to see if he's alive. He pulls himself up enough to look out the rearview mirror. That's when the pit dropped out of the bottom of his stomach. For you see, there wasn't a man in the snow. Even though he should have been able to see someone if he could hear them, there wasn't anyone there. The footsteps are, but there isn't a person. According to him, he felt as if he was in a nightmare and began looking frantically behind him, trying to see someone, hoping he was just overreacting. But then, he saw a long white form step in front of the brown and black of the trees. He realized it was the white man again, slowly stepping towards the car. His movements were slow and graceful, but he seemed a little worried. My father's never seen him in the open before, but there he was, moving cautiously, like a cat, when it's worried about being seen at night. Eventually, the thing gets to the car and stops. Again, there are no angry words, no begging. In fact, although my father was scared crapless, he just clammed up and held still, as they began to talk. This time, the conversation was short. One sentence, this time not said inside my father's mind. Don't worry, already paid. With that, the giant keeps on moving, making a point of going across the road and into the woods on the other side as my father watched. Comedically, he always made a point to tell us that the white man stopped before crossing, making a point of checking for traffic before heading across. Once the beast was out of sight, my father began sobbing and kept sobbing until the mailman found him four hours later. Even in the Upper Peninsula, you gotta get mail. My father recovered, 
although he ended up having to spend a small fortune getting the car repaired. The other driver? A bit less lucky. He simply never showed up again. The man had left to find help, but never made it back into town. An investigation was opened, but leads all sputtered out. This last story is probably the last one for a bit that I remember clearly. Some of the others may be a bit fuzzy, because it's been about ten years since I really heard any of them. Somehow my father knew that the white man was attached to the winter. This surely wasn't a surprise to anyone at all, seeing as he was a white monster in the Upper Peninsula that only showed up when snow fell. The issue, of course, was that it was often winter in the Upper Peninsula. A few more years went by with no really noteworthy incidents. The white man would take something every winter, but it didn't get Shorty or my grandmother or anything. By then, my father was 18 to 19 years old, getting ready to leave. His family was poor, and even if they hadn't been, my grandfather did not believe in college. With his sons now men, he gave them an option. Become farmers, clergymen, lumberjacks, laborers, or get out and don't come back. It was because of Philly that they didn't do that, although I'm sure my father wanted to get away from the winter. Philly decided they'd both join the military and get out of there. Vietnam had recently ended, and he would joke that he thought he'd get sent somewhere warm that had never seen snow. I guess I could lie and for comedy's effect say they both were sent to Alaska or Russia, but the truth is a bit more boring. They were accepted and went through basic training, but neither ever saw combat. Philly was removed from service for a birth defect eventually, and my father stayed in, but never did anything until his contract ran up, merely working on bases those few years. He asked to be transferred somewhere warm, and being liked by his higher-ups, he found himself in Texas. My father had tons of stories about weird things they'd find in the woods before he left the Upper Peninsula, and other odd incidents he tied vaguely to the white man, but it was some time before he saw him again. After all, he was tied to winter, it'd be a while before there'd be a reunion in Texas. But, towards the end of my father's military contract, a storm hit the area he was stationed in, and brought with it snow. Being one of the few on the base who had any knowledge of how to handle the mess, he saw himself outside a lot during the storm. And it didn't take long before he realized the white man could travel. This storm lasted two days. On the second day, he woke up early to de-ice paths and roads. In a desolate part of the base, he was surprised to see another soldier in the distance, and grew a bit concerned when he realized the man wasn't moving. Quickly, he approached him, only to realize something. Again, there were no footprints leading out to this man, who he now realized was devoid of color, a detailed white shape with two dark eyes. If he hadn't been so surprised, he would have screamed. Instead, he claimed he probably looked as white as the white man himself, as the color left him. No interest. With that, the figure vanished. My father was found some time later by a fellow soldier, staring into the distance across an open field. Exhaustion was his supposed excuse. Two days later, he received a call from his older sister, informing him that his father had died. There wasn't much detail to go into. His father had simply fallen over in the field and died while feeding hogs, and that was that. No mess, no fuss. My father, understandably, didn't care much. If the white man did it, it wasn't much of a punishment, but he eventually came to decide the white man was, if nothing else, a bad omen. If anyone has any idea what this thing was, if my father wasn't just blowing smoke or is crazy, or if there's any legends like this one, let me know.
The Whistler from Chip Oil, 1991. I'm a freshly graduated high school student and on my way to college. During my senior year, I had a job working for my grandfather as a farmhand. Well, more or less a farm manager. He would give me instructions on what to do to the farm without him being there, most commonly feeding the cows. It was early November, and at this moment in time, baseball practice started after school, and it would last from 3.25 to 5.30 p.m. By that time, the sun would be almost down when I arrived at work and would start getting ready. One day, I had gotten dressed, filled up the buckets, and fed the first farm when I realized I didn't have a key to the other farm. Frustrated, I was forced to pick up two buckets at a time and walk them from the fence to the feed troughs, a good 40-yard walk. While walking, I was trying to keep myself upbeat. I just started to whistle. No real pattern or tune to it, but something that I came up with. When I came back and put the last buckets in the bed of the truck, I heard something from my neighboring property. It was whistling. Strange, I thought. No one lives anywhere near that property, and it sounded very close. I rationalized it as a mockingbird, or something, and continued on. The next couple of days I didn't whistle, but the whistling I'd hear would continue, and slowly over those few days it got clearer and clearer, until it sounded just like regular whistling, and eventually it got louder. When I'd first heard it, it was very faint. I almost missed it over the crunching of me walking to my truck. Over the course of those days, I kind of became accustomed to the whistling, and I kind of expected it. One day later, when it didn't come, I was actually a little disappointed. This time I'd brought the key, and I walked up to the gate and started fiddling with my keys when I dropped them into the grass. I said dang it, and squatted down, starting to search for them. It was then that I heard a very faint sound coming from the other property a low groan or gurgle. It was getting louder. At this point, I wasn't scared, but more curious as to what was going on over there. I left my truck parked across from the property and walked a few feet down the road, hopping the fence to the property where I heard the sounds. The land over there goes straight uphill and is heavily wooded all throughout, and the further you go up, the more and more dense it gets. Looking back now, I made a few big mistakes that could have gotten me hurt. As I walked up the hill, I would occasionally hear the gurgle. It was still far up the hill, so it was as faint as it was before. As I walked on, a bad smell began to hit my nose. A weird mixture of garbage and wet dog. I heard something as I was about to crest the hill. <clears throat> A very dry, low, and quiet, distorted, dang it, came from a couple yards in front of me. It sounded like a 60-year-old smoker, saying dang it really slowly, and I automatically thought someone was on our property. Somewhat angry and paranoid now, I started to move slower. I didn't want this guy to hear me before I could see them. I kept going, and I stopped and listened when I heard another sound. Dang it, dang it, dang it. This guy was slowly saying dang it normally, not long and drawn out in that eerie way as if he didn't know English. I sat down on this log, kind of listening, trying to figure out what I should do about this person. He kept saying dang it over and over, and I noticed that his tone was getting higher, and his inflection was changing, and it hit me. This guy was perfectly mimicking me. My tone, my inflection, literally everything. He even mimicked my frustration when I said it. Teed off and kind of scared now, I got up and began to crest the hill. I flicked on my flashlight on my phone. Hey, this is private property. I was cut off mid-sentence. As I came over the hill, 
My light barely illuminated a naked figure squatting just a couple of yards in front of me. His eyes were illuminated by the faint glow of my flashlight. I automatically felt that something was wrong. This wasn't a regular person. His neck was longer than normal. And when I came up the hill, he winched his neck and snapped his head to look at me without moving the rest of his body. His eyes were too big, and his head was large and slender. He sat squatted down in a ballerina-type squat. I looked at his body. He was very skinny. His ribs were showing through his skin. There was a short silence, and like a robot, the man turned in the leaves and slowly stood with his hands next to his side. I was debating whether or not this was even a person. It was far too tall to be a person. Dang it, it said in my voice. I turned and I sprinted down the hill. It didn't feel like I was running, but more like my legs were just going through the motions. I didn't look back before I got to the fence, and when I hopped it, I got in my truck and sped away. Sadly, I still work at that farm, but I've never told anyone this story, not even my grandfather. I've only heard the whistling a few more times since then. Paranormal Cabin from KM8642 This incident happened in November 2018 at a cabin in the Adirondack Mountains in New York State. The cabin is located in a private camp owned by my alma mater. There are about 10 cabins on the property, each of them isolated and private. I've been going to this camp for 30 years and before this trip, I've never had anything odd or supernatural happen to me. Attending this trip was just me and my 16-year-old daughter. It was her first time there. We arrived mid-afternoon. The cabin we rented was about a quarter mile walk from the parking lot. It sits in a pretty glade surrounded by the forest, and a small path runs past the cabin and continues on into the woods towards the next cabins. The cabin's construction is extremely rustic, made wholly of logs hewn from the surrounding forest. There's a porch that is covered with a wood railing. To the left on the porch is a wood rack built up against the railing. This is an important detail for later. The main room has a large stone fireplace and hearth. There's a couple couches, a dining table, and a galley kitchen. The only water source is a 10-gallon plastic container situated to the left of a sink that's set in the middle of the counter against the wall. The bedrooms are in a separate section behind where the fireplace is. Each bedroom has two single beds, one against the wall on the left and one against the wall on the right. There is a window between the beds. After unloading all our supplies in the cabin, we went outside to chop wood as the cabin is without heat or electricity. Light is provided by propane lanterns. After a sweaty half hour, we had enough wood split to last at least 24 hours. It was already getting dark as we loaded the wood inside on the stone hearth next to the large fireplace, the excess wood we placed in the wood rack on the porch. We enjoyed our first night, eating a roasted chicken we'd bought at the store. I built a fire in the fireplace and kept feeding it until there was a nice bed of coals. We turned one of the couches around to face the fire, then sat down and read our books while intermittently chatting. It was very peaceful. The only sound, the crackling of the burning wood, and the warmth of the fire was soothing. We went to bed early and got a great night's sleep. After breakfast the following day, we went for a short hike on the property. I showed my daughter a few of the other cabins in which I'd stayed in the past. It was a cloudy fall day, a bit chilly and windy. We got back to the cabin around noon. I fed the fire to get some heat going, then we had sandwiches for lunch. We sat on the couch in front of the fire and enjoyed the silence for a while once again each of us reading our books. 
This is where the story gets interesting. Out of nowhere, we heard a sound behind us, outside the cabin. To me, it sounded like one of the logs on top of the wood rack on the porch had rolled. Just picture the sound a heavy round log would make if you rolled it across the top of other logs. My daughter and I immediately looked at each other. Did you hear that? I asked. Yes, she said. She pointed towards the back of the cabin, which was odd because I'd heard the sound coming from the front where the porch is. I figured it was probably just the acoustics of the cabin. My first thought was that it was some kids from one of the other cabins just messing around. Remember, there's a footpath that runs closely past our cabin. I thought someone walking by decided to mess around with us. We both stood up and I looked out the window towards the path. I didn't see anyone. I looked at my daughter and saw some fear and confusion on her face. I said to her, I better take a look outside. For protection, I picked up a long, thin split log from the hearth, easy to swing at someone if necessary. With more than a little trepidation, I opened the door and stepped out onto the porch, closing the door behind me. I took two steps and stopped. I looked first to the left, and all I saw was grass and forest. I then turned to the right, where the wood rack was. What I saw changed my life. It all happened so fast, a matter of a few seconds. When I turned, I saw something hovering above the wood rack, exactly where I thought the sound had come from. It's hard to describe. It actually looked like an octopus's tentacle, but a foresty version of it. Light brown on top with white spots and white underneath. But it did not look solid. It was like a phantasm, glowing and shimmering. The instant I saw it, it pulled back and was gone around the side of the cabin. It was as though it knew I'd seen it, so it quickly pulled its tentacle back. I've often read stories where people say they were so scared they couldn't move, and I always think, come on, you're in danger, move, what's your problem? Well, I now know why they don't move. They literally can't. I was so scared, it was like my feet were nailed to the porch. My entire body went numb. My brain was telling me I should jump off the porch and run around the corner of the cabin to see what this thing was. But my body would not move. After a minute or two, I got enough courage to move. I turned around and I went back inside. I felt pale and flushed as if I'd seen a ghost, which I guess I had. My daughter was standing there looking at me, and she could tell something had happened. I... I saw something, I said. Her eyes got bigger. What did you see? She asked in a shaky voice. I told her. I was nervously tapping the piece of wood against my leg. I walked over to look out the window again. I was trying to act normal and brave so my daughter didn't panic. I still didn't see anything. I better go walk around the cabin to see if I find anything, I told her. Stay here. I walked outside again and closed the door. Although I was still terrified, I knew I had to at least do a full circle around the cabin to reassure myself and especially my daughter. I stepped off the porch and onto the ground. I went right, towards where I'd seen the phantasm. I poked my head around the corner of the porch. Nothing. I did notice, however, that on the ground right next to where the wood rack is on the porch, there were a bunch of twigs and a small branch or two, meaning if a person or animal had been standing on the ground next to the porch, I would have heard twigs snapping. 
and yet I had heard nothing. There's no way an actual being had stood there. Gaining a little confidence, I proceeded to walk around the cabin, inspecting the ground and the surrounding area. Not a single thing was out of place, not a footprint to be found, nothing disturbed. I walked back into the cabin and told my daughter. Well, there's nothing out there, I said. I guess that's good. She nodded tentatively. I restoked the fire and told her to sit with me on the couch. We propped our feet up on the hearth and soaked in the warmth, lost in our thoughts. She then asked me, Do you think we should leave? I thought about that. I understood her concern, but I honestly didn't think we were in danger. If she insisted she was too scared to stay, I'd pack up and leave, but I didn't want to. I don't think so. If it was something that meant us harm, it would have attacked me. This seemed to mollify her. We sat a while more, then I noticed it was twilight outside. I lit a few of the lights that are mounted on the wall, and I said, Why don't we make dinner? I'm starving. She kept reading for a bit while I worked in the kitchen. There were plates in the drying rack on the counter that I put away. I then noticed a large puddle of water sitting on the counter to the right of the sink. The container of water on the counter was on the other side of the sink. It was way more water than a few drying dishes would cause, but I just figured I must have spilled some water as well. I took a towel and mopped up all the water. I filled a pot with water and put it on the stove to boil to make pasta. The boxes of dry goods we'd brought were on the small table against the wall. I grabbed for a box of pasta, and at first it wouldn't budge, like it was stuck to the table. I finally lifted it up and I saw water dripping from the bottom. I felt around and the box was soaking wet. I then checked the other boxes on the table and they were all wet as well. There was a large puddle on the table. This was a real head scratcher. As I mentioned, there is no plumbing in the cabin so no running water. I called my daughter over and showed her the table and I also told her about the puddle near the drying rack. She was just as confused as I was. We looked under the sink, nothing there. I checked out the plastic water container, but there were no leaks in it. I used a flashlight and examined the wall above the counter, but nothing. I checked out the ceiling as well, once more, nothing. We'd been there 24 hours, and there had not been a single drop of rain. There were no drips coming from the ceiling. Besides, the roof is slanted, so it's not like there'd be standing water up there. We cleaned up the water and wrote it off as an oddity. We cooked the pasta, heated up some sauce, and had a tasty meal. We relaxed at the table for a bit, then began cleaning up. I brought the dishes over to the sink and placed them there. I caught a reflection coming off the counter to the right of the sink and leaned closer. No way. There was once again a large puddle of water there. I called my daughter over and showed her again. We were both absolutely perplexed. I mopped it up again and forgot about it. To this day, I have no idea how the water got there. There's no rational explanation. But that isn't the end to the story. We went to bed, both of us still rattled from the day's unnerving events. As a precaution, I placed a metal folding chair against the door to the cabin, figuring it would topple over and make a lot of noise if someone opened the door, as the door had no lock. We eventually fell asleep. My daughter was lying with her head at the far end of the bed, closest to the wall, which is an outside wall. I lay with my head in the opposite direction, closest to the inside wall. After a fitful sleep, 
I awoke around 7 a.m. The cabin was freezing cold, as the fire had died hours before. I knew I had to get up and start the fire and get some heat in the cabin. But it was warm and cozy in my sleeping bag, so I just lay there for a few extra minutes. Suddenly, I heard a scratching sound coming from the corner of the room where my daughter lay. It sounded like someone had a sharp metal pole and was dragging it along the outside of the cabin. Even weirder, the scratching sound was moving along the wall, in my direction, and as it moved, it gradually got louder until it filled the entire room and felt, to me, like a physical force. It went all the way across the outside wall and then turned the corner. Then it came all the way across to the wall behind me. I was lying with my back to the wall. When the scratching stopped, it felt as though it was precisely at the midpoint of my back. The entire sequence had taken about five seconds. My daughter did not wake up. When it stopped directly at my back, I lay there frozen. I began praying to Jesus to not let me get hurt. Whatever this thing was, it seemed focused on me. I have no idea why. In the 30 seconds I lay there praying, I didn't hear sound nor feel anything on me. But it was as terrifying a 30 seconds as I've ever had. Finally, after about five minutes, I found the nerve to sit up. At that point, my daughter woke up. I asked if she had heard the scratching, and she looked at me like I was crazy. She obviously hadn't. I told her what I'd heard. We made ourselves a quick breakfast, straightened up the cabin, and got the heck out of there. I didn't relax until we were in the car driving home. As we checked out, though, I did ask the camp manager if they'd ever had reports of anything paranormal in the cabin we'd stayed in, or any other for that matter. He said no. To my frustration, some of the people I've told this story to have not believed me. I attest that every word of it is true, and my daughter is a witness. I was not drinking or doing drugs, I was 100% lucid. I haven't been back to that camp since then. I do plan to head back soon, staying in a different cabin. And if something else happens, I'll be sure to let you know. Caught in a Tempest From Anonymous we had no idea the rain would be coming down this heavily. My wife and I decided to leave well close to midnight on our way to visit family in Texas. We'd made the trip a number of times before over the years, but had never had quite this level of panic. Where Arkansas ends and Texas begins, you start to see fewer mountains and more flatlands in certain places. While I prefer the scenic vistas of Arkansas, the vast fields and clear-cut forests in northern Texas can be a breath of fresh air, but I doubt I'll ever be able to look at them the same way again. I can't recall exactly which town we were passing through when the rain started, but I do know the fields of wheat on either side, interspersed with juts of thick forest, were swaying in the wind as if rejoicing in the much-needed downpour. No problem, I thought. Driving through the rain at night ain't so bad. I even found it peaceful. Our panic arose when the rain's volume increased more by the second, until the torrent washed over the windshield to such an extent the wiper blades could not keep up. Soon, they were useless. Visibility became near zero. I slowed to a meager five miles per hour until we saw some reflections my headlights caught on the artificial exterior of some old abandoned building. Carefully, I drove under the rusted awning in front of the derelict place. As my car passed under the metal shelter, my vision was restored. I turned off the headlights. 
Finally then, I gasped at the sight of the storm around me. It was a supercell storm. The ditches parallel to the road had become flowing rivers. Lightning arced down every other second, touching treetops. Thunder crackled so near, so loud, my skin crawled at the instinctive terror of it all. It was apparent then to the both of us, we were captive to the storm. All we could do was wait under that ramshackle structure, hoping the flood didn't rise enough to sweep us away, or that the wind didn't violently tear down our rusted, precarious protection. Pretending we were more in awe than fear, my wife and I discussed the storm. Whoa, you ever seen one like this? I asked her, rubbing the sweat from my cheek with my palm. Absolutely not, much less been caught in one like this. She visibly flinched as another bolt of lightning rocked both the earth and sky. We turned on the car's entertainment system. No radio frequencies were coming through clear whatsoever. Luckily, I had downloaded a few conspiracy and historical podcasts to my phone, and the Bluetooth worked perfectly. We passed the time, listening to the history of the Italian Mafia. Then we learned about the effects of lead in the American water systems in the 20th century, all while staring out at the storm, never once thinking the rising floods and explosive lightning could be the least of our concerns. All at once... The rain, thunder, and lightning stopped. The sky remained apocalyptically dark, but the once turbulent clouds above had seemingly frozen in time. The chaos came to such an abrupt end that I'd forgotten to breathe. My eyelids retreated so forcefully, I swear they could have ripped. Even my heart slowed. The immense fear had been replaced with confusion. What's happening? My wife's sudden inquisition jolted me back to life. I breathed in deeply and blinked half a dozen times. I don't know. Maybe it's over, I replied. She narrowed her eyes. Something doesn't feel right. Honey, maybe we should leave. Even before her suggestion... My hands gripped the steering wheel so hard, my knuckles had turned a ghostly white. Though my body begged me to drive away, I could not will myself to press down on the accelerator. Are you listening? We need to... <gasps> she stopped mid-sentence, a sharp gasp escaping her throat as she covered her mouth with both hands. I dreaded how quickly my eyes traced her gaze. It wasn't but a moment before I had locked eyes on it, too. A massive shadow stood on the road in front of us, next to the ruinous building. It stood about twenty feet high. At first, I thought it was some sort of structure that had somehow just appeared there. Perhaps I didn't see it before. But after staring at this silhouette, I could make out subtle movements, the kind of minute movements every living thing makes even when trying to be motionless. And it was very clear it was alive and was trying very hard to stay still. It knew we were there. I'd never in my life seen a creature so large, shaped quite like that. My mind struggled to make sense of the shape. Perhaps it was just too dark to be sure. The only sure thought I had was not to move not to utter a sound. Something deep within me knew that making ourselves known would be catastrophic. I heard my wife desperately quiet in her breathing. One minutes, two minutes, five minutes passed in silence. Then movement, extremely terrifyingly recognizable movement. What appeared to be its head bent down a bit and a limb to its left raised slightly as the creature nudged at itself. Having owned birds my entire life up until a year ago, I knew what I was looking at. A bird. A colossal, oddly shaped, senselessly huge bird, scratching at its breast with an impossibly long and thin beak. 
The way it lifted its wing absolutely baffled me, because its wingspan would have been 30 or 35 feet. My heart rose in pace, each pounding beat sending a stinging sensation throughout my entire body. Was this true fear? The realization that death was very close, and even more real than I'd ever understood. Knowing so much as a bit too deep of a breath could result in being devoured by a creature larger than the awning we sat under. I wanted to shiver, but my mind denied me even that. No moving, it decreed. No sound whatsoever. The primal fear awakened inside of me was doing everything it could to keep me alive. When the headlights came on, I choked on air. My wife must have felt a different reaction to this creature. While I gazed on in horror, she had panicked and figured the only thing we could do was attempt to scare the beast. She had reached over and flicked on the headlights. The car was aimed close enough to the creature's location that the beams revealed nearly everything. A thick layer of dark, mangy fur all over its body besides the wings. Beak nearly as long as my car. A creature so heavy and strong, its talons tore through the asphalt it stood upon. At the sight of our headlights, the creature was not afraid. It was angry. Wings spread out far and wide. It revealed its true size to us as the rain and lightning burst back into existence all around us. I could have sworn my wife and I both screamed in unison, but the sound of the returning chaos drowned out all other noise. With the twitch of my ankle, I practically buried the accelerator. The tires began to squeal as they struggled to find purchase on the gravel. They soon did causing the car to lurch forward before taking off at breakneck speed. I aimed for the pavement, lopsidedly falling into and ramping out of the ditch. Daring not to look back, I drove ahead with almost no visibility towards the next patch of forest I could make out while I was parked under that awning. I knew it was in this direction, but with the full return of the downpour, I couldn't be sure how close I was, or if I was even on the road at this point. My wife screamed next to me. Thunder boomed. Rain pattered. And then a frequent, oddly heavy gust of wind grew closer by the second. The beating of gigantic wings belonging to a creature in pursuit of its prey. I felt my toes dig harder down into the floor, as if there was any more room for the accelerator to fall. The speedometer read 65, 75, 90 miles per hour. But it wasn't fast enough. A shrill avian call of similar magnitude to a collapsing skyscraper reverberated the car and my ribcage alike. It all came to an end when my car began to tumble and roll rapidly off the road. Down was up, left was right. It felt like my insides became my outsides, as everything then went black. When I came to, I was upside down. The upper half of my forehead sat submerged in water. Uh, Beth. I tried to call my wife's name. I'm sure it sounded like little more than a whispered mutter. It's gonna be all right, sir, you've been in a wreck. Please don't move. I turned as far as I could. That wasn't much, as the sharp pain in my neck made me wince. There was a man in a reflective yellow coat knelt down in the remnants of a flood, speaking to me. From what I could see from my limited position, he appeared to be searching for some way to get me out. He must have been able to get me out of there, though, because the next thing I remember is waking up in a hospital with a broken arm, some broken ribs, and my unconscious wife lying in a bed next to me. Family gathered worriedly around us in an apparently overcrowded hospital. 
Maybe we weren't the only ones who suffered in the severe storm and flash floods. Or maybe it was the pandemic. I don't know. Luckily, I was going to be fine, said a very busy doctor. Yet, my wife was comatose. When I heard that, I remember breaking down. I remember crying. A pang of guilt rushed over me like a tidal wave. It was my fault. She was comatose because I panicked and tried to escape that behemoth of a bird. If I had remained calm, she'd be awake, I told myself. Weeks of physical therapy later, my wife at last awakened. I couldn't be happier. Upon her shoulder, I cried and begged for forgiveness for the harm I'd done. There's nothing to be sorry for, she said with some trouble. I turned on those headlights. You just did what you had to do to get us to safety. The two of us recovered fully. For a long while, we didn't drive. Groceries we'd have delivered to the house. Several months later, we began driving on occasion during the day. Yet even to this day, we don't drive at night. And thunderstorms have us hiding in our bedroom with the doors and windows locked. Sometimes I wake up to the sound of heavy, rhythmic gusts outside. Thankfully, I'm always met with either typical stormy skies or clear days, and no giant, angry birds. My Old Clubhouse from Michael I. I grew up in the 80s, deep in the woods of West Virginia. My mom and dad were very loving and caring parents who spent a lot of time with me and my older brother, and I think that rubbed off on us. Because my older brother and I were the best of friends, we shared the same interests, spent much of our time together, and could count on each other. I remember one time when some neighbor kids stumbled upon our house Mom and Dad weren't home, and my brother was busy with chores in the house. I was outside just playing with my old toy truck in the dirt. I recall hearing footsteps. I looked up and saw two older boys coming my way. I thought this was weird, because we didn't have any near neighbors. Then again, back then, kids didn't have much to do inside the house, and busy parents would often let their kids roam about. So when I saw these two, I figured they had come from a couple of miles away, some other house way out here in the woods. Now at first when I saw them, I was excited at the prospect of having some new friends to play with, being a trusting youngster and all that. When they got close, I gave them a howdy, and they began to step on my toy truck, breaking off the wheels in one fell swoop. I had no idea why they would do that. Before they even said a word, just as I was about to ask what was wrong with them, they pushed me in the dirt, and I began to cry. I guess that commotion was enough to alert my brother, who was a few years older than me, and much taller. He came right outside, picked me up, and socked the larger of the two boys right in the face. He fell in the dirt, crying, and the two then ran off back into the woods where they came from, I guess. It was the weirdest thing, why would two strange kids without a word come and do something like that? I could only guess that they had some trouble at home and were taking out their frustrations on the first other kid they met that they could overpower. Anyway, I was grateful for my brother being there. My brother was the one who taught me to fish. He was there when I caught my first bass. I was so excited. Dad showed me how to cook it up for dinner, and we enjoyed it as much as we could. I do admit I may have left a couple of bones in there, but I tried my best. One of my fondest and longest lasting memories of my brother and my family is that of the clubhouse. My dad was a masterful woodworker, and one spring he had a lot of time off from work. I can't remember why exactly, but being a couple of bored and excitable boys, my brother and I asked my dad to help us make a clubhouse in the nearby woods. We caught him at a great time because I don't think he even considered saying no, but that may be due to the fact he had a lot of spare wood in the backyard, a pile of stuff that was just taken up space. 
Firstly, he had the two of us go out in the woods and pick a spot. We wanted a place that would stand against time. Even as kids, the two of us knew that we wouldn't always live here, and that meant some strangers might live in our house, and they could stumble upon this clubhouse, and that made us think they might wreck it, that all our work would go to waste. Luckily, there was a specific place my brother and I had in mind that was quite secretive. There was this large tree with strong branches. It sat just under a sheer cliffside, and the easiest way down the cliffside was a hill that was covered in masses of brambles and thorn bushes. Basically, people might find the clubhouse, but they would be hard fought to get to it. So, we picked that tree. We showed Dad where it was, and he told us it was quite a distance away so we'd have to help him get the wood out here. But we already expected that. Over the next few months, we'd make time almost every day to put together the clubhouse 2x4x2x4, by by nail by nail, until it was done. That thing was a wooden monument. It had one of those drop-down rope ladders attached to a string that was really hard to see in the daytime, so we could toss the rope ladder back up when we crawled down, and only we would know how to get it back down with the string. Plus, it was especially roomy, thanks to how big the tree was, and thanks to my dad's woodworking. With a roof and a makeshift door on it, it was the perfect place to spend sleepovers. And by sleepover, I usually mean my brother and I camping out in the treehouse, which we usually just referred to as the clubhouse. We spent an untold number of nights there, sometimes laying in the clearing nearby counting stars, other times in the clubhouse telling ghost stories, making sure the rope ladder was pulled up, just in case anything creepy decided to climb up inside with us. When we did have friends from school over, they thought it was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. In my teenage years, my brother would show me comics, which I grew to love as well, so we'd often spend some quiet hours reading comics up in the clubhouse. With how often we were out there, I'm sure my parents were either worried about us or thankful for all the free time they got. But not every moment at the clubhouse was a cheery one. I remember when I was 13 years old, my brother must have been around 16 or 17. He wanted to sleep in the clubhouse again and invited me to stay with him. But I had a fever as I'd been sick. And that muggy outdoor air, especially at night, it made me feel so much worse. So I told him I'd just be staying in my room that night. He was understanding about it. About an hour after sundown, he took off with some food, a sleeping bag, and a backpack, as well as a kerosene lantern. A couple of hours after that, everyone back at the house was in bed. I was asleep. Until I suddenly heard a banging at the window. I shot straight up out of my bed, startled, with goosebumps all over my back and neck. I looked to the nearby window, the one closest to facing the direction of the clubhouse. I saw a silhouette of a boy. I rubbed my eyes and turned on the light. And there stood my brother, just outside the window. And though I'd heard him banging on the glass, he was now facing away from the glass, staring into the woods. At first, I walked over and tapped on the glass to get his attention, to let him know I was awake. Then I reached down and began to pull up on the window. When the window was open, my brother didn't budge. He still stared quietly into the dark woods nearby. Uh, hey... Are you okay? I groggily asked him. I waited for a response for an awkward amount of time, but he stayed silent. It was so bizarre. I'd never seen him act like this, and I was worried he was scared of something out there. Maybe he saw a bear or was chased by coyotes. Worried, I reached out my hand and grabbed his shoulder. The moment I did, I happened to look down and saw his feet. Now my brother and I always wore shoes outside as it made exploring the nearby woods easier and less painful, what with all the random rocks scattered about. So when I looked down and saw that his shoes were gone, and saw instead his feet covered in mud and blisters, I became concerned. Hey, what happened? I tried to ask, when he suddenly interrupted me. May I come in? He spoke in a strangely low voice. It was monotone. I didn't really understand it. But he soon repeated himself. May I come in? What? You live here. Why are you asking me to come in? I told him. 
I smirked a little bit, but I think it was only for my own comfort, because everything about this situation was bothering me. May I come in? He said again, completely disregarding everything I'd said. I rolled my eyes and was just about to tell him to come in, when those goosebumps came back twofold. Something felt incredibly wrong. Well, I... I began to say, but then I looked up above his shoulder into the distance, and in the trees, standing there waving, was my brother. A sudden banging at the window behind me in the room caused me to nearly scream. I turned around, my hand no longer on my brother's shoulder, but there was nothing at the other window. When I turned to face forward again, the boy that had been standing in front of me, face the other way, was gone, and my brother was running towards the window now. The real brother, the one whose face I could see, the one with panic in his eyes and expression. This one came towards the window, and when he got close enough, he did not ask permission. He jumped inside, nearly tackling me, as I stood there dumbfounded. He picked himself up, breathing heavily, and closed the window. Right away, I looked down, and I saw that he was wearing shoes. Everything about this brother looked perfectly normal, except for the face he was making when he turned around. You didn't say yes, did you? He immediately asked me. I got chills. Oh, I, no, I, I didn't... Oh, thank God, he replied. He turned to look out the window and scan the surroundings out there. What happened? What's going on? I asked. I don't know, he explained. I, I was in the clubhouse and I just got done reading some comic books and was about to go to sleep. I, I turned off the lantern and I closed my eyes. A, a moment or two later... I felt something hitting the tree below. I thought it was someone trying to get my attention, maybe you or dad. I opened the door and looked down, and I saw dad standing there, but he was facing the other way. I couldn't see his face. I called out to him, but he didn't respond, and eventually he said something weird. He asked me if he could come up, but his voice was all wrong. Dad knew where the pull string was to let the rope ladder down, and yet he kept asking me if he could come up, repeating the same thing over and over no matter what I told him. I closed the door, then covered my face in the sleeping bag. Eventually, it was gone, or he was gone, I guess, because he finally stopped asking me if he could come up. After a few minutes, I got so scared and freaked out by that, I ran home, but then... I saw Dad standing there, at the bedroom window, still facing away from me, looking at you through the glass. As my brother finished his story, he sat down on the bed, seemingly exhausted, or just really scared. As for me, my eyes were watering with terror. Why did he see Dad, and I saw him? And why did neither of us see this person's face, and why did we never hear their footsteps? That night, we stayed up all night, but first we kept the lights on, and we stapled some blankets to the windows, as we didn't have any curtains or blinds. I don't remember ever being as scared as I was then, and even still, all these decades later, I've never been that scared. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night. Nor did anything similar happen for the remainder of our childhood there in those West Virginia woods. Soon the event became a distant, creepy memory. One that of course we shared with our friends who never believed us. They thought these two brothers were just trying to fool them and scare them. I wish I could have told them it was just a prank, but it wasn't. A few years after that, Long after my brother moved out to go to college, and just after I moved out to attend my university, I was excited to hear the news that my brother would be graduating. He would be getting his bachelor's in astronomy. I congratulated him over the phone, and he told me he wasn't done yet. He was looking to get his doctorate in astronomy as well. He wanted to study the stars, just like we did in that clearing by the clubhouse. I thought it was amazing, and I was so proud of him. 
about a week after that, I received another call. This one was from my dad. I remember standing in my dormitory, answering the phone, and collapsing to my knees. Son, a drunk driver hit your brother on the road. I'm on my way to pick you up, okay? Dad? What do you mean, Dad? Is he okay? I I'll see you soon. He didn't give me an answer, and I knew that was a bad sign. I sat there on the floor, choking back tears. I just kept calling my brother's phone over and over and over, expecting someone to answer, even though I knew they wouldn't. When my dad knocked on the dormitory door, I let him in, and it took all the strength I had just to get up. He was already in tears. He hugged me before he said a word, but the first thing he did say as we embraced each other was, He's gone. There's a feeling you get when you lose your other half, when something that's such a big part of yourself and your life just ceases to exist, when it's ripped away from you. To me, it felt like drowning, like I couldn't breathe, like it wasn't real, sheer and utter and helpless panic. I ended up taking a year off, moving back in with my parents, who still at the time lived at the old house in the woods. Mom was a mess, and Dad it took everything he had to keep going. My old man became angry. The loving man I'd once known was now filled with hatred towards other people, because it was, after all, some stranger who took his son away from him. And my brother had been my mom's pride and joy, a college graduate getting one step closer to his dreams all gone, because someone couldn't wait to get home to drink. The first night I came back home, I slept in our old room. Then the tears came back that night. But with the pain came a different feeling, a different desire. Deep inside me, something kept telling me that I had to go to the clubhouse that I couldn't sleep here, that I needed to go to the old treehouse out there to see how it looked and to stay the night. But I knew why those feelings came up. I fought to push them back down, but ultimately I lost. So as not to wake my family, I climbed out the window, bringing nothing but my jacket. I walked into the woods, making my way toward the old clubhouse. The trek was much tougher on my older self than I remembered, but I made it there. And all this time later, it looked just as I recalled. The wood still well maintained. I didn't know how it was possible. I mean, I hadn't been back at the clubhouse for a few years. I stopped going when my brother moved off to college. Just didn't see the point. I searched for the old hidden drawstring. I found it and yanked down the rope ladder. I climbed up with some trouble, but eventually pulled myself up. I opened the door and lay down inside. I stared up at the roof, and I waited, and waited, and waited. I wanted to watch outside below the treehouse, but I was afraid it wouldn't come if I was watching. But no matter how long I waited, it wouldn't come. I stayed awake until I saw the first beams of sunrise and the tears came back, because then I really knew I would never be able to see my brother again, and yet I'd come out here hoping that that thing we saw that night would come back, and I could, at the very least, see my brother facing the other way, asking if he could come up, and that time around, I would have given him an answer. The Diner, from Paramount Risk. My friend Derek and I had been driving for several hours making our way towards Tulsa, Oklahoma, from Corpus Christi, Texas. We had just crossed the state line into Oklahoma, and I'd taken a wrong turn along the way, adding another half hour to our trip according to the GPS. It was around 2 a.m. We had decided I'd be the starting driver for the trip, and Christ, I was beyond tired. We started the journey a little too late in the day. 
My eyelids felt as heavy as soaked blankets, and to be honest, I just didn't feel like it was safe for me to keep driving much longer. Derek was in the passenger seat, snoring. Every snore felt like he was unconsciously rubbing it in, that he was getting some peaceful sleep while I had to avoid driving right off the road into some centuries-old pine tree. I promised myself I'd stop somewhere the moment I saw lights, preferably somewhere that had some steaming hot coffee for me to gorge on. If not, it would be Derek's turn to drive for a while. Unfortunately, the darkness of the wooded road didn't seem to end. But when I did finally see light in the distance, like a beacon on the roadside, I almost didn't believe it. I slowed down to turn off into the parking lot carefully. Sure enough, there was a diner sitting there. My heart sank. The light had been coming from a light pole in the parking lot. The diner itself seemed dark and ancient. It looked as if it hadn't been open for decades. Still, I parked, got out for a second to stretch my everything, then leaned into the open door to see Derek waking up. Where the heck are we, dude? He asked, groggily. The sticks, just inside Oklahoma. <sighs> I replied into a yawn. Oklahoma, about time. He yawned, too. I rolled my eyes. He'd been sleeping for hours. I should have been the one saying about time. There's an old diner over there. I was hoping for a cup of coffee, but it looks to be abandoned. I told him. He scratched his head. Oh, well, there's no one around. No traffic driving by, either. Pretty good spot if you want to rest. My thoughts exactly. I pulled away from the open door to walk around the other side. You can take over for a while. <laughs> Whoa there, dude. I'm not done sleeping. Derek leaned his seat back further and closed his eyes. Are you kidding me? Don't you want to make it to the hotel and sleep in an actual bed? We're only like a few hours away. I insisted. As he leaned back, he tapped on the radio screen. The time was 2.30 a.m. Uh, whatever. I gave in, practically sinking into the driver's seat. I leaned it as far back as it would go, clicked the door locks at least three times to be sure, and closed my eyes. Ethan, wake up! My eyes shot open. Derek was shaking me by the shoulder. He went on as I rubbed my eyes. The lights in the diner came on. Uh, what? I clicked the button on the seat, slowly rising into an inclined position. I checked the clock first. 3.50 a.m. Then I looked out the window. Sure enough, Derek was right. The diner lights were on now. There was an open sign, occasionally flashing. My stomach growled and my caffeine addiction clawed at me from somewhere in the back of my head. Ugh, thank God. I opened the door. You're going in? Derek asked. I haven't seen anyone in there. And there's no cars in the lot at all, except for us. Well, yeah, I'm starving and need some coffee. I exited the car and shut the door. What Derek really said took a few seconds to hit. I looked around the parking lot, empty. No cars at all save our own, and no driveway leading around the back of the small building to hide other cars. Then I looked at the diner windows. No silhouettes, no movement from within. Derek got out too, standing by the car. He nearly fell mid-stretch. Probably got lightheaded from standing up too fast. I leaned on the roof of the car and talked over to him. You're right, no cars. Nobody inside from the looks of it. Maybe the owners live in the restaurant or something. No way. We out here they'd need a car even still. He was right. From my experience, unless you were completely off the grid... Folks who lived in the country definitely needed something to drive the distance between the closest stores and their home. Okay, yeah, that's a little weird. But might as well go inside, if there's even a chance they have some coffee. I made my way around the car. Derek loudly sighed, but ultimately decided to join me. The two of us began to walk over to the glass door of the diner. Soon, I started to hear the neon buzz of the open sign. And I swear I could smell coffee. 
which brought a tired smile to my face. The window still revealed no one inside. Derek made it to the door first, pulling it open for me. I took a step inwards. The lights inside must have been terribly bright, or my eyes had been on the road too long, because I had to squeeze my eyes shut and rub them as I stepped inside. Apparently, Derek had to do the same. My eyes were the first to go back to normal. What the heck? I stood motionless for a second. The inside was trashed. The lights we'd seen from the outside were off. I glanced at the open sign, and it certainly wasn't on anymore, and seemed to not have been on for years. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, that's trippy, Derek said behind me. He came inside and let the door close. Did we just hallucinate together? Sharing the same hallucination? I replied. Can't be. Maybe it's something more like a uh, mirage. That idea made at least a little sense to me, driving for hours without sleep and seeing what you wanted to see on the side of the road. Either way, this is creepy, and it sucks. Man, I wanted some pancakes. Derek turned around to reopen the door. It didn't budge. What? Derek shook it with his full body weight. It won't open. What are you talking about? I went over to the door and began to shove on it too. It didn't have a knob on it or a lever or anything of the sort. Just an arm length handle. The kind of door you just shove or pull on and it opens with ease. However, this door was no longer willing to open. I checked the small lock at the edge of the door right above the handle. Instead of turning 90 degrees in either direction to lock and unlock, it turned loosely and fully in both directions, as if the bolt on the thing had broken or fallen out ages ago. If it was still in there, it wasn't moving. We were locked in. Dang it, I'm busting out these windows. Derek went for a rusty stool at the counter. Whoa there, Derek. This is not our property, and I'm sure it still belongs to someone. You want a criminal record for destruction of property? He rolled his eyes. Dude, you're paranoid. He put the stool back down. No? Well, maybe, but there's always a back door or a side door. Shouldn't we try that first before destroying crap? <sighs> Fine. Derek pulled out his phone and tapped on the flashlight icon. I did the same. We scanned the dining area. There were a few booths on either side of the front door and a long counter where folks once sat to enjoy a quick roadside breakfast. There was a rusty old register at the end of the counter. It was then I saw a sparkle in Derek's conniving eyes, telling me he wanted to open and check that register for some cash. I swear that guy would have been a felon if I left him to his own devices. We made our way slowly to the side of the counter, where there was a swinging door probably leading to the kitchen. We stepped carefully over the floor where pieces of broken table and tossed about stools lay as hazards in the floor. I searched around the remainder of the room and raised an eyebrow. Uh, isn't there supposed to be, like, an emergency exit in the front? I asked. I don't know, man. There's probably a door in the kitchen, though. Derek leaned over the counter to check the floor behind it. I made it to the swinging door and pushed it open. Luckily, there was no resistance. Slowly, I pushed it far enough to peer inside. The kitchen was almost pitch black, as the only windows in the building appeared to be in the dining area. I shone my flashlight around, and I swear it revealed maybe a few yards in front of me than nothing else beyond that. I glanced at the kitchen line. I think that's what it's called. The horizontal counter and the wall behind the diner counter where the waiters or waitresses pick up the food. Some light bled into the kitchen from there, but not much. Whoa, it's super dark in here. Derek muttered beside me as he entered the kitchen, without much hesitation. Watch your step. I can barely see anything in here. I paused at the idea of letting the door close behind me. 
but feeling pressured by Derek's brazen behavior, I stepped forward anyway. I felt my way for the side wall to my right. I found it and followed it, aiming my phone light down at the floor to make sure I didn't trip on anything. My plan was to follow the wall to the inevitable door. Derek, on the other hand, was a few feet from me walking almost blindly forward. Though he wasn't really that far away, with my light pointing towards him, I could barely see him, but I could hear him pretty well. The two of us walked for about a minute before realizing something. Uh, when does this kitchen end, dude? Derek asked from the darkness. He had a point. This diner looked to be the size of your typical Denny's. If you walked from the front to the back, it should only take a few seconds. I don't know. Place is probably bigger than we thought it was. I didn't really get a good look at the back, you know? I answered him. Sure, Derek breathed. There was exasperation in his voice. Suddenly, I stepped on something that I must have missed. It was squishy. I looked down, aiming my light at the floor and my shoe. A slimy, solid black substance lay on the floor in a splotch below me. I'd stepped in it, but luckily none of it stayed on my shoe. I winced at the smell, though. A stench of earth, blood, and rot came from this splotch. Instinctively, I told myself it wasn't blood. It couldn't be blood, as if I was coping with this creepy situation. Derek? I called out to him. I wanted to remind him to watch his step. I waited a few seconds. Derek! I called again, but no response. Then I heard it, a sound that made my heart feel as if it was disintegrating. It was a moan, like a very old woman in pain. I stopped in my tracks. Hello? There was an echo to my voice that wasn't there before. I turned around, keeping one hand on the wall to orientate myself. The faint light bleeding in from the kitchen line area was no longer there. I began to panic, my breathing becoming quick and shallow. I wanted to run back to the swinging door that had to be in that direction. Instead, I swallowed hard and I shook my head. Keep going. You can't go back, I thought to myself. I had no idea why I felt that way when we had yet to find evidence of a back door. But something told me I had no choice but to move forward, that moving back would lead to something, something bad. I turned myself around again, back in the direction I'd been going to find the rear door. I moved more slowly, keeping my head angled down to watch the floor. Derek. I tried to call again, but my will faltered, and I ended up saying his name as nothing more than a whisper. As I went on, the moaning came and went randomly. Several seconds of silence, then the occasional raspy moan. Suddenly, another splotch appeared below me. I saw this one in time to avoid it. But as I continued on, the splotches became more frequent. Before long, the floor had disappeared and I was trekking through a thin and stinking layer of slimy black stuff. It squelched with every step, and I wanted to gag every time I heard it. Then I stopped. My light landed on something in the slime less than a foot in front of me. I'd nearly ran into it. Shoes. Gray shoes. Those were Derek's. Derek? I called out, moving my light upward. From the shoes, to the jeans, to the waist, then... Ethan. I heard Derek's voice call out to me. To my horror, it came from my left, in the void, where he'd been when we first started walking through this room. Ethan, that's not me. Do not look at its face. I'd never been more scared in my entire life. I listened to Derek's voice. I didn't allow my light to move further up this figure as I left the wall for only a moment to move around the figure, 
I overtook it and struggled with all my might not to look back at it. If it had been Derek, after all, he would have reacted to me walking around him. I reached out my right hand to feel for the wall that should have been there, but I nearly fell. The wall was gone. I stretched out my hand as far as it would go, but the wall was gone. I gasped. Tears welled up in my eyes. My body was trembling. Derek! I called out desperately. Just keep going forward, Ethan. He replied to me. I did as he said. I walked forward. Soon, I saw something else ahead of me. Pillars? I thought. Several silhouettes, like columns of similar size. As I got closer, I shone my light at them. They... They were trees. What in the world? I whispered. As I passed these trees, the squelching sound underfoot stopped. The sounds of twigs and dirt and grass replaced it. A few seconds later, the trees ended, and I found myself at the edge of a dimly lit road. I could barely breathe as my mind attempted to make sense of what just happened. From the trees to my left, Derek emerged. He ran towards me, breathing heavily. Dude, holy crap, what just happened? He panted. I could do nothing but shake my head. Staring across the road, I could see a parking lot, a single light pole, an abandoned-looking diner, and a single silver car. Our car. How... How did we get from the kitchen to across the street? I wondered to no one in particular. I knew there would be no answer. Together, we ran full speed to the car. I'll drive, Derek insisted. Without another word, we hopped inside the car and pulled away, beginning to burn rubber down the road. I looked back towards the diner only once, and my eyes widened. Because I swear to God, I saw a car the same make and model and color as ours pull into the parking lot. I have no idea what happened that night, but I feel so incredibly blessed that we made it out of that diner at all. What really scares me, though, is when Derek and I discussed the experience when we finally made it to our hotel in Tulsa. Derek, how did you know about the figure in front of me? I asked him. He looked at me with his head cocked a bit to the side. You told me not to look at its face. What did that mean? His eyes went wide. Ethan, quit messing with me, man. I'm so done with tonight. He was visibly angry. The heck are you talking about? I stood up. You called out to me, remember? He shook his head and looked me dead in the eyes. All I remember, Ethan, is that I didn't say a word to you until I found you standing right in front of me. And when I did call your name... You told me the same thing. You said, Derek, don't look at its face the moment I began to shine my light at it. We sat down for a while and just came to terms that this actually happened and that we would never get an explanation. Zvolenik from Dax Zvolenik, translating to the follower or the pursuer, was a well-known myth in my town. It was a short and simple tale. It went like this. If you were ever alone in the woods, especially after dark, you might attract a spirit. It would become infatuated with you. To it, you represented a world different than its own, and as such, it would pursue you. When the spirit, your Zvolenik, had chosen you, it would make itself known by a whisper and three claps of its hands. If you were to be chosen by these Volenik, it would protect you from any beasts prowling the woods, and it would always ensure you would make it home before dark. It sounds rather pleasant, right? As expected, though, there is a clause. It would always follow directly behind you, and should you ever turn around while it was following you and look upon it, it would steal you away 
and drag you back with it into the realm beyond, from where you would never return. That's how the story goes, anyway. I never looked much into it. Little tales like this enriched our small town, but they were supposed to be taken with a grain of salt. On occasion, a friend might joke about attracting a Zvolenik, if we were ever walking through the woods, but that was about as far as it went, at least for the majority of my time growing up. In my last year of school, my country's equivalent of high school, I was walking home one day. I remember it being fall. The air was crisp and cold, and leaves were crunching beneath my feet. Often I would cut through the forest as it saved a good amount of time to and from school, and I'd rarely see anyone else. That day was no different, until I reached about the middle point, from where I would enter and exit the forest. I heard a strange noise. It was loud enough to pull me away from my music, so I took my headphones off, and I looked at where it had come from. It sounded like something shooting over my head, and so I gazed up but I saw nothing. Then another noise sounded just behind me. I turned, seeing nothing beyond a few upkicked leaves, as if something had landed that I couldn't see. More leaves were kicked up, as it seemed to take off again. Then I heard something else. Children's laughter, echoing from it into the woods and towards me. Odder still, there were so many voices, it sounded like an entire class of children laughing ceremoniously, in unison. And just as whatever it was moved off, the sound lessened. The ordeal only lasted a few seconds, and yet I stood there, perplexed. I could not rationalize it. I was positive that something had been ripping its way through the forest. But how could I not have seen it? And how could it have possibly been laughing in such a way? I didn't have a clue. Still confused, I continued my walk at a hurried pace, making it out of the woods without incident. That strange encounter occupied my thoughts for most of the evening. I remember telling my partner at the time about it. He seemed convinced it was a group of children playing in the woods, but I was positive it was no bunch of kids. Of course, I had no other suggestions as to what it could have been, and so the topic was left alone. The next morning, I left home earlier than usual. If you were in my place, you may have decided to avoid the woods altogether, but I wanted to know more. The forest was very familiar to me, and the unique experience made it seem alien, despite all my hours inside of it. So, if not to make myself more secure... I wanted to go and see if I could find what I'd seen the previous day. I walked through the woods, returning to the spot where the encounter had happened. This time, though, I was actively watching my surroundings. The entire area seemed devoid of movement. Even the few leaves left on the branches were holding still. I saw nothing out of the ordinary, until I neared where I'd been the day before. It was like I stepped over an invisible line. As I crossed a point between two large rocks, a chill washed over my entire body. Despite my long coat, I shivered. With the cold sensation came another feeling. The distinct sense of being watched grabbed hold of me, and I hurriedly scanned the woods around me, entirely positive a mountain lion, or another predator, was preparing to pounce on me. There was nothing, though. No animal in sight. No signs to indicate any danger whatsoever. And yet, an alarm was still ringing in my head, indicating to me that something was out there. I took a step forward, and as I did, an impact sounded from up ahead. The unmistakable sound of something landing on the forest floor captured my attention. I looked up, seeing nothing immediately. As I focused, though, I began to see something strange. Leaves were being disturbed on the forest floor. It was like something was walking on them. I could even hear a crunch as each imprint formed. I watched on, utterly confused. It seemed an invisible creature was walking towards me. 
it soon became clear that this is what had been watching me. Instinctively, I paced backwards, stumbling as I collided with one of the large rocks I'd previously passed. I fell over it, landing on the leaves lining the ground. As quickly as I could, I regained my footing, hopelessly searching with my eyes for something that I could not see. It seemed that it was gone, though. No more leaves were being stepped on, and there was no inexplicable sounds. I relaxed, my nerves calming down. I remember laughing to myself, immediately trying to brush it off as something that I had imagined. As if to argue against me, though, I suddenly picked up on faint laughter that sounded again as if it was coming from a group of children. Of course, I left after that, giving one more curious look to the two rocks I'd passed through. I didn't bother telling anyone about it. If I had, I certainly would have been chastised. For the next few days, I wondered about what I'd seen. I am a logical person, and I tried my best to explain it as a trick of the senses, a trick created by a very rare environmental phenomenon but I never truly believed any explanation I came up with. What stuck with me the most the next few weeks as I opted to avoid the woods was the sense of malice I felt. Despite not even being able to see what it was, I felt as if I'd been staring down a predator who had the singular intention to hurt me. This was reason enough to take the long way to and from school for the next while. Eventually, the calendar had rolled into December, and we had experienced our town's first snowfall. It was light, only dusting the ground and chilling the air. I was a hobbyist photographer at the time, and I loved capturing scenic photos of the trees during the winter season. I wrestled with my past experiences in the woods for a little while, still not entirely over what had happened. Ultimately, I decided to go but only because I would be accompanied by my partner. Not being alone made it much easier. I no longer felt at risk, and if I did see it again, so would another person. As we entered the forest, I felt a little on edge. Not quite the polarizing sensation of being watched, but still a strange sensation. I brushed it off, intent on snapping a series of lovely photos, and I did just that. We went on a scenic tour, though I insisted on avoiding the general area where the two encounters had previously taken place. Nothing strange happened, and I finished with a camera roll of 20 or so lovely shots, even being lucky enough to capture a bird in one. When I told him I was ready to leave, he suggested we should go and get some coffee. It was cold out, with the sun already beginning to set, and so I agreed. Without much thought, I followed him as he led us out of the forest. Not quickly enough, I realized we were nearing the area I'd had the strange encounter in. I wanted to say something, but I thought it foolish. After all, cutting through would save us a few minutes, and I figured I'd be just fine with the company of another person. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as the familiar pair of rocks came into view. They sat, innocently, dusted in snow. For some reason, I found myself fascinated by them. They lacked any reason to capture my attention on their own, but even so, I approached them. Idly, I wondered if they were related to what I'd encountered. I got no answer as I passed between them, continuing to walk up the now white trail. Only a few seconds later, however, that sensation of being watched returned. It was the exact same from the previous encounter. Immediately, I looked towards my partner, but to my horror, he was no longer there. He had left my field of view for only a handful of seconds, and yet he had completely disappeared. I called out his name as I walked forward. No response. My walk turned into a run as I looked up and down the near-dark forest, but still, I found nothing. No one. The terrible feeling of being stalked became overbearing, and so I took off, running in a random direction. 
I kept going and going, but no matter how far I went, I could not escape it. Suddenly, as I stopped to catch my breath, I heard something cut through the air above me. From sound alone, I heard it impact on the floor. I glanced over, seeing leaves disturbed, but of course, nothing that could have done it. The woods had grown quiet, and over my labored breathing, I heard the crunch of steps being taken. From small visual cues, I could tell it was no more than ten feet away from me. It came closer, and fatigued as I was, I did not run. Instead, I only watched where I assumed the invisible thing was as it approached. I remember falling backwards as the wind seemed to pick up out of nowhere. It was loud, heavy, almost warm, even despite the chill of a winter night. Within a few seconds, it died down. And then, terrifyingly, I heard my name whispered right into my ear. Dax. Three sharp sounds followed, as if there was something large and hooved, stamping the ground just behind me. The invisible entity, now only feet from me, took one last audible step forward before it, too, stopped. There I sat, convinced I was going to die, because I foolishly returned to these woods, waiting as it seemingly stood still. Then, without warning, I watched as leaves were suddenly kicked up in a flurry. It was no longer walking. It was as if it was being dragged, away from me, no less. Two thick lines in the frosted dirt were created as the invisible entity was ripped backwards, further into the woods. A sound emanated from its direction, not of children's laughter, though. It was a child crying. A single male child crying. It quieted just as the disturbance of leaves disappeared. I do not know how long I waited there. Eventually, I did stand up, finding it hard to keep my balance as my freezing legs struggled to hold up the rest of my body. I had no idea what had happened, and though the feeling of being watched had left me, I realized it had been replaced with something else, the familiar presence of support. It was as if I wasn't alone, not like there was a threat, mind you, something kind, like a friend was there with me. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder. I wanted to turn around, believing it to be my boyfriend but it soon became clear it was not ordinary. There was a heat emanating from the hand that seemed to cleanse the cold out of my entire body. Before I could make a move, I watched frost in front of me beginning to melt from the ground. It was inexplicable, as it was most likely below zero at the time. Not all the snow was melting, either. I watched as it formed a path, a one-foot-wide path being slowly cut through the snow, the fresh colors of healthy grass and leaves contrasting with the icy white of the rest of the woods. Somehow totally trusting this, I followed the path. It wound and wove seemingly all about the woods, but within minutes, I knew where I was again. It led just between the two rocks, the same two I'd passed through before the affair happened. The warm hand on my shoulder encouraged me as I walked forward, and finally, I felt it disappear as I passed between the two rocks. Just as I did, I fell forward. The warmth and comfort I'd felt had vanished so suddenly, I lost my balance. Quickly, I recovered, and wanting to find out what had guided me back, I spun around, but of course, there was nothing. Looking past the rocks, there was no pathway of healthy grass, nor any entity that could have been responsible for the hand on my shoulder. I stood there for a moment, perplexed, when I heard footsteps behind me. I turned, smiling as my partner ran up and hugged me. He began to ask me where I'd gone, telling me he had panicked and was searching all around for me. With no valid explanation to give, I hugged him back. We stayed like that for a few minutes, before we both opted to leave the now dark woods. 
that is where my story ends. I've dwelled on it for many years, and I have a few theories as to what exactly occurred. I think the Twin Rocks served as some kind of barrier, or gateway, into a different place, for lack of a better word. I can only guess as to the identity of the invisible thing that seemed to pursue me, though I do not doubt for a moment its intentions were hostile. As for what protected me, what warmed my freezing body and guided me to safety, I firmly believe that it was a Zvolenik. Why it chose me that night, I will never know. Of course, I often find myself wondering what would have happened had I turned around and faced it with its hand on my shoulder. Perhaps I would not be here to write my story. Remember to be careful when you're in the woods. Beyond dangerous animals and landscapes, there may be other things we lack the ability to understand. The Haunted School from Edgar Zayas This happened around late summer to early fall of 2015, I believe. It's been a while, so I'm not 100% sure of the date. But at the time, I had a group of friends and acquaintances that were interested in the paranormal, as much as I've been since I was a kid, due to experiences I've had all my life. One night, we were all hanging out together, and one of the group, I'll call him Jay, started telling the tale of a school near Lenoir, North Carolina, a town not too far from where we were at the time that had been an all-African-American children's school back when segregation was still a thing in the early 1900s. I have in the following years not been able to find any proof of this story, so I can't be sure how factual it is. I will admit I may have some of the dates he gave in the story wrong due to how long ago it was. Anyway, he told us that back in the 1920s, as the legend goes, the clan came to this school while it was in session and proceeded to lock all the doors with the children and teachers inside, setting fire to the school. Everyone was lost. A few years later, a new school was rebuilt on the site of the fire, and then after several years of operation, the school became too small and was closed after a new larger school was built a few miles away. He then explained that while the new school was in operation, there were several reports by not only students, but also from teachers and other staff members of odd paranormal activity. Supposedly, the later in the day it was, the more activity there was. So we decided to go to the school and investigate the school and see if any of the stories were true. We drove out using one car and fitting all seven of us in it was a sight to see. Three up front, four in the back, in a mid-sized sedan. It was an interesting 30-minute drive, but once we arrived and pretty much fell out of the car, we took in our surroundings. We had parked on a little pull-off on the opposite side of the road from the school. There was a chain running across the entrance of the gravel parking lot of the school, which is why we didn't park in the lot. I looked around and saw that the school was broken up into four separate buildings. The main three were set on a graded hill, staggered down with a set of steps running behind the three to connect them. The middle of the three was where the bathrooms and lockers were. The upper and lower levels were where the classrooms were. There was a larger back building that was newer than the rest and was the gymnasium. It had been built after the rest of the three buildings had been rebuilt after the fire. There were also concrete paths that ran alongside each of the buildings before the start of the retaining walls that allowed the grade between each layer of the school. We decided to go to the upper building first. We walked up the stairs in the back and entered the building at the top level. Now let me explain that the doors to this building were at least seven to seven and a half feet tall. They were red and metal. One of the doors had fallen off its hinges and lay in the dirt at an angle. We proceeded into the hallway of the building and we had to be very careful as the floor was rotting and falling in in several places. We could see down into the exposed dirt of the ground several feet below. Debris lay scattered all over the floor. We made our way to the far end of the hallway, and we entered an old classroom on the left of the hall. As we looked around at the ruined room, we noticed that the windows that were almost all the way to the ceiling were starting to fog up for some reason. 
Really, to this day, I do not believe that our breath was responsible for this. Then, one of the members of our group pointed out that there was something outside the window that looked out of place. We all started to look toward the windows, and as we watched, a small child-sized handprint began to appear in the condensation at the top of the windows, which were at least six and a half feet off the floor level. At this point, Jay mentioned that the upper building was where the original school stood that had been used as a death trap for the children and teachers back in the 20s. We were all shocked, and some of us were flat out freaked out by this. We decided to make our way back down the hall to see if anything outside the windows could have possibly made these marks. We exited the room, and before we made it more than a few feet back down the hall, we all stopped dead in our tracks. Because at the end of the hall that had the only exit to the building, we saw a shadow figure that was standing just outside the doorway of the building. Now the reason I know it was outside the building and not inside is because this figure had to lean down to its left just to be able to look in the doorway. The doorway was about seven feet tall. The shadow blocked out the light from the outside as it did. The shadow man had to have been over eight feet tall. It was skinny, not slender man type of skinny, but a normal fit man's build of kind of skinny. Not bulky or muscular, but fit. We ducked into the next room, which was on our left, on the opposite side of the hall from where the classroom we had just visited was, and it was just a storeroom full of school desks with attached chairs. We waited a few minutes, then myself and another of our group, G, decided to look and see if the coast was clear. We walked back out into the hall and looked towards the doorway. Nothing was there. We told the rest of the group, they followed us as we slowly made our way to the end of the hall, skipping the rest of the rooms in the building, as we were done with this place. When we finally made it to the end of the hall, I volunteered to be the first to walk out the door to see if the coast was clear. We then made our way back down the stairs to the second level. Looking back at the upper building, we noticed that about halfway down the building, there looked to be a doorway with a cover over it, with thin pillars holding it up. Right outside the door under the covering stood what looked to be another figure, probably around six feet tall, that was cloaked in a black robe. I was staring at this figure, trying to figure out what I'm seeing. A couple members of the group started freaking out again, but I'm determined to find out what it was, so I begin to walk down the path on the second level towards the figure. This path was on the middle level, so there was at least a 20 foot or more distance between the closest part of the path to the upper building. When I was about 50 feet from the figure, it just faded out of existence. All seven of us saw it fade out. We regrouped at my location after a few moments and determined that we had all seen it vanish as we were all looking right at it the whole time. I have to admit, I was even starting to become unnerved at this point because this was the most paranormal activity I'd been witness to in one place at one time but we all decided after a while to continue our investigation. We then went down and entered the middle building from the front. As we enter, we see rows of lockers on both sides of the hall. We find that on the left side of the building was the auditorium. A lot of the floor had collapsed in, and we were able to find a path over to the stage. We found a set of jacks and a ball lying on the edge of the stage. Kind of odd, but we also found a few other odds and ends lying around, but nothing out of the ordinary, other than the jacks. After we made our way back out of the auditorium and back into the hall, we made our way down the hallway checking out each room, which were mostly bathrooms or shower rooms for the students, and nothing abnormal happened, until we reached the end of the hallway. We began to hear something like running down the hallway towards us from the opposite end. I turned to look back as I exited the building, and in the shadows, I see what looks to be the silhouette of a werewolf running on all fours towards us. This creature was in the shadows, and any time it reached the areas of the hallway where moonlight was shining in, it would reset, as in it would disappear and reappear instantaneously back at the far end of the hallway, still running at us. That was it for me. I told everyone else that we needed to go now. I rushed past most of the group, who seemed to be all staring wide-eyed down the hall. I started back down the stairs towards ground level, but not even halfway down in the gymnasium, 
we heard the sound of sneakers squeaking, as if a basketball game was being played inside. We all stopped halfway down and listened. Slowly, we crept down the stairs towards the closed double doors of the gym, and as we made it to the bottom step that was ground level, the basketball game noises stopped. For a couple of seconds, there was total silence inside the gym until the sound of several, as in 20 or more, people running right at the doors to the gym echoed through the building. G and I slammed ourselves against the doors in an attempt to hold them shut against the oncoming footsteps. We yelled and urged the rest of the group to run on ahead and get out of the way. As the last couple of people ran past us, the running footsteps hit the doors almost knocking myself and G to the ground. We held our positions, holding the doors shut as whatever was inside the gym proceeded to slam the door repeatedly for what seemed like minutes, but it must have been 10 to 15 seconds. Then it all stopped. Silence. G and I looked at each other and without a word, we both jumped back away from the doors, waiting for something or someone to come rushing through. But there was nothing. The rest of the group had stopped about 20 to 25 feet down the gravel path, back to the parking lot, and were watching intently as we slowly backed away from the doors and finally turned to walk back over to join them. Back with the group, I noticed that the two girls were looking off towards the chained-off field on the other side of the parking lot from the school but they were looking back down past the far side of the gym in the field. I glanced back and only saw what looked to be an old mechanical pump for a well. I looked back at them and asked what they were looking at. One of them, J.S., said, Don't you see her? I glanced back and didn't see anything. I asked her, Who? She broke her gaze and looked at me. She said, The little girl in the dress. Then she looked back towards the field. I told her no, I didn't see anything, but we needed to go, so G and I started to usher the rest back towards the car, and as I was the last to cross back over the chain blocking the entrance, I turned back to seal off any spirits from following us from the property, but as I looked one last time towards the field where the pump was, standing right next to it was what looked to be about a 7-9 to nine year old girl in a white and blue 1940s era dress facing away from me, looking towards the woods beyond. Needless to say, I did what I had to do to seal the spirits from following us, and I bolted back to the car, being the last to pile in the back. Then we got out of there as quickly as we could. As we drove back to the house, we compared notes, and out of everything I recounted in the story, at least five of the seven of us all saw the same thing and validated each other's accounts. The few occasions that any one of us didn't agree to the rest is when that person had been in the back of the group or had not left the room as we exited prior to the experience, so they had missed the sighting. I can say that I've been to several haunted locations and I've lived in several haunted houses, including a demonic haunting, and even there, I've never seen so much paranormal activity in one place in such a short amount of time as I did at the school. We were there for less than half an hour and it still ranks as the number one most active haunted location I've been to, to this day. The Creature of the Coconino National Forest, from Bose Koala It started when I moved to Flagstaff to attend college. My parents had come into some money and decided to pay for an apartment for me to live in, if I kept my grades up. My fiancé, Anne, and our dog, Rosebud, and I were new in town, and school still had a few months before it started. I'd also brought my pet, Hedgehog, with me, as I wasn't sure if anyone else in my family would have the time to take care of him. We both struggle with social anxiety, so we ended up becoming shut-ins. Watching movies, playing video games together, ordering in pizza, and listening to podcasts. That's what we did for our first month in the apartment, just waiting for school to start. We went through dozens of video games over that month, and I ended up wanting to play something new. Well, new for me anyway, and I landed on Bloodborne. I loved the gothic and Lovecraftian horror in it, and enjoyed it a ton, even if I did suck at it. But it's not really a scary game. So, to fulfill my horror needs, I listened to scary podcasts, which got me more interested in the paranormal and in cryptids. 
Now my apartment was located by a forest, no more than, say, half an hour walk away, and there was also a park across the street from us. Often we'd hear kids screaming and having fun in the park, but the first odd occurrence was about a week away from school starting. My fiancé was packing up her things and getting ready to move into her dorm because her parents didn't agree with her living with me. And even though she ended up staying over at my place most nights, she needed to keep up appearances with them. I helped out, obviously, and many nights we were up late making sure we both had everything we needed for our first year of college. But one night our conversations about high school friends and talks of cryptids and the like were interrupted by blood-curdling screams. We rushed over to the window and looked out into the darkness of the park. We couldn't see anything, but more screams came. Our neighbors even stepped outside, shining a flashlight. The party going on in the apartment above us had come to a full stop. More screams. I dialed 911. The lines were busy, or maybe I couldn't get signal. We stepped outside, keeping our dog inside for her own safety. We both called 911 again in hopes of getting through, but still the lines were too busy. Looking around, other people were trying to call 911 too. Some were successful in reporting it. No one went to look into the park, as cliche as it sounds. I want to say something felt off about it. Not the scream. More like whoever it was wasn't screaming for help, and they weren't screaming for someone to stop hurting them. They were just screaming. Eventually, we went back inside as others did the same. We went to bed shaken that night. The air felt full of tension. I think our dog could even feel it, as she kept growling at the doors and windows all night. Once school started, my fiancé had to spend an entire week in her dorm, as it was parents' week, and her parents wanted to make sure she wasn't living with me during the school year, and only during summers. Nothing else odd had happened at that point. So my fiancé felt fine leaving me and Rosebud alone for a week. And it wasn't like we couldn't see each other at all. She just couldn't stay the night. Or so we thought. Her parents seemed to want to spend every free minute she had with her. I can understand that. And honestly, I kind of wished my parents had shown up for parents' week. So I wasn't about to protest them having fun family time together. So I sucked it up and lived on my own that week. But I really wish I hadn't. It started the first night she was away. A knock at the door. I walked to the door and peeked through the people, and only saw the park across the street and the cars parked out front. It was odd, but I didn't think too much of it. I was focusing on getting my homework done that was assigned to me on the first day of school. Then another set of knocks came. I approached the door again, my dog growling and barking at it. Moving her aside to peek outside again, but once more, there was nothing. I assumed it was some neighborhood kids having fun, so I ignored it and went back to my homework. Yet again, the knocks came, much harder this time. I jumped at them. I approached the door hesitantly and peeked outside. Though still, there was no one there. I yelled out, That was a good one, you really got me, but I'm trying to do homework. Can you stop? No one replied, but nothing more happened that night. The following day, when I got back from school, I headed straight home and took a nap. It had been a long day, and I barely got any sleep the night before. I cuddled up with my pup on my bed and fell asleep early. We both awoke late at night to tapping at the window. She growled at it with her hackles standing on end, and I approached it moving the curtain out of the way and looking outside. At first, I couldn't see anything, until I spotted a deer with massive antlers, almost comically large. It was walking around in the park across the street, but there was no sign of whoever was tapping in my window. I closed the curtains and turned on Netflix to try to ease the tension. With Parks and Rec playing in the background, I went to make myself and my dog some dinner. I was just about done cooking my meal and Rosebud was probably about halfway done eating at that point when we both heard tapping again, this time in the living room window. I was taken aback, but still figured some kids were trying to mess with me. I hesitantly approached the window and turned the blinds to look outside my apartment. 
There, about eight feet away from my window, was the same deer eyeing me as I looked at it. It was illuminated by the scarce streetlights in the apartment complex. It trotted off after I looked at it. I was officially freaked out, and I tried my best to calm my barking dog. I watched TV the rest of the night and relaxed, knowing I didn't have any school the next day. Not much happened the rest of the week until Sunday. A knock on the door here, a tap on the window there, but I didn't think much of it. The deer had freaked me out, sure, but nothing had slammed into my door with force since the first night, so I didn't give it much mind. That day I had been missing my fiancé a lot, and couldn't wait until the next day when I could hold her again as I fell asleep. I was anxious and passing around my house like a madman. I took Rosebud on five walks and still couldn't sit still, so I decided to take all the energy I had and put it towards homework. I finished everything I needed to do for the next two weeks that day before lunch. I honestly thought it was going to be a great day. No knocking or tapping for the first half of the day, and my dog was all smiles and tail wags. My day got even better when my fiancé called to chat with me. We talked for hours on end, laughing and joking and having a great time. Then suddenly my day took a turn for the worst. A knock at my door. Slowly, I stood up and walked out of my room when the knocking came again. I told my fiancé to wait for a minute while I checked the door. Another set of knocks came then, but then a voice came from the other side, one that sounded like my fiancé. Lovey, could you unlock the door? I forgot my keys at my dorm. I laughed and asked on my phone why she was knocking when she could have just asked me to open the door through the phone. A bit freaked out, she replied. What are you talking about? I'm out antiquing with my parents. I stood there, frozen, looking at the door. My dog, who had run excitedly to the door, stood there jumping on it, barking, wanting to see her mom. Not wanting to freak her out, I told her I was just messing with her, and I asked if I could call her back later. Thinking nothing of it, she agreed, and I hung up the phone. I grabbed Rosebud and walked away slowly as more knocks came, followed by more of my fiancé's voice asking me to let her in. Step by step, I inched silently to the bathroom and broke down once I closed the door. I cried as I locked myself and my dog in until the next morning. I awoke to my fiancé knocking on the bathroom door. I panicked at first and refused to open it, Telling her she wasn't herself, confused, my fiancé demanded I open the door because she had to use the restroom. Something about her voice was more calming than the day before, so I began to open the door nervously. Slowly, I cracked it open to see my fiancé standing there as she rushed past me and pushed me out of the bathroom so she could use it. I stood in my room dumbfounded. I'd thought whatever had been knocking at my door the night before had gotten in that what I began to call the skinwalker had somehow broken in and was going to kill me and my dog right then and there. But no, it was only my fiancé finally having time to visit. Not wanting to sound like I'd completely lost it, I told her I must have fallen asleep in the bathroom while trimming our dog's nails and had been having a nightmare when she got home. She asked if I had school that day, and while I did, I explained I'd slept through all my classes that day and that we could just spend the rest of it together now. For about two months, things were good. I kept my horrific week a secret so as to not freak her out, and honestly, we were happy. We found the perfect balance between work and fun and were doing great. I had just come to accept by then that when my fiancé was away sometimes I'd hear knocks or taps and that it was just something that happened, that it was nothing to worry about. Things got worse one night, when our curtain had fallen off the wall. Our dog had pulled on it, wanting to play while we were doing homework, and the curtain rod was pulled loose from the wall. Luckily, no one was hurt, but now our bedroom window could practically be seen through. Sure, we had blinds, but they were so thin you could make out the shadows and shapes of everyone that walked by outside. My fiancé fell asleep first that night, but I couldn't sleep. I kept finding myself staring at the window in fear, 
I lay there looking at the window for hours, trying to convince myself that I was only paranoid because of the supposedly true scary stories I'd listened to earlier in the day, that I was just creeped out. That's when I heard hooves coming down the sidewalk, followed by the sound of something walking in the dirt outside our window. My heart was beating harder than ever before, and I couldn't catch my breath. It was right there. I knew it was. My eyes stayed glued on the window until I passed out. I awoke to a voice talking. That was a good one. You really got me. I looked over at my fiancé and said, What? She snored in response, so I turned back the way I was facing towards the window. That's when I saw the silhouette of a man staring into our room. It couldn't be, I thought. That was just the shadow of one of the cars or the staircase outside that I didn't notice before. I convinced myself and fell back to sleep. This continued for months, nightly visits from a shadowy figure watching me, watching my dog, watching my future wife as we slept. I watched in horror most nights, being unable to sleep until unconsciousness forcibly took me. My sleep schedule was ruined, and my grades were plummeting, so many times I'd just skip school and stay home to catch up on some sleep. I want to say it was around mid-October, when I decided enough was enough. I stapled a blanket over the window. This wouldn't solve the issue permanently, sadly. Until around December it would hold, and those nights weren't too bad, besides Halloween. God, how horrible Halloween was. Both mine and my fiancé's favorite holiday was ruined that year. It started that morning with the upstairs neighbors having a big fight. I swear it was contagious or something. The two of us ended up fighting for a big part of the day, and from the sounds of it, our neighbors on our right and behind us also got into huge arguments as well. But the upstairs neighbor's fight was the worst. We never saw the man that used to live there again, only the woman. And even then, she eventually just disappeared, becoming a complete shut-in. I think their fight broke her. I think it broke all of us, honestly. But Halloween wasn't done with us yet. Of course it wasn't. On a day that celebrates the spooky and horrific, of course the thing that taunted and played with us would torture us that night. Bang, bang, bang. The door slammed loudly, and for the first time, my fiancé was around to hear it. She went to answer it, but I'd peeked out from our bedroom window that looked out onto our tiny patio, which was more of just a railing and single step to the door. And instead of trick-or-treaters, I saw a coyote staring daggers at the door, its fur standing on end. It looked like it was growling, but was completely silent. The thing looked messed up, like it had survived a hundred fights. Scars ran along its side and it was missing its ears. I screamed for my fiancé to check the peephole before opening the door. Why? It's just trick-or-treaters, she yelled back. Yeah, but there's been two forceful entries in the complex the last two days. Just keep an eye out is all. I lied through my teeth. I hated lying to her. In general, I hate lying. But to lie to my fiancé felt wrong. Oh god. Yeah, I'll check the people. I didn't know about that. She shouted back. Many more times that night, the door would slam. Luckily, the front door was the only thing about that apartment that was built well. Our dog got a little sleep that night. She was barking and howling at the door. I would have worried about a noise complaint if every dog in the neighborhood wasn't also making just as much noise. Then the weirdest thing happened. We heard slamming on the front door of the apartment on the other end of our row. Then door by door, the slamming continued until it reached our door. Whatever or whoever it was began pounding on the door and jiggling the doorknob. Angry yelling of, This is the police. Open up. Could be heard outside. But looking outside through the peephole was only that deer I'd seen months ago. My fiancé begged me to open the door, believing it really was the police. She refused to hear my reasoning, telling me that it had to be the cops. The door started to be banged into harder, and when I looked out the peephole, the deer was gone. I pressed myself against the door, the commands from the so-called police continued, 
as I demanded my fiancé call the actual police and tell them an impersonator was trying to break in. The lines were busy, though. I cried out in pain as the door slammed me around wildly, and then everything went silent for a few minutes, followed by the most horrific noise I've ever heard. It sounded like a dozen women were standing in the park and screaming at the top of their lungs. I tried dialing the police again, and I could not get through, so I began to look for my fiancé's phone. When I looked in our bedroom, I saw her holding her nose, which was now gushing blood. She was prone to nosebleeds, but this was an insane amount. I rushed into the bathroom and grabbed a hand towel and held it to her nose as she began to cry. Our dog, meanwhile, lay next to us, growling at the windows, but never leaving our side. Eventually, the screaming stopped, and we were able to report what happened to the police. It turned out a lot of other people in our complex had already called, but they agreed to stop by and take our statement too, on the events of that night. After that night, the window tapping and door knocking would happen around my fiancé too, instead of only when I was alone. It was creepy, sure, but besides that, we didn't worry much about it, and thought the worst was over. But we were at each other's throats constantly. For little mistakes and mess-ups, we'd blame each other and get into screaming matches regularly. It led us to seriously considering breaking up at one point. Luckily, we worked through it, but neither of us ever felt like ourselves during these fights. We'd cross lines and insult each other over things like weight gain or worsening grades, things we never did before that or since then. November came and went with minimal incidents, and before we knew it, we were packing our bags, getting ready to head out to our hometown for winter break. Before we were able to leave, though, the blanket fell off the wall. This not only led to me having more sleepless nights again, but my fiancé began to think she was going crazy when she'd see movement out there at night. I lied, though. She'd say she saw something outside the window, and I'd tell her it was a car or someone out for a night walk. I don't know why I did this, but I did. Both of us could not wait to get out of that place for a few weeks to just relax for a bit, especially with how much we struggled with that first semester of college. However, our winter break would destroy me. Somehow I'd caught pneumonia right before we were leaving, maybe a day or two before. I'm not sure if it was from exposure to the cold weather or if that creature had caused it. Worse was, while we stayed in our hometown, my pet hedgehog died of mites. He had them from his prior owner and struggled with them frequently. I cried for days, and I didn't want to do anything after he passed away. And arguably, the worst of all was when I had to be rushed to the ER because of the amount of fluid in my lungs. I'd woke up choking, unable to scream. I punched the doors and walls of my parents' house in the hopes of waking everyone up. It worked but by the time they found me, my lips were blue and my vision was hazy. I'd almost died. It scared the heck out of me and worse, my family worried about me. They watched helplessly as I almost died in front of them. I still feel guilty over it, putting them through that. Despite my now horrible health and the death of one of my favorite pets, we had to go back to school. So we drove back and straight into the belly of the beast. Our drive back was scenic snow falling all around us as we blasted show tunes and Christmas carols in the car. When we made it back, our dog was the first out and waited by the front door. We had a week before school started and were excited to have some alone time again after being surrounded by family the last few weeks. I rehung the blanket over the window and started to unpack my school things when we got weather warnings on our phone. A freak snowstorm was on its way, but it was supposed to miss us we were only supposed to get the smallest bit of snow out of it. That day, we ran around the park throwing snowballs at each other and chasing the dog around. The three of us were happy, but I couldn't be out in the snow too long, not with how sick I was. We went back inside, and sadly, that was the last time we'd get to enjoy the snow that week. We awoke the next morning to a sheet of white outside our windows, and when opening our front door to walk Rosebud... We were met with white everywhere. We could only see a few feet in front of us. Rosebud wouldn't walk very far in it, just enough to do her business, 
Then she'd run back, nearly pulling us over, as she tugged with all her might at her leash. That first day, the knocking began. We immediately ignored it. We had discussed back in our hometown that I thought it was a skinwalker or wendigo. My fiancé thought the house was just haunted, possibly by a demon, but still just haunted. Neither of us would give the door knocking and window tapping any attention unless it somehow surprised us. That didn't stop it from freaking us out, when it would happen for hours on end. But we knew not to open the door. We knew that no one would be out there knocking on our door in the middle of a freaking blizzard. The second day was worse, however, a trend that didn't slow during the blizzard. The blanket was on the floor when we woke up, the snow spinning past the window visible despite the blinds being pulled down. Our dog was barking at the door, a quiet tapping sound all around us. It faded, but throughout the day, we'd hear taps followed by, Hello? And, Who's there? For the whole day. It drove Rosebud mad. The two of us had to calm her down. This continued into the next day, but now there were voices from the apartment above us. The person who had lived there moved out over winter. At least we thought so. Thinking about it now, we never saw that person again, so I can't say whether they moved out or simply went insane. But from my experiences, I firmly think that whatever was in that apartment now wasn't either of the people living there before. The voices from above continued into the next day, sounding more and more clear and loud as the days went by, from just saying regular phrases to sounding like my fiancé and myself. Many times during the blizzard, we'd respond to things it said, only for us to find out the other had said nothing. The following day, screams could be heard from the apartment above us, more animalistic than human. We dialed 911 and informed them of a possible domestic dispute, and we were told they'd try to make it up there, but because of the snow, they couldn't guarantee a speedy response this time. They ended up stopping by next day, only to inform us the apartment was a mess and seemingly abandoned. However, when they checked with the front office, the rent was still being paid on time, so they figured someone must have broken in to take shelter from the storm. The sounds grew louder, and the taps became more forceful for the rest of the week. That Sunday, Ann and I were nervous about how we'd make it to school. The administration office sent out an email that despite the blizzard still raging, we were expected to go to class. We fought multiple times that day about what we should do, However, before the end of the day, the problem would solve itself, as all our teachers informed us to not show up to class, as they weren't going to show up either. The college was furious about this, but since the majority of teachers were practically on strike, school was postponed until the blizzard died down. We soon realized, however, that we needed more food, toilet paper, and clean clothes. The storm was predicted to last another week, and our supplies was dangerously low. Our dirty clothes had piled up out of the basket and onto the floor. We had ramen left to eat, and we were down to a single toilet paper roll, when we decided we had to find a way to the store. On the bright side, however, we had an entire extra bag of dog food, so we didn't have to worry too much about Rosebud. Other than her doggy PJs she wore to keep warm were starting to smell a bit bad, but we had much more pressing issues to concern ourselves with. I bundled up and walked into the white void. My ears turned red instantly, and my nose began to run. We parked in the same spot every day if we could, but neither of us could remember after a week of being stuck indoors if we had this time. The snow crunched beneath my feet as I fell flat on my butt. I slowly stood myself back up and looked behind me to make sure the door to our apartment had been closed. Seeing that it was, I took a deep breath and turned back towards where I hoped the car was. I inched towards the edge of the street, readying myself for the steep step down onto the street. I pressed my car fob button in my jacket pocket with one hand and tried my best to cover my eyes from the snow with my other. A yellow glow shone out in the swirling white around me. The headlights. I walked in the direction of the car with my hand outstretched. I pressed against what I thought was the car when I heard my fiancé yelling that our dog had gotten out when I left. I spun around and screamed our dog's name in a panic. She was nearly all white 
and just about impossible to see in the snow. My fiancé yelled for me again. I saw her go into the park. Okay, I'll go find her. Throw on a jacket before following me, I replied. Crunch by crunch and step by step, I walked past my car into the park, calling for my dog Rosebud. The cold air found its way inside my throat, and all the warmth from my home had already left me. Rosebud! I yelled into the flurry around me. I whistled and called into the park, my throat growing hoarse quickly, with my lungs already working overtime as is. Rosebud! I screamed at the top of my lungs, the ending of which tore my throat up something fierce. Another shout sounded from my apartment door. I'll be right there. Do you see her? My fiancé yelled over the wind. No sign of her, I responded hoarsely. The wind picked up as I walked towards where I heard my fiancé's voice. The crunching of the snow was barely audible. I found myself back in the street without any sign of my fiancé. I must have passed her, I thought. I yelled out her name the best I could, followed by an intense coughing fit. She responded behind me back in the park. Wait there, I'll meet you, I called out. No, we have to find Rosebud. Just hurry up. She snapped uncharacteristically at me. But I understood. We called Rosebud our child and pampered her the best we could, with a college budget, of course, especially after our hedgehog died. I ran after her, coughing as I went, sucking in snow and freezing air as I did. I fell over in a heap in the snow and slipped, attempting to get back up. Something ran across my back, knocking the wind out of me. She's over here. <coughs> Rosebud, come here, girl. I shouted joyfully. Oh, I got her. Bo, come here and take her leash. She's freaking out. I heard my fiancé yell deeper in the park. I walked towards her voice, reaching for a hand holding a leash that I couldn't see. Where are you? Over here, lovey. She yelled back in response. I followed in a new direction, taken aback as to why she had called me over if she was just going to take her back home. Just <laughs> walk her to me. I called back. Okay, Anne responded. A shadow approached in the snow, but I didn't hear any crunching of her feet or jangling of the leash. But I had been out there for a bit. I might have just been dehydrated or tired and was just imagining things. The snow picked up and the figure vanished into it when suddenly I felt a sharp pain in my side. I screamed in pain louder than I knew I could, louder than when I was calling for Rosebud or my fiancé. I fell in pain as a coughing fit took over after the scream. The sound of snow underfoot approached me quickly. I panicked and I began to crawl. I didn't know which way I was facing, but anywhere was better than where it thought I was. Arms wrapped around me and I tried to scream again. My voice caught in my throat and I began to cough again, a copper taste filling my mouth. Are you okay? What happened, lovey? My fiancé asked as she helped me to my feet. I could only hack up my lungs in reply as she brought me back inside. It turned out Rosebud never did escape the apartment, and my fiancé had never been out there helping me look. She had heard me scream around the time she thought I would have been back, she undressed me and drew me a hot bath and turned the heater up more than before. Bills be darned. On the side I felt pain were two deep gashes. I cleaned them in the tub as she searched for warm clean clothes for me to wear. She had saved my life that day, finding me out there and taking care of me after. I had somehow been out there for nearly half an hour, screaming my lungs out, wandering aimlessly in our park. Ironically enough, if whatever or whoever hadn't attacked me, I might have died out there. The rest of the week was a blur for me. I had become more ill than before, and we were waiting on the snowstorm to die down before taking me to the emergency room. Anne made a surprisingly amazing nurse for a music major, and Rosebud made for great company, 
when Anne faced the storm alone and came back with food and toiletries in tow. Nothing odd happened to her on the way, other than discovering that the road to the hospital was out. We weren't going to call anyway. An ambulance or two had already crashed when going to the university to pump kids' stomachs who drank too much while being cooped up for too long. But now we were for sure going to just wait it out. With two of our three problems sorted, all we needed now were clean clothes. But with the laundromat's pipes bursting and the entrance practically being snowed in, we decided to wash our clothes in the tub and let them air dry. Somehow we survived, and a certain gift was proof of what we first thought were shared delusions. There were bare human footprints and coyote footprints by our window. This terrifying discovery would be repeated every snowfall after that, but to my knowledge, that was the worst of it while we lived in Flagstaff. Our friends would occasionally tell us that they heard tapping on the window when they were over for Dungeons and Dragons, or that odd noises would come from the apartment above, or the downright freaky night I had to drive Van to the hospital, only for the same five deer to follow us all the way there and back to our apartment. The way they watched us drive and turned their heads felt wrong, yet despite being freaked out, no harm came out of it. Nothing else traumatic happened in Flagstaff, other than being financially unable to continue going to school there. Odd glimpses of someone watching us from our upstairs neighbors were the worst after that. The only night that stood out while we still lived there was the night of my birthday when my fiancé and I heard a clear as day, Happy birthday, come from outside our window that night. I wish I could say that was the end, but whatever it was followed us as we moved back to our hometown. It all started back up again on the night when a blinding bright light shone into our bedroom at my dad's place. The world went silent as it washed away the darkness, and as quickly as it came, it went. The sounds of the world came back, but it wasn't like a predator had shown up. No, it was just that everything went silent. My fiancé and I had looked at each other and spoken to one another, but neither of us was able to even hear our own words. And after that night, the tapping and knocking began again. Rosebud had stopped barking at it. I think she must have gotten used to it, but my dad's dogs were driven insane by it, barking at all hours of the night. The last major incident to happen for over a year was one of the worst. My fiancé and I were packing up, getting ready to move across the country to live with my family in the south. We were watching a show on Netflix. It was a stormy night, but clear as day against the sound of the wind howling and the house rattling were footsteps in the gravel. Anne checked the window to see if my dad was home, but only our car set out front. Then I heard someone walking up the wood steps to the front door. I raced to the door and saw it as it began to open. I pushed against it as whatever was outside pushed back. It nearly flung open. My fiancé ran into our room to get our baseball bat while Rosebud growled and barked at the would-be intruder. From the other side, I heard my dad demanding to be let in, stating that I had invited him over. But none of this made sense as we were living with him. He was supposed to be out with his girlfriend that night anyway. I dug my heels in and pushed with all my might, then turned the lock once I heard the door slam back into its frame. Anne made it back into the room, and we all heard it run towards the window of my dad's room. It began to bang on it. We called the cops at that point, and hid in the dining room. When they arrived, the officer talked down to us about not calling the cops over wind. We explained it wasn't wind, that whoever it was had been talking, and we heard footsteps. But the officer was having none of it, telling us not to call again from this address, Luckily, that was the last time we'd have to call the cops. I want to say once we moved in with my mom in Alabama that things were great, but they honestly weren't. My stepfather ended up becoming extremely abusive towards all of us, and after a year of torture, we moved back to our hometown with our tails between our legs. It was in the return trip nearly a year later 
that the last major event with this thing took place. Of all of them, this one is the one that stuck with me the most. As we were making our way back to Arizona, through New Mexico, we had decided to drive through the mountains to cut the trip down by a day. Of course, as our luck would have it, we were caught in a freak snowstorm. Anne was driving at the time, and I ended up having to navigate how the road turned by GPS as we were driving completely blind by a certain point. Rosebud was whimpering by my feet, and my fiancé and I had to work together to avoid possible cars coming from the other direction. But it was in that snowstorm on the side of the road that I saw a white figure following us through the whole storm. It watched and waved at me as I occasionally looked out into the mesmerizing swirls of snow. This idea terrified me that if our car broke down, that we'd be greeted by this thing that had waited for us to return waiting for another chance to attack. When we reached the end of the storm, I took a final last look at it, staring down our moving truck. I have seen it since, and I've heard tapping on the window from time to time, and while I feel it may not be over yet, it hasn't tried anything for a long time. I want to say as I'm typing this out, I can hear tapping on my window and whispers in my fiancé's voice, but truthfully I don't. Besides the occasional creak in my attic and thud from my shed, not much happens anymore. I think the most was my parents hearing something bang on the kitchen wall, but nothing ever came of it. I sometimes have nightmares about that snowstorm in the mountains, of that thing silently watching us. It's something I kept to myself until now, and hopefully writing this will help with the healing process and reoccurring nightmares. Ghoul Encounter in Transylvania from Alex S.Z. I was born and lived in Romania until my late 20s when I moved to Australia. When I was a kid, I used to spend a lot of weekends and school holidays at my grandparents' house in a little mountain village in Transylvania a few kilometers from Bran Castle, more widely known as Dracula's Castle. Sorry if it disappoints early in my story, but this is not vampire-related, as some would expect to hear from that part of the world. However, after listening to this account, you might ask yourself the same questions as I do. I am a city boy, but always loved the picturesque mountains that surround my grandparents' small village. During the summer, I would spend weeks there, riding my mountain bike on dirt roads, hiking to nearby tourist spots or reading whatever books I could get my hands on at the time. There was no internet there back in the day. No mobile phones, no GPS, or fancy technology of the sorts. A completely different era. The summer before starting high school, my best friend and I were both 14, and we went to my grandparents to spend a couple of weeks bike riding, hiking, making the most out of the late summer weather. Two foolishly daring kids oblivious to taking risks, especially when we were doing stuff together. After about a week of riding the trails in and around the village, we decided to ramp it up a notch and go for a longer ride halfway to the nearby mountain peak, where we knew about a little tourist spot. There was a lookout there, a small cafe souvenir shop, and a car park where vendors would gather around tourist buses to sell trinkets and fresh forest fruit. We were kinda hoping to meet and befriend some cute girls our age, as such creatures were scarce in this village. With the plan ready, we got up early that morning, packing some spare clothes, snacks, and water, and deciding to follow a less circulated track, unmarked on our old tourist map. We hadn't been on that path before, but an old neighbor, who used to be a shepherd, said it was less steep than the marked tourist hiking trails, so it's easier to go uphill on a bike. Well, we assumed. Also, there were hardly any houses on the way, this was good news as the people in the village kept guard dogs, which often gave chase to us when riding past on our bikes. I kissed Grandma goodbye and told her we'd be gone for most of the day. It was pretty sunny outside, with only a few fluffy clouds, so we didn't mind the weather. For the first couple of hours, we kept going uphill at a steady pace. The village remained well behind as we were approaching a thick pine forest. The track became much more difficult than anticipated with lots of uneven loose rocks and overgrown vegetation. 
We didn't realize it was mainly used by sheep herds to go up the mountain in the spring and back in autumn, but the path was wide enough to ride side by side, so we kept going. After approximately two hours of riding with only short breaks for water, we came across a forest. Our path was going right through it, and we both felt a little bit nervous. Before venturing forward, we stopped to have a quick snack and rest a little. We'd left home early and made relatively good time to that point. We needed our energy back before the next uphill stage in our ride. It wasn't uncommon for hikers in that area to come face to face with brown bears, some of which were huge, almost as big as North American grizzlies. Attacks were few, but encountering a bear was honestly my biggest fear. Bears chasing me had been a recurring nightmare I've had growing up. I didn't want to look like a coward in front of my friend, however, so we got back on the bikes. As we were approaching the trees, we noticed a thin smoke rising over them. Hidden between the first row of trees, we noticed a small timber cabin, covered with weathered wood shingles. It looked very old, run down, and we would have presumed it to be deserted if not for the smoke coming out of the chimney. The windows were small, dirty, and cracked. Adjoining the cabin was a derelict-looking tin shed, barely standing, leaning over the side of the cabin. The courtyard surrounding them was muddy, with some rusty buckets scattered around. The thing I noticed and still remember quite vividly was a large, darkened wood chopping block near the shed, with rusty chains nailed to it. It wasn't something out of the ordinary in rural Romania, where people would often sacrifice animals for food, but I guess those chains just gave me the heebie-jeebies. I was riding in front and slowed down a bit to wait for my friend. I made a childish joke, something like, hurry up Theo or the bad witch will fly out of that chimney, grab the last rider and toss him into a stew. I said it loudly enough for him to hear. Two seconds later, the front door creaked open and a strange old man busted out, shouting at us with a guttural broken voice. We were startled, but slowed down a bit to say good day. As we were taught, it was always the polite thing to do in our village. The old man then grabbed a wooden stick from near the door and started waving it, walking wobbly towards us, while continuing to yell something that we couldn't understand. He looked menacing, however, and frankly quite disgusting, with oily hair and ripped clothes, large yellow teeth, bulging eyes, and the veins on his face visibly pumping. The man was short but stocky, and we weren't going to wait around for him to make sense. We got pedaling right away, continuing our way on the rocky path, deeper into the forest. We soon lost sight of the house and the old man as we went around a bend. Theo and I were trying to laugh and joke about this weird encounter, but truth is we were both shaken up and knackered at that point. As soon as we cleared the forest, we had to stop and have a rest drink water, and eat something. Our determination from early morning had completely washed off by that point. I felt pretty helpless and scared, realizing we underestimated our capacity to roam through the woods on our average quality mountain bikes. My legs were cramping up. Theo could barely breathe and was frustrated with his bike, which was having issues changing gears. Moreover, the front tire was slowly leaking air. This trip was not going very well, and we didn't find it enjoyable anymore, so we were weighing our options. Either we continue uphill for another couple of hours or so towards the tourist spot, and then return to the village on the regular hiking trail going downhill, or accept the defeat, abandon our goal, and go back the same way we came, back through the forest, past the creepy cabin, and follow the crappy path back home. The idea of giving up and going back did not sit well at all with our young male hormones, but there was one factor that got the city boys by surprise and ultimately made the decision for us. The weather. Although it was fine in the morning, by the time we cleared the forest and got to the western side of the mountain, thick gray clouds began to gather. As we finished our snacks, it started to drizzle. We could now see the top of the mountain covered in a dense fog which was slowly lowering towards us. So this was it. Without much enthusiasm, Theo and I made the rational decision to head back immediately, hoping to avoid a complete drenching on our way home. We put on our plastic raincoats. Theo pumped some air in his front tire, and we hopped back on the bikes, heading back into the forest, 
Five minutes into the ride, the drizzle turned into proper rain, making some portions of the track muddy and slippery. A thin fog slowly engulfed the woods. Visibility was still okay, but the scenery became very eerie and gray. Theo and I were both silent, trying to keep our focus on the track ahead. I remember feeling really anxious and suddenly overwhelmed by what I could only describe as desperation to get out of the forest immediately. I was too scared to pedal any faster, as the bike was already skidding down the muddy track. I still very well remember the silhouette of that cabin coming into view. Needless to say, I found it 100 times creepier, with the rainfall and grey mist surrounding it. Approaching the house, I was feeling my heart beating out of my chest, so I decided to counteract that by acting brave, rather being a jerk. I started ringing my bike bell, loudly shouting, Hey Pops, or Hey Creepo, along with some expletives a kid my age should not have used. Theo joined me with even more enthusiasm. These were some very poor decisions. As we were going past the house, I again noticed the chopping block. But now, it was all covered in blood, with a blood-soaked knife and axe on top of it. At the base were two buckets, one with a goat's head, tongue out, the other full of blood and entrails. There was something like steam rising from this second bucket. Presumably the kill was fresh and the organs still warm when tossed in there. I was still processing what I was seeing when suddenly we heard shouting. It sounded like the crazy old man again, but now we couldn't see him. I was disoriented and slowed down. I saw him walking backwards from behind his shed, shouting, his arms wide, like he was trying to block someone's way towards us. What happened next is a bit blurry, but I think I heard him say the words, No, no, let them pass. I'll give you meat. You have goat. He was perhaps 10 to 15 meters away when I saw him being pushed aside by someone else, a person who was coming directly for us. As the old man fell on his rear, he turned and screamed at us, Run! It was too late though. This other man was running towards us. He was short and stocky, somewhat similar in build as the old man, but completely without clothes. His skin was gray and very, very cracked. These deep cracks were all over his body, like he had some massive scabs or a thick layer of dry mud covering him. I only caught a glimpse of his face as he let out a scream that sounded more like a wheeze and ran towards me. The eyes were recessed deep into their sockets and seemed cloudy yellow. His lips were missing. I found this to be the most disturbing part. His ghoul-like face still haunts me. The area around his mouth looked like the skin had been peeled off, exposing massive-looking teeth and black gums. The man's face was gray, as was the rest of his body. The only other thing I can remember are some rare locks of long dark hair over his eyes and to one side. The best overall description I could give you about this encounter is imagine a guy with some flesh-eating bacteria disease around his mouth, who also fell in thick mud, which later on dried up and cracked, remaining attached to his body. Not quite a zombie like you see in the movies, but not too far off either. I'm calling this man-creature a ghoul. It seems the most appropriate term to my understanding. I felt my blood freeze, seeing this thing coming towards me. I vaguely remember trying to control my legs to pedal faster, but they were just frozen. I couldn't even feel them. My mouth became instantly dry. The wheezing noise coming from this creature was horrendous, and to this day when I hear someone wheezing, it scares me. Although still in motion on the bike, I felt like a sitting duck, waiting for this ghoul to take a few more steps in front of my bike and grab me. My luck was the creature suddenly noticed Theo coming from behind me, and this disoriented him for a couple of seconds, enough for us to squeeze past. That moment, I think my adrenaline started pumping. I regained control of my body 
and was able to ride the bike away from there as fast as I could without looking back. It was a very close call. We could still hear the old man shouting, fading back for another minute or two. I can't remember much else from our way home. We were both in pretty bad shape when my grandparents saw us. We told them the whole story, and they seemed to believe us. For the next few days, I was trying to extract more info from them and our neighbors about the old man and the ghoul we encountered. Everyone we brought this up to acted very evasive, saying the old man is weird and has a mental issue, and that it's best we don't go near him again, which we weren't going to anyway. Nobody said anything about the ghoul, other than perhaps another madman who likes to walk around without clothing. From my discussions with Theo, he told me he saw exposed bone in one of the legs of the ghoul, and he was ready to swear that to be true. Theo also mentioned bloodstains on his thighs. I don't know about either of those, as much as I tried to remember more details. However, before I wrap this up, here comes the creepy end. Our further digging, years later, indicates the old man was the son of a soldier who died in mysterious circumstances not long after World War II was over. This man was said to have been a truly deranged person, who allegedly worked as an extermination camp guard during the war, while Romania was one of Germany's allies, though in 1944 they switched sides. He is said to have been cursed by a gypsy woman, perhaps a witch, who was imprisoned and later died in his camp. Upon his return from the war, the soldier fathered a son with a mentally disabled woman from the village. She was later on found dead in the woods, presumably killed and eaten by bears. The man was also on a downhill path, drinking lots and causing problems with the law. He hanged himself a few years after and was supposedly buried outside the church cemetery. Rumor has it a couple of grave robbers tried digging him out to steal valuables buried with the corpse, such as his gold teeth, but the wooden casket was empty. This is all hearsay, and record-keeping was never a strong point of post-war Romania, so I'm not too optimistic about finding more info about these people. I was told his cabin burned down, but honestly, I never went back there to check for myself. My theory is the World War II soldier was cursed, spiraled down to insanity, tried to off himself, but somehow remained alive or maybe undead, and his son, the old man, staged his burial and kept him out of sight for years after. What do you think, considering all the missing pieces of the puzzle? Late Night Park Visit from PX5389 I'll start off by saying I live in a suburban setting in a small town. Unlike me, my friend had lived in a more rural section of the county at the time. This incident took place near my house. My friend's name is Ryan. He and I have certainly witnessed a whole bunch of wild crap throughout our time of being friends and this experience was certainly memorable for its unnatural turnout. I met Ryan about a month before this occurrence happened. As funny as it sounds, we actually met through the twins we were dating. Who knew that our long-dead relationships with them sparked the friendship between two like-minded, adrenaline-junkie individuals that's lasted to this day? This happened back in the summer after freshman year of high school. As any other day of summer, we had made it our goal to make the most out of the time off from school. One late night during a summer sleepover, we figured, what better way to have a fun summer than to sneak out to the park at midnight? So that's exactly what we did. I live in a small neighborhood which connects to the village I live in. This park is in a relatively desolate area of the village, so there isn't much foot traffic going through that area, especially at night. Something about sneaking out just made each of us really excited, and we could hardly contain ourselves. We figured we'd have the opportunity to mess with a couple having fun in their car, or better yet, find some shady people to stalk 
just for the heck of it. Don't ask me why we thought this was a good idea. The only reason I have is moronic teenager behavior. I know at least one of you felt the same way we did at one point in your lives. Looking back, it was dumb. But then again, if we didn't do something stupid like this, we would have no good stories to share. Anyway, we were hanging in my basement. My parents had recently had it finished and one of the safety requirements was an escape latch. To us, that escape latch was our way of getting out and not being caught. It worked perfectly, and I have resorted to using it ever since when needed. Before we left, I made sure we brought a basketball along, because I knew that during the summer the park hosted a camp, and they put up a basketball hoop for campers to use. As we climbed out of my basement, we were exposed to the hot night air. One problem we had were the mosquitoes. The dang suckers were everywhere we walked. As we walked onto the sidewalk, we started to have a conversation along the lines of, <laughs> wait until the twins hear what we did tonight. At the time, we thought we were savages, but now I realize we were just impulsive teenagers that were way over their heads. Before I continue, it's crucial that I give you a good idea of how the park looks. There's a traditionally paved road that leads to the parking lot, all the way on the other side of the park. We, however, had come through the neighborhood, which has a rough dirt path that we would usually bike on during the day. As we walked across this dirt path, there were baseball fields on either sides of us, with their dugouts empty. We continued to walk, wary of our surroundings, until we made our way to the dimly lit pavilion. Next to the pavilion was one area with playground equipment. This was often referred to as the little kids area. The parking lot connected to the pavilion and this playground. About a quarter mile down the parking lot was the big kids area, with more complex equipment. This area was located much closer to the entrance of the park. The big kids area connected to the parking lot and a gigantic soccer field, which stretched all the way to where the pavilion was located. Seeing this field in its uninhabited state put both of us in a feeling of unease. We made jokes about something possibly being out there watching us from the field. Obviously, they were just jokes, though. We had actually not seen anything. But saying we did scared the heck out of each of us, nonetheless. For now, we were just sitting in the pavilion, listening to music and talking about future plans with our girls. Those were certainly some nostalgic times. I couldn't help but look back towards the field every so often, just out of paranoia that someone or something might be out there. Nothing ever showed. After about an hour of just chilling, we figured we would make our way down to the basketball court. To be as descriptive as possible, we made our way across the main parking lot area down to where the big kid area of the park was. Instead of going straight, which would lead to the exit of the park, we made a ride to the parking lot which exposed a whole other area of unused parking spaces. This extended about a half mile down. All the way at the bottom of the parking lot was the basketball hoop, along with dense forest which surrounds the area of the sector of the parking lot. Now before we made our way completely down, I stopped and I told my friend to stand still. A faint car outline was visible in the furthest corner of the area. This instantly caused us to become suspicious. The car was black, which only made it blend in more with the night. What made us more curious was the fact that the outline was not that of a police car. Instead of turning back like normal people, we continued on our merry way right down to the basketball hoop. I guess we were just testing this person to see what they would do. There's that typical untouchable macho kid stereotype again. Their car was completely off, and had been for the past hour, which we assumed because no one had driven into the park while we were there. At first, I figured they must be lovers, but no. There was no one in the passenger seat, and the only light illuminating from within the car now seemed to be that of a phone screen. 
This hoop was a few yards away from the car, which we thought was a safe distance away. We decided if anything went south, we would book it back to the pavilion by cutting through the field, which we really didn't want to do, but if it came down to it, we'd have to. We started to play some basketball for a few minutes, but as time went by, we only became more unsettled. The fact that this person was sitting in their car unbothered by us made us each on edge. Instead of shooting around, we had begun to occasionally dribble the ball, while just staring at the car in our peripheral vision. During an interval of my friend dribbling the ball, I could swear I heard the evermost slight crack of the car driver's side door opening. I told my friend to quit it, and we each stared at the car waiting for something to happen. We were silent. A few moments passed and at this point nothing happened. Now sort of teed off that this guy was ruining our time, I yelled some profanities his way and foolishly threatened to call the police, which I was quite sure he heard. Right after I finished, the car engine came to life and the car began to violently back out of the spot it was parked in. It was truly disturbing how a night so silent had turned into an episode of screeching tires and burning rubber. As soon as this guy began to back out, that's when me and my friend booked it. We ran up the little hill that led to the field and hopped the fence. Screw whatever imaginary cryptid could be stalking us in the field. Right now the main priority was to get away from this lunatic in their car. As we made our way through the field, we saw the car driving full speed right out of the parking lot and out of the park. We were left in the confusion not even knowing what to think. So many questions had been running through my mind. Had that guy just tried to run us over? Why had he been in such a hurry to leave? What if we hadn't run to the soccer field in time? What if I hadn't noticed him open the door ever so slightly? All these questions have remained unanswered to this day. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. This wasn't even the most freakish part of the night. That is yet to come. As we had made our way back to the pavilion, we sat down on one of the benches and sat in complete silence for a few minutes, contemplating what just happened. After just sitting there for a few minutes, we started to just talk again, watching the entrance to the park, just in case anyone drove in. We sat there for a decent amount of time until Ryan suddenly whispered to me, Dude, check it. Is that someone on the swings? My stomach sank. On the other side of the park where the big kid area was, we saw a dark figure. We watched closely as the silhouette went up and down. We fell silent, studying what was right in front of us. What really spooked me was the distant yet familiar sound of that rusty chain swinging slowly back and forth. I got goosebumps as I picked up on the sound. How could someone have gotten there without us noticing, especially if they had not come through the neighborhood entrance or road entrance? This wasn't one of those cliches where, as soon as you notice the thing, it stops doing whatever it's doing and looks you dead in the eye and comes towards you. No. Instead, my friend decided to yell out to them. That's right. He literally said, Hey, you want to play some basketball? Whoever we were looking at stopped swinging and looked in our general direction. I was on the verge of punching Ryan so hard in the mouth for what he just said. I told him, Dude, what the heck? What if he runs towards us? He simply replied, Don't worry, bro. He's outnumbered, and we have pocket knives. As I recall that line now, I cringe so hard, fully understanding what clowns we were. It's honestly comical to a certain degree when you take out the potentially life-threatening dude that was only a sprinting distance away from us. But no, that figure didn't advance towards us. They didn't make a sound. All they did was get up off the swing and head into the small bathroom facility that was located right next to the park area. They were hooded, and we only saw the back of them as they went in. Judging by stature... This person looked tall and lanky. Me and my friend were officially freaked out, but we stood there in anticipation for a few minutes just waiting. 
Ten minutes passed, and we had been staring right at the door the person had entered waiting for the door to open again. A few minutes after that, the door swung open. The same individual came out, but they faced us this time. We were able to distinguish their face. Their eyes were enormous and their hair was a wild mess across their face and beneath their hood. At first, I was confused and thought we were looking at a complete freak. I was so disturbed. I looked down at the mouth and it was twisted in this horrific, static grimace. That's when I realized it must have been a mask. Thinking about it now, it reminded me very much of that Momo character that was hyped up a few years back. They gave a quick wave in our direction and motioned us to follow. It was a quick glance I got because as soon as this person came out of the bathroom, they swung to their side and walked towards the end of the parking lot, where the basketball hoop was. To give a better image of this parking lot, it was forked into two areas. If you were coming from the park road entrance, you could either go straight towards the pavilion or take a left and go down into the bigger parking lot which extended to where the basketball hoop was, closely followed by the tree line. My friend and I stood and watched as this figure continued their way, not looking back at us. We weren't sure of what to do. We just sat there, stunned. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the figure had broken into a full-on sprint heading right into the woods. That's when we noticed the headlight beams appearing at the entrance of the park. We saw the grill and realized it was a police officer. He continued driving towards us. As opposed to most people, we were actually relieved to see him come our way. He got out of his car and in a stern voice asked us what we were doing out at this hour. We replied, just hanging out. The officer told us it would be best if we went home, that if he catches us here again at this time, he would escort us home himself. He was stern yet considerate and we appreciated that. After he said this, I asked if he had seen that person running into the woods on his way into the park. He replied no, and asked us if we were under the influence, clearly skeptical. We quickly said no and asked if there were any security cameras in the park. He said yeah, that's how I knew you were here. Then it hit me there were other security cameras that had been scattered throughout the park. I asked if any of them were recording, to which he responded, only one that's working right now is the one located in the pavilion. This disappointed us greatly, and left us with a feeling of dread. He asked us a few more questions, then sent us on our way, making sure we left the park. Once we'd gotten back to my house, we had snuck back in through the basement escape hatch. We discussed what happened, both of us shaken. The following day, we walked back to the park at noon, when there were other people around. We went over to the bathroom that had been used by that person the other night. Nothing seemed wrong, but on our way out, Ryan caught a glimpse of the garbage can and said, Hold up. Curious, I turned around and we both looked. In the garbage was that mask the person had used, or at least what used to be the mask. It appeared to have been cut up and ripped apart with something. After that, we left in a hurry. Ever since that day, we haven't really went to the park, period. It just sketched us out too much and we didn't want anything to do with it. Sure, it's a crazy memory to share, but honestly, retelling the story in its entirety has given me goosebumps and a feeling of anxiety, traveling back in my mind to the night this happened, knowing how dangerous it could have been. Your typical questions had swarmed into my mind after the whole ordeal. Was the car in the parking lot earlier connected to the person? Why was that person alone on the playground at that time? Most bizarre of all, why did he wear a mask? Most chilling of all, had that person been watching us the whole time we were there? These questions remain unanswered, and I still obsess over them to this day occasionally. Living in a small town like ours, this certainly wasn't ordinary. Our town in general is safe, and nothing majorly bad has happened in the years I've lived here. Maybe it was some sort of weird prank, but that couldn't explain it considering the fact that these people had no idea we were coming. If anyone has suggestions, I'd love your input. This has honestly stumped me. 
It would probably ease the intense curiosity I found myself in after remembering this incident once again. Even though this was seriously messed up, it hasn't been the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, but it certainly was eerie and unexplainable. Nowadays, I make an effort to steer clear of any obvious possible trouble. Being young at the time, I was daring, and I guess that's what led to my naive personality. Things aren't what they seem at the Grand Canyon. From Tony03 A long time ago, when I was a kid, my grandpa used to take me out to hike on the trails at the Grand Canyon from time to time. He had married my grandma there, and he'd always found the setting fascinating and peaceful. Grandpa had always been a quiet, thinking man, and he did his utmost best to teach me things. The man fervently believed that level-headedness was the most important in any situation, and having both knowledge and wisdom together should be the goal of any good man. I respected him from the start, and went with him on any adventure I could. Hunting, fishing, climbing, all things my grandpa taught me. By the time I was 15, I was so sure that I understood that man. Then that understanding vanished within a single night. We were closing in on a night hike, nearly three quarters of the way back to Grandpa's old pickup truck. Instead of finishing out the trail, he glanced at me and nodded his head toward the right, as he veered in that direction over a steep hill and directly through sparse patches of sagebrush. I followed without a word. Sure, I was curious, but I was dog-tired that evening, and almost certain he just wanted to show me a plant I hadn't seen before. Before long, he sat at the crest of the hill and sat down in the dirt. I planted myself right next to him. He shushed me, though I hadn't said a word yet, then pointed down towards the shallow valley in the distance. There was a faint path there, and not much else. But my grandpa wouldn't just point for no reason. I glanced at him. He looked at me, then leaned in close, so I had a better look at where his finger was pointing. His arm, my compass, I soon located it. It looked like a black twig in the canvas that was this twilight scene. It appeared to be a person in the distance, the silhouette of one at least. Instinctively, I asked aloud, who is that? A sharper shush from Grandpa reminded me that for some yet unspoken reason, we should not be talking right now. He only wanted me to watch. We must have sat there for an hour. My back was aching, and it was beginning to get chilly. I wanted to go home, but I knew better than to complain. After drawing my name in cursive in the dirt for the dozenth time, I looked up and I saw that the figure had disappeared. There wasn't a place to hide in the distance anywhere. Where would that silhouette of a person have gone? I thought I'd see it again. Grandpa's voice, after such a long silence, made me jump. After composing myself and wiping the dirt from my finger, I noticed he was frowning. Wish I hadn't brought you tonight, but now you know it's there. Hesitant to speak, I forced out a question. What was it, Papa? Uh, don't know, he sighed. The aging man wiped a stream of sweat from his forehead. It was too cold for sweat at this point. His hand quivered every inch of the way. My father showed it to me when I was little. He wasn't sure what it was either, but once it found us, he had no choice. Just looked like a man to me. Probably another hiker. My eyebrow raised. I'd never seen him so on edge over something so benign. Wish that was the case. Listen here. And listen close, son. 
he picked himself up off the ground and stretched his wary form. You'll see that figure on these hiking trails again. And when you do, you sit there in the dirt and you watch it. You watch it till it turns its back and walks away. And don't you look away until he's not there anymore. And come alone if you can. I smiled awkwardly, thinking he was telling me a weird joke of some sort, but the man's face was stern and cold. He was nothing but serious. Yes, sir, I replied. I watched a tear fall from his cheek. Suddenly, the old man stepped forward and hugged me tighter than he ever had. You're growing into a good man. Don't you ever let this horror of a world change that. Okay, Papa, I managed to say, choking back tears. I didn't really even know why I was crying. He cleared his throat as he pulled away, then nodded, just as he had before, letting me know we were headed back to the truck. The last thing I remember of that night was stepping out of the truck when he brought me home. He said something to me just after saying goodnight. I... I'm sorry I fell asleep back there. What? I hadn't even noticed he'd fallen asleep. I mean, I was so bored I'd perfected my name in cursive. Some poor hiker is going to find my dirt scrawlings, I thought, and wonder what kind of narcissist child lurked those trails. It's okay. I'm pretty tired myself. Have a good night, Papa. He smiled, nodded one more time, then drove away. Grandpa didn't wake up that morning. Doctors said his heart just stopped. Then and only then did I finally understand real heartbreak. He had been my only true friend, and with him gone I felt truly alone in the world. Mom and Dad were quick to remind me Grandpa had been in his 60s, that for their family, that was a full life. Men in our family are lucky to make it to their late 60s like Grandpa had. They explained to me that he was in a better place, but selfishly I didn't want Grandpa in a better place, I wanted him here. Here he could take me fishing again, he could laugh like he did whenever I asked him to bait my hooks for me, because the worms grossed me out. He could smile like he used to when Grandma was around to share an iced tea with him on the front porch. It's a dire realization for a person when you finally realize that everyone is destined to see their loved ones die. For a while, I was so upset that everything that reminded me of Grandpa, I avoided. After that, these things felt negative to me. So for years, I didn't rock climb, I didn't fish, I didn't hike, I didn't even drink iced tea anymore. In my mid-twenties, my mood began to change. Having met a girl, getting married, and having a child of my own on the way, I realized banishing myself from the things I loved most was the worst way to respect my grandpa's legacy and memory. These were things I wanted to share with my own kid. I manned up and planned a hiking trip with my wife, Vanessa. She wasn't too far in her pregnancy, where she shouldn't be moving around too much, but I would still need to do all the heavy lifting. Not a problem. Our trip to that very same hiking trail at the Grand Canyon I'd last been on with Grandpa was a pleasant one. The skies were clear, it wasn't terribly hot, and the trails were almost vacant. We planned to camp for the night at the peak of the trail, then circle back to the car in the morning. One night would be easy for both of us, I thought. The day passed by too quickly. My wife enjoyed the pleasant warmth and absolutely loved how much I recalled my grandpa teaching me, like the different names of various plants and animals we saw. But really, I think she was just happy seeing me so happy. At the thought of all the years spent away from this place, 
My throat became tight. I was happy, but I felt full of regret for staying gone for so long. We soon made it to the planned camping spot off the center of the trail. I prepared the tent, started a small fire, and prepared some camping MREs I'd bought at a Dick's Sporting Goods. I thought they looked tasty from the packaging, but in this case, you might actually want to judge a book by its cover. My wife nearly vomited from the meal, maybe partly due to the pregnancy, being sensitive to certain tastes and smells and all that. But my feelings were similar. After a bite of my turkey chili in a pouch, I spat it in the dirt and placed the remainder in the trash bag, double-bagged it, and placed it tightly in my hiking bag. Instead, we ended up filling up on marshmallows. After that, we lay in the tent together, joking about terrible baby names, before she fell asleep. Not long after, I drifted off as well. Hey, there's someone watching us. My wife's voice, curious and soft, woke me. What? Uh, the sun's not even completely up yet. I grumbled. I said there's someone out there just watching us. He's just standing there like half a mile away from us. I was just about to place a pillow over my head to blot out the first ribbons of soft morning light when my eyelids shot wide open. Suddenly, I felt breathless. My heart seemed to be doing flips in my chest. I pushed myself off of my sleeping bag and I ran outside in nothing but boxer shorts. I found my wife standing, facing the sunrise, protecting her eyes with a hand on her forehead. When she heard me, she glanced at me for a moment and pointed. Look, over there. My stomach turned at the familiarity of the situation. I stepped over next to her and followed her finger, her arm a dreadful compass guiding me to something I refused to believe. There, on a distant, seldom trodden path, stood a figure like a dark twig sprouting from the horizon exactly as I'd seen it all those years ago. Who do you think it is? She asked. Shh. Sweat drenched from my still cold forehead. As if on autopilot, I sat on the ground and stared at him. He didn't move. What are you, hun? Sit and hush. I demanded impatiently doing my best to not sound too disrespectful to my wife, who already appeared so confused. Can you blame her? Playing along, she whispered. What's going on? Who is that? I was horrified at the thought of saying too much. After all, I never did understand why Grandpa had wanted me to be so silent in front of this figure. So quickly, I thought of an answer that was short and to the point. One of the last things my grandpa ever saw. Somehow it worked. Vanessa remained silent, waiting there on the ground with me. I could tell she was calm and patient, but my insides felt like soup. With absolutely no idea as to why, I knew I had to listen to my grandpa's warnings. I sat there for two hours, staring at the figure, watching him, waiting for him until finally he turned and began to walk away. I started to get up, but caught myself. I didn't take my eye off the figure until it faded right out of existence. It was as if it had never been there. I turned toward my wife. She was slumped over a bit, having fallen asleep at some point. Guess she was still tired too. As my heart slowed, I began to make sense of it all as best I could. I'm sorry I fell asleep. My grandpa had said to me, the last thing he ever said to me. It wasn't some random needless apology. He had been sincere about it. He apologized. But for what? Because he fell asleep and stopped watching the figure. 
all while I had played in the dirt, not paying attention at all. With no one watching this figure, it had disappeared. But to where? Somehow I think my grandpa knew. I wholeheartedly believe that same figure came for him in the night and stole his breath away. And since I'd seen it, even as a child, it had now appeared to me again, and now my pregnant wife had seen it. The hike back to the car was the fastest hike I'd ever done, and easily the most stressful one. My mind reeled with questions. Would it return at any moment? Would it come back at a later time somewhere at our own home? What is the figure? On the drive back, I told my wife everything. Most importantly, I explained, if you ever see that figure again, stare at it until it's gone and do not look away. You see, I think that's the rule. If you see it in the distance, drop everything and stare until it disappears. Because if it disappears while you're not looking, it will come for you. After all, my grandpa's father had also never awakened from his slumber. I should have listened to my grandpa. I never should have come back or I should have at least come alone. But I think both my grandpa and I didn't take this thing seriously until it was too late. I can't help but worry. This will now carry on to our child that my wife carries. The Cave in the Mountain from Skip McGrip the Third. Being the youngest of three to Mexican-American parents, I traveled to Mexico at least twice a year. A long four-week visit during the summers and one or more shorter vacations during the winter break or throughout the year. My folks both come from a small village in the Desert Valley in central Mexico. During my childhood and adolescence, the village or town, whatever you'd like to call it, had at maximum 300 residents. Everybody knew everybody. You get it. As a child going from the downtown of a major Texas city to the lawless deserts of Mexico was liberating in a way. I could do whatever I wanted at any time with little apparent consequence. I discovered a lot about myself and learned to respect life and nature while hunting and working in the hills of Mexico. A popular pastime for the folks of the town was to hike up the mountain that the town was at the foot of. Once at the top, which took a whole day to reach, you could enjoy a view of the entire town and the valley while the sun set. It was a truly enjoyable experience. One evening while at the top of the mountain, my good friend who lived in the village, who would spend every day with me while I visited, told me about a giant cave on the far side of the mountain. I've never been on that side of the mountain. There's a cave back there? I asked. I thought it was strange that, during all those years of visiting, nobody had ever mentioned a cave on the far side of the mountain I'd been on so many times. Let's go, he said not waiting for me to respond. He got up from the giant boulder we were sitting on and started up over the peak of the mount. I followed right behind him. He had gotten me into some trouble before, but I'd never really gotten hurt because of him, so why not, I thought. There are no trails or markers on the mountain, so finding the mouth of the cave was a little difficult for him. After a while of looking, we found it, though, it was indeed a giant hole carved down into the mountain, going down as far as I could see. The light from the setting sun didn't light up more than a few yards down, until it turned into pure darkness. We stood at the edge, peeking down into the depths of the cave. Almost instantly, my eyes and nose began to burn so intensely, like I'd never felt before. The smell of ammonia from the bats that lived in the cave hit me unexpectedly. Meanwhile, my bud was having himself a good laugh at the expense of my tear ducts and nose hairs. We stared down into the giant hole for a good minute, looking around at all the bats and rock formations. I pointed at some beams of wood, 
or really long tree trunks that were placed across the cave at varying depths. What are those for? I asked. Farmers hire people to climb down there and bag bat poop to use as fertilizer. They make a lot of money. Want to take some? He asked excitedly. I declined, not wanting to go into the cave at all. But as I already expected, my friend began to climb his way down. He made his way down to the first section of the cave that had sufficient level ground to stand on without the aid of the wooden beams. He yelled at me to follow him, and I don't quite remember how, but he convinced me to climb down into the cave. The beams were pretty far apart from each other, since they were placed by and intended for adults. I must have been around ten years old at the time. We both stood on the small section of level ground, trying not to breathe, as the smell was burning our lungs. Come on, he said. He then continued on to the next beam underneath us. I'm not going down there, man, I said back to him, nervously. He didn't stop, though. I know he heard me, and maybe he figured I would be right behind him, but he kept going until I couldn't see him through the darkness of the cave. I could hear him whistle at me from different positions inside the cave, and eventually I didn't hear him at all. He had either stopped whistling entirely, or he went so deep into the cave that I couldn't hear him anymore. He had mentioned that once it got to a certain depth, the floor evened out and you could easily walk deeper into the cave. Bats were starting to fly out in swarms. I knew they wouldn't purposefully hurt me, but they were very loud and distracting. I had to really focus hard on not losing my footing and falling into the cave. Once most of them passed, and I was sure I could be heard if I yelled into the cave, I called out to my bud. Hey, hey, hey uh, let's go let's before go it gets before dark. It gets I stood there waiting for a reply, but he never called back to me. I looked around debating whether I should stay put or climb out and wait for him outside the cave. I noticed a few empty rice bags, which I assumed were used for carrying the bat poop, tucked into the spaces between the rocks and the walls of the cave. I also noticed what looked to be clothes snagged on the edges of the rocks and the walls lower into the caves. Shoes were left on the small ledges that naturally occurred in the cave. Odd, I thought thinking some folks found it easier to climb while barefoot. Then I heard huffing coming from beneath me. It was the unmistakable sound of someone in a panic. I tried my hardest to see down into the dark, but at this point it was no use. My friend would frequently play tricks on me, so I hesitated to believe that he was actually in some kind of trouble, rushing up to the top of the cave. I could hear the distress in his voice, though, as he got closer. When he came into view, he had a look that I initially misunderstood as anger, as if he were unhappy that I hadn't followed him down. However, as he climbed higher up the wooden beams towards me, I saw the look of fear on his face. He didn't stop to let me up first. He passed me up in a hurry and was out of that cave before I even made a move. I looked down once more at the darkness beneath me and saw nothing, heard nothing. I focused on balancing on the logs and beams until I made it out of the cave. Once I was out, I looked around for my friend so we could leave, but I didn't see him anywhere near the mouth of the cave. I yelled out calling for him, getting ready to accept the fact that he had probably left me behind once again and was halfway down the mountain by then. I called him one more time, scanning around for him, and found him at the tree line sitting next to a big rock. Hey, man, let's go before it gets dark, I said as I walked toward him. I was so relieved I wouldn't have to find my way down the mountain on my own in the dark. He just sat there looking kind of confused. I was trying to figure out what he was thinking or why he was behaving so weird. He started breathing heavier and heavier with each breath, and anger began to settle into his face. I backed away, knowing what he was capable of doing in his rage. 
He was a good guy who wouldn't hurt me or anyone without being truly deserving of a beating. But while in a blind rage, he had once knocked his brother unconscious, who just happened to be in the line of fire. I wasn't in the mood to get floored. He got up from the dirt and walked toward the mouth of the cave, stopping to pick up a giant rock, a mini boulder, actually, really smashing his thumb in the process, which only fueled his anger more. With the rock in his arms, he walked to the opening, lifted it up, and sent it crashing down into the dark hole in the earth. The rock broke through some of the wooden beams on its way down and caused an enormous roar of echoes that filled the air around us. The sound didn't seem to stop, but when it finally did quiet down, my friend looked like he was getting nervous. He gave me a look and nodded toward the trees, telling me it was time to go. Whenever we would hike up the mountain, it was kind of a tradition to run down the mountain at full speed, jumping from the edges of the protruding boulders from the face of the mountain. Our landings were softened by the decades of dirt and dead leaves piled up on the steep face of the mountain. Dangerous, yes, but most of the activities we filled our days with were dangerous. We were just kids with only our imaginations to entertain ourselves. So when we started jumping and hopping down the mountain, my friend was covering way more ground than I was. I tried my best to keep up with him, but he left me behind, seemingly without even trying. He would stop every now and then to let me catch up though. We made it back to town in about 40 minutes. We sat in my family's living room for a while, which is no more than an open-air concrete corridor with a roof made of bamboo and clay shingles. He held his hand up and showed me his thumb. It was a disgusting purple swollen lump. I need to drain the blood, he said as he blankly stared at his hand. I found him a sewing needle and held it over a candle for a few seconds. I slowly pierced the skin of his thumb with the needle, and I could see it hurt him quite a bit. He was really quiet after that. Maybe it was that we turned into teenagers soon after, but every year I visited after that, he was never the guy I knew as a kid. Last summer in 2020, I got news that my good friend was found in his house, hanging in his room. I had no doubt that he had enemies in town and in the surrounding villages that might have something to do with his death. However, his wife said she was sure he had hung himself. He was there with me when I went on my first hunt, when I harvested my first beehive, when I unknowingly stole a herd of cattle from the drug lord in our region, when we got lost in the desert and jumped into a well just to drink water, when my aunt unloaded her rifle on us when she thought we were trespassers, and when we were chased by a herd of bulls that got away from their rancher. I often wonder what happened in that cave that really changed him. I truly regret not being in there with him that day. Coal Mine Road from Dean When I was young, my parents moved around a lot. I must have attended 10 different schools during my life. My dad was the kind of man who shouldn't have had kids. He wouldn't keep a steady job and forced my mother and later my aunt to work long hours to support our family, which included six kids. He was a schemer and always looking for an angle to work. My earliest memories were bar fights and my dad robbing my piggy bank while he was drunk in the middle of the night. My mom followed him like a god. To this day, I don't understand why. He was physically violent with her, and she stayed with him for over 20 years until all the kids had grown. I guess she stayed for us more than anything. The story actually begins when I was 10 years old. My dad outfitted an old school bus with bunks, and we traveled across the country from Utah to Indiana and finally to Kentucky, where the bus engine died. So the bus was our home for a long time. 
until Dad finally rented what could only be described as a shack on the side of a mountain. This was near Burksville, in what is known as the Cumberland Gap. Very mountainous with steep hills, with gravel roads carved into the mountains. The house we rented was from an old man named Howard, who owned a gas station and convenience store where two roads intersected. Howard was a good old man who took a liking to my dad. He used to give us the flat sodas from his gas station when we were waiting on the bus. For us, it was a very rare treat to drink anything more than water. There were six of us kids altogether. Marty, who was just a baby. Michael, who was in kindergarten. My sisters Jean and Carol Ann, who were in third. And my brother Jim, who was in the second grade. I was the oldest in fourth grade. We would walk down a steep gravel road that was about a quarter of a mile from the house each day to the bus stop. I remember the gravel road was overgrown and had old houses that were dilapidated on both sides. The town had been part of the company housing for a coal mine that closed up back in the 50s. Kudzu and vines covered houses. Old trucks and cars that were no more than rust piles lined the sides of the road looking out of the brush as if they were trying to hide. Howard called it the Coal Mine Road. The house we lived in was at the top of the hill from the gas station, then about a quarter mile down Coal Mine Road on the right. It was the only house not grown over with kudzu and weeds. The road kept going to a clearing where Howard had an oil rig. I remember there were copperhead snakes, and we'd keep ourselves at the center of the road so no one would get snake bit. Sometimes they would come out onto the gravel and warm in the sun, especially early in the morning. We would throw gravel at them to keep them back. We were warned never to venture off the path because Howard had told us that there were hidden dangers all around. Old cellars that had caved in, uncovered wells, and of course, the snakes. Mom was very careful to keep us all near or in the house as much as she could, but being the oldest boy, I would be sent out to get coal from a coal pile. A potbelly stove was all we had for heat. It was a chance to goof off and look around, throwing old rocks at the windows of those old houses I could see through the woods. One day, Mama asked me to go out and bring in some coal. I was watching TV on a black and white TV set in the bedroom, and I didn't want to get up. So I acted like I didn't hear Mom ask. She finally came in the room fussing and said that if I didn't get the coal right now, it would be dark. So out I went. We had an old wheelbarrow that we used to bring the coal up to the house. Then we'd take a few large pieces in and put them beside the stove. For those of you who don't know, coal is very dirty and it gets all over you. The old wheelbarrow had a steel wheel that needed grease and would squeal as you pushed it down the road and over to a pile of coal that Howard had brought out for us to keep warm. In a lot of ways, I think Howard worried about us in that old drafty house. This was sort of his way of helping. It was already dark when I shoveled the last of the coal into the wheelbarrow and turned toward the house. Then, I saw something. On the road past our home, there was a light. It was dim like an old lantern. Dad wasn't home, that I knew. He was working at a blue jean factory four hours away, and he wouldn't be home until Friday. The light bobbed as it came slowly up the road, like someone walking. There was nothing down that road now, no reason for anyone to be coming up from the old oil rig and coal mine, and if it was Howard, he would have taken his truck instead of walking. And yet here it was, a dim yellow light that seemed to keep a steady pace toward me. I gave the wheelbarrow a push. Then I stopped. If they didn't know I was here now, that would have told them. I dropped the handles of the wheelbarrow and made a run for the house, hoping I could beat the lantern carrier. As I ran the 100 yards or so to the house, the lantern grew closer, but kept its steady pace, not pausing. I could see it was a lamp, flickering with a very dirty, dusty glass cover. 
I could make out a single person in the light of the lamp as it swung at the end of the arm, walking ever closer to me and my home. I burst through the door of the house and yelled, Mama, there's someone out there on the road, behind the house. Mom came out of the kitchen and came to a halt just inside the living room. There was no doubt based on my face that I'd seen something. I wasn't overly afraid of the dark, and Mom knew that. I didn't spook easily, and she knew I was usually the one who got rid of the snakes and defended the younger kids from bullies. She said in a calm voice, Lock the door. I ran back to the front door and shut it quickly, not taking time to look for the lantern. I turned the old deadbolt lock and a homemade wooden lock we had made with a nail and a flat piece of wood. Mom came into the living room with a single 16-gauge shotgun. Her dad gave her that gun, and that may be the only reason we still had it, because she refused to let Dad sell it. By this time, the other kids were coming into the room. She told them in a hushed voice to go to the bedroom and lock the door. It must have been the tone of her voice, because they did exactly that. I could hear Marty crying behind the door and my oldest sister hushing him. She walked around cutting off lights, the kitchen, the hall where the potbelly stove was, the living room. The house had those old string lights to a single bulb, so as each light went out, the house grew very dark. The only light was the light of the porch light and the light from under the bedroom door. Mama began to peek out the windows. First, she looked out the kitchen window. The back door was locked, I could see. She peeked out the small window in the door then, and then the living room windows, then the bathroom. Nothing. She turns to me and asks, Are you sure you saw someone? I answered quickly. Yes, they had a lantern and were walking up the road. From the mine? She was looking at me intently with a furrowed brow now, her voice raised like she was questioning the information. You better be telling me the truth, she responded flatly, rechecking each window. I was hurt and at the same time angered by her lack of belief. I then started checking the windows myself, but I didn't see anything either. Finally, Mom opens the front door and steps out on the porch. She goes to the edge and looks up and down the road. I peeked out from behind her and didn't see anything either. The moon was above the trees now, and you could see clearly there wasn't anyone on the road. I guess it would be easy enough to turn off the lantern and slip into the woods, but why? We didn't have any kind of flashlight, so we had to just strain our eyes and see what we could. Nothing moved. No noises came from the woods but we could hear the other kids bumping around in the bedroom. We went back inside and shut the door. She put the shotgun in the corner by the door and looked at me with surprising compassion after such a scare. Maybe we have enough coal for the night. She smiled at me. I really saw something, Mama. I once again insisted. Maybe it was Howard. We'll ask him in the morning. She walked back to the kitchen, leaving me standing by the door. The next morning, I woke to a very cold house. No one else was up, but the fire had burned down to cinders, and there wasn't any more coal in the house. I got up, slid on my pants and shoes. I went to the front door and saw the shotgun was still in the corner by the door, where Mama had left it the night before. I peeked out the living room window, Everything that had happened the night before returning fresh to my memory. Unlocking the front door, I opened it and I looked outside. My mouth dropped open. The wheelbarrow filled with the coal I'd loaded the night before was now just sitting on the porch. Someone had taken the wheelbarrow to the house and up the five steps to the porch without anyone hearing it. One more thing. Sitting on top of the coal was an old kerosene lantern. I poked my head out into the brisk air. I thought it was cold in the house until that frosty October morning met my bare arms and face. 
I looked up and down the old road and around the house, no sign of anyone. I brought in a couple of pieces of coal and started up the fire. We never did find out who my mystery helper was. We found out later that day that Howard had been out of town at a doctor's office in Versailles, and Dad didn't come home until later that Saturday afternoon. Howard said it looked like one of the old lanterns in an old storage shed near the entrance of the mine. Dad, Howard, and I walked out the road the next day. I remember I had a hard time keeping up, it was so grown over. Howard toted an old black revolver, and Dad had Mom's shotgun. First, we went to the old shed. The door was bolted, and the padlock was rusted beyond opening. We then traipsed through the tall weeds and kudzu until dark, checking each of the old houses. But they were all still boarded up. There were no signs of entry, except for some broken-out windows that were probably from my rocks. From that day forward, I went out early to get the coal with the exception of a few really cold nights. Those nights I did venture out after dark, I took my lantern. Trash Duty from Anomalous Working the closing shift at a Popeye's isn't the hardest thing to do. By 9pm, most customers are gone and few come in, leaving us employees an hour of open time to get things ready to close. We were always at our happiest to leave at closing time if we could help it. Luck usually wasn't in my favor, though. I was the newest member of the crew back then, and as such was given dish duty for my first few months. I hated it. It always took me half an hour longer to finish my shift compared to the other employees, and that's if they were working after closing. Plus, I always came home wet from the ribcage down, random bits of soggy, rancid food scraps on my uniform. Once the dishes were done, I'd also have to take the trash to the dumpster, another duty assigned to me. Lucky me. After that, though, I'd be able to call it a night, after clocking out and saying goodnight to the manager, I joined my girlfriend in the parking lot. We only had one car at the time, and she'd have to come pick me up after work. We're married now and have better jobs, but back then, it was rough. Something happened one night in 2015 that I'll never forget, and it makes me extremely thankful that I no longer work at that Popeye's. Thank God I never had to go back. In fact, that place is no longer a Popeye's. It closed down a few years after this happened. But to describe the setting, the restaurant sat next to the most frequented road in our small town. During the day, it had tons of traffic, but at night, it was dead as could be. That's a small town for you. The most that came through after dark were truckers or out-of-state tourists driving through the night to a relative's. That's probably what made exiting the building to take out the trash every night so suspenseful. The dumpster wasn't too far from the building, sure. It sat just out of range of the drive through covered by wooden fencing so that the big green and stinky receptacle wouldn't be an eyesore to customers. Just beyond the dumpster was a large hardware store, and beyond that was woods. You'd think it wouldn't be so creepy... The hardware store's parking lot was always well lit, as was the main road behind me as I took out the trash, but once you open up that wooden fencing to get to the dumpster, things never felt right. It was cramped, a putrid smell clouded around that was so thick it stuck to your clothing, and the fencing was just tall enough to blot out the lights from every direction. It wasn't even a quick errand either. Usually, I'd have to roll two large bins to the dumpster, each filled with four to six disgusting bags of trash and rotting food that often spilled out as you lifted them. Each of these bags had to be lifted out one at a time. There were times I swear I'd hear something moving around in there as I tossed those bags into the dumpster, like something scurrying about. 
I tried to convince myself it was a rat, but I'd seen and heard rats at that dumpster before. Their little clawing sounds were that of a lightweight rodent, but this sound in particular was like I'd startled something much larger and forced it to stay quiet until I was gone. Raccoons, I'd tell myself, or possums, whichever idea helped me keep my head on my shoulders to make it through the night. I wasn't the only one that heard those noises either. The other employees had told stories of the dumpster being haunted. Yeah, you heard that right, a haunted dumpster. How a dumpster specifically can be haunted, I have no idea. But upon hearing those noises long enough, any 20-something young guy might come to believe it. This made my nightly trek to the dumpster an event. One of terror and hurriedness. I like to believe that my nerves were on edge, simply because I was about to be able to clock out and finally head home. But I knew something was wrong back there. At the back of my mind, I knew all of this was going to lead to something happening. But I didn't know when, and I hoped, to all heavens, that it wouldn't happen to me. It did. It was a cold January night. A bit of black ice remained on the asphalt about town, forcing every outside trek to be one of caution and hesitance. As the trash piled up throughout the day, my co-workers refused to take out any of the bins. I knew my trash duty that night would be precarious too. By 9pm, my peers were starting their nightly cleanup duties, and I was able to start on the mountainous mound of dishes early in the back room. Yet, more and more dishes would arrive to replace the ones I cleaned, so it seemed I wasn't making any progress until after 10pm when my co-workers began to clock out. By 10.40 p.m., the dishes were done. I was soaked to my very bones, and all that remained to be done was the trash. The only people left in the building by then, as usual, were my manager and I. The manager couldn't leave until the rest of us were gone, or ready to go, and the cash in the till was completely accounted for. It was nice to not have to be entirely alone, I guess. But she wasn't very much of a talkative person after closing. Probably wanted to get home as much as I did. So I began to herd the bins outside the back door. That was the process. Gather them all up outside first, then escort them across the short way to the dumpster. I was thankful the roads were empty as I slipped over black ice about three times, getting just two bins over to the dumpster. I scraped my left elbow pretty bad. It was an irritating night soon to get worse. I hadn't even begun lifting the latch to the gate to the fencing around the dumpster before I heard it. The scuffling sound. A heavy but dampened sound of an animal walking around the dumpster. Immediately, I visualized something about the size of a Malamute, something with weight and deliberateness to it, unlike the quick and often aimless scamper of raccoons or possums following the scent of food and decay. Whatever it was, it hadn't heard me yet. The footsteps continued, slowly circling the dumpster. I assumed this thing had jumped the fence and was in search of food dropped around the edges. This was a frequent occurrence, unfortunately. Some customers decided not to use the trash cans provided on the outside of the store and would drive up and attempt to toss their food and trash over the fencing and into the dumpster. Keep in mind, the dumpster lids were closed much of the day, so they didn't know or didn't care that their food would just land and slide off the dumpster surface. I swallowed down a bit of trepidation, and I lifted the latch, the instant I did, the footsteps stopped. The thing didn't scurry away or hide or anything like that. The sounds just stopped, as if waiting. I slowly opened the fencing and peered around the edge of it, left and right. Nothing strange just inside the front of the dumpster. That was enough for me. I threw open the left lid of the dumpster, 
and started tossing trash inside. One bag, two bags, three, four, five bags. The first bin was empty. I rotated the bins and started on the second. One bag, two bags. But then, as I lifted the third out of the bin and turned back to the dumpster to throw it in, I gasped and dropped the trash bag. Something had jumped from the back of the dumpster into the open side. I couldn't breathe for a moment. I had to remind myself to take in air. When I finally did, I nearly choked. Did I really just see that? If something jumped into the dumpster, that meant it was right in front of me. Nothing but a rusty dumpster wall between us. My mind raced and I somehow convinced myself I'd simply been seeing things. But I had to be sure. I decided I would quietly and quickly take a look over the edge of the dumpster just to see what was inside. One step forward and I stood as close to the dumpster as I could. On my toes, I stretched my neck over. Slowly, I peeked inside. First, I saw typical food and mold and miscellaneous trash scattered about the back wall. I kept stretching further, my vision making its way to the front wall. Soon, I could make out something with jet black fur, soaked as I was, and it was breathing slowly. The movement of its breaths was extremely subtle. I couldn't even hear it, and at the time I couldn't be sure if it wasn't just some hobo covering himself in a throw. Just a bit more I stretched over, revealing more of what I hoped was anything than what it turned out to be. But the moment my sight revealed more of it, a face burst forth from the rubbish towards me, something elongated and animalistic, flat teeth at the front, and eyes that gleamed yellow from the faint light that leaked through the one opening in the fence. A squeal filled the air. A mix of my own scream and the cry of this thing that had burst forth from the dumpster reverberated around me. I fell to the ground as this jet black mass the size of a large dog with extremely short legs and long thin strands of fur sticking out of its back like needles leapt over me, landing clumsily to my side between the fencing and the dumpster. The thing was more than half my size. I continued screaming as I picked myself up. The creature made a mad dash at me as I slammed the fence opening shut and locked the latch. It clawed at the wood for a moment before scurrying around to the back. I watched the fencing, listening to it move around. Mistakenly, I assumed the creature was locked inside now. I failed to realize that it had been visiting this dumpster for a while, with no need for the gate to be open. When I heard a wet thump of that thing falling to the ground after crawling over the fence, my heart felt as if it imploded. It was no longer locked inside, and the sound of its footsteps circling around the fence meant it was coming my way. I jumped from the curb onto the asphalt that lined the drive through but as I mentioned before, patches of black ice covered the asphalt all around. My run broke down into a sliding fall as I awkwardly struggled to bring myself to my feet again. Tears fell from my eyes as I gained no ground. Then, flat but powerful teeth gripped into my shoe just missing my flesh. I struggled harder throwing an arm at the half-full bin next to me. Finally, I was able to pick myself up, but the bin fell from my weight as the last two remaining trash bags fell to the ground out of it. I ran to the back door, looking back only for a moment once I'd made it inside, just before closing the door completely. All I saw was one of the full trash bags being pulled around the fence and needle-like hairs disappearing around the corner. Running for my manager, I was able to stutter out an explanation. Something attacked me, I said, 
showing her the tear in my black, non-slip shoes. She went outside to investigate with a flashlight, found nothing. She came back in and told me to be careful of scavenging animals next time. She explained that possums and the like can be dangerous if they feel cornered. It was then that I wanted to say it was obviously no possum, but I caught myself. Because I knew I'd sound insane and unbelievable if I explained everything in detail. Taking a deep breath, I simply told her that the trash still wasn't done, but I was going home anyway. She wrote me up for not finishing my closing duties, but I clocked out just the same and waited in the dark lobby for my girlfriend to arrive with the car. The idea of going outside again terrified me. My girlfriend was late, having just gotten off of a closing shift herself. She, I was comfortable telling everything to. When I got in the car and explained, she believed me, especially having shown her my shoe. We circled around the dumpster through the parking lot in the back, trying to catch a glimpse of something or anything, but all that remained was spilled trash. Not long after that, I got two more write-ups for failing to complete my closing tasks in a timely manner, and I was therefore fired. I'd never failed to complete anything until that incident. I guess the manager didn't like that I begged other co-workers to at least help me with the trash, but no one would take me up on the offer. That's fine. I don't miss it there. You can call me crazy but I have no idea what I saw back there. I sincerely hope it was some deformed or mangy dog, desperate for the food left over from the trash I brought out every night. Otherwise, I've got no idea what else it could be without delving into theories that border on irrational. But after what I saw, would thinking that I encountered some sort of monster really be anything less than rational? Please let me know if I'm crazy. Have you ever seen anything like this yourself? I can't get over what happened, and never having closure to this situation has been really stressful to me. If you have any theories, I'm open to hearing them. Someone at the Logging Site From Barb Aaron It was the summer of 2006, and I was completely broke. I was a college dropout, running out of money in my savings account, and willing to do anything to avoid having to ask my family for free handouts. I would rather work for it if I could. I only had enough money for about two months worth of utilities and rent left, so I called up my uncle. My uncle was by no means rich, but he always had spare cash in hand for those who were willing to work for it especially family. He ran a logging business, nothing big. Basically, he would hire out his small team to whoever needed it. Their clients' requests included stump removal all the way up to large lot clearing, and that leads me to the start of my story. After I called up my uncle, he said he did indeed have some work for me. He was clearing a rather large lot in the middle of the woods a couple of miles out of town. He didn't have anyone to watch over the equipment overnight, and he said he really didn't feel like staying overnight there himself. So for a hundred bucks a night, I decided to be the night watchman for the logging site for about two weeks. The job was simple. Make sure no one stole the equipment or damaged it. That task was even easier because he had his workers bring the equipment to the middle of the site every night, which meant that all we needed was two cameras to keep an eye out on everything. He had a single security monitor set up in a portable building. So I would just sit in there, keep an eye on the monitor, and pass the time. To me, this sounded like free money. What could go wrong in the middle of the woods away from town? Surely there'd be no one around to damage or steal anything. This was basically a paid camping trip. On the first night, I arrived. My uncle was still there. He took a moment to show me how the monitors worked, how to use the buttons to switch between the two cameras. Again, nothing complicated. He was gone by 11 p.m., leaving me there till 7 a.m., when the first of the workers should be showing up. I wanted to do a good job, 
So at first, I was adamantly checking the cameras back and forth. One, then two, one, then two, then walking outside to check, then going back in the building over the course of an hour. After that, I started to play some games on my phone. Turns out the hardest part of being a night watchman there was finding a way to not be bored. I made some progress on a couple of visual novels I had installed on my Android phone, but after a couple of hours I was bored with that. Admittedly, around 2am, I began to nod off. Honestly, I did my best not to fall asleep, but the more tired I got, the more my brain made excuses. Ah, no one's gonna find out, I'd tell myself. If you take a nap, nothing's gonna happen. It'll be like you stayed awake all night. And my brain won out in the end. Sometime later, I woke up in a panic. Not because I heard anything, but because I had a stress dream that my uncle got back and caught me sleeping. That would not be very good. I looked at the camera monitor in front of me to check the time. There was a timestamp at the bottom right that showed the current time. 2.35. I'd only dozed off for about half an hour. And honestly, I felt a bit better. So I got up and began to do some stretches when I noticed something else on the monitor. It was camera 2, which was placed next to one of the large machines that I don't know the name of. Look, I'm no logger. About 12 to 15 yards in front of the camera, almost dead center in the middle of the site, sat a man. He had no shirt on, no shoes, no socks. Whatever bottoms he wore were only tatters. Immediately from the look of him, I assumed he was some backwoods hobo. I got nothing against homeless people, and I know they need help, but I also knew he couldn't be here, especially if I wasn't sure if he was going to take something or not. As I looked at him, the man seemed uninterested in the things around him. In fact, he wasn't even showing his face. Instead, his face was buried in his palms as he sat there crisscross on the ground. Was he okay? I wondered. I grabbed one of the big flashlights in the portable building, one of those big black sturdy torches that could be used as a weapon if you wanted to. I then exited the building and began to approach the middle of the site. The moment I stepped outside the building, though, I heard it. The sound of a full-grown man crying, and it wasn't any sort of normal crying either. These were full-on, dramatic, traumatic sobs, as if a loving dad had just found all his children dead. Hearing it made my heart break. I swear there was something about that sound that brought a tear to my own eye, and my heart began to raise. I swallowed down hard, and I started towards the man. As I meandered my way around the equipment, I found him still sitting there, crying those terrible cries. I clicked on the flashlight and shone it on him. His back heaved repeatedly, breathing in and out deeply to cry harder and harder. I struggled to think of something to do or say to get his attention. I'd hoped when I clicked on the flashlight he would look my way, but he didn't budge. Hey, are you alright? Uh, do you need some help? I called over to him. The moment I spoke, his sobbing stopped, and the heaving of his back slowed so much, I couldn't even tell if he was still breathing. Then he turned his face to the side. I could then make out his profile. His face was all puffy and red and swollen from so much crying, and an unnaturally blue eye gazed at me. I've never seen anyone with such a beautiful color of blue in their eyes. This man's hair was graying in most places. If I had to guess, I'd say he was probably in his mid-fifties. Then, without a word, still turned away from me, yet facing me with one half of his face, he stood. I noticed then he was pretty tall. Probably about six foot two to six foot four. As I was five foot ten, the difference was noticeable. He was very much bigger than me, and I was afraid he might try to attack. For what reason, I don't know, but the man did not appear well. Suddenly, with half his face still showing, turned over his shoulder to look at me with one eye, he smiled, and he began to walk away into the darkness, disappearing into the woods nearby that hadn't been cut. 
the way he walked so slow and unblinking with that weird smile, it creeped me out. When I could no longer see him, I ran back to the portable building and locked the door. I sat back in the office chair in front of the monitor, eyes wide and heart still racing. Who was that guy? I wondered. A few minutes later, I began to laugh at myself. What was a creepy experience, I realized would make for a really funny story with the guys later in town. I relaxed a bit, played a little more games on my phone just to ease my mind, checking the monitor a little bit more frequently than before, too. By 4am, it was still extremely dark, and I was getting tired again. I got up just to check the portable building door to make sure it was locked. The bolt was turned, and when I tried to open the door anyway just to be sure, it didn't budge. So, I was safe. I sat back in my chair and dozed off. Once again, I woke up some time later. The sun still wasn't up, but something was weird. I was freezing. I looked over at the portable heater that my uncle had left in the building. It was still on, going full blast, aiming at me. So why was I so cold? Before I could finish that thought, I felt something on my face. Something that had been there the whole time since I'd awakened, that I had only just noticed. There was a liquid all over my face. It was cold and had the texture of water. There was some next to my lip. Instinctively, I licked my lip and froze wide-eyed. That wasn't water. It had a salty taste. That distinct taste of human tears. My heart felt like it stopped, but when I looked at the desk in front of me where the monitor stood, my heart exploded back to life. There it sat, made to face towards me. The head of a rabbit. It had been propped up, just so it could look in my direction, and next to it was a rusty piece of metal covered in blood. I threw myself off the chair, and without turning around, I reached for the door, but I felt a breeze instead. The door was open. It had been open the whole time, and that's why I was so cold. I screamed curses and panicked. I ran to my car and left the site, immediately calling my uncle over and over until he finally answered. I told him what happened, and I told him I would not be back at that site. I'm not sure he believed me until he arrived at the portable building himself and found what I'd found. The cops were called, but no one knew who the guy was or where he went. I didn't see him do it, but I know it was him, the rabbit head. The tears he stood over me and cried on my face while I was asleep, and that sharp piece of metal he used on a rabbit. If he'd wanted to, he could have used that on me. From time to time, my uncle still has jobs that require a night watchman, and he has come to me a couple of times offering me the job. But after what happened that night, I can't do it again. I still have nightmares. Attacked by a wolf-like creature from Kylie T. I don't exactly know what I saw, but they were definitely not like any animal I've ever seen. Everything I'm about to tell you is true, and I've only ever seen two of them in my whole life. Once when I was 10, and the other when I was 14. I'm 27 now. Most people don't believe me when I tell them what I saw, but I know I'm not crazy or was just seeing things because two of my friends also saw it, and it terrified the heck out of them. I live in southern Illinois. When I was younger, I used to hang out with my friend Ty at his grandma's house. My mom was a good friend with his grandma, and great-grandma, so we went down there almost every weekend to see them. He and his brother would stay there during the summer, so all their friends, including myself, would go and stay with them for days at a time. As you could imagine, it could get pretty cramped. 
but they lived in the country, so we were usually outside. At some point, we ended up moving in with his grandma, staying with them for a short time. Their grandma lived in a double-wide trailer, and his great-grandma lived in a small house that sat on a little hill about 10 feet from his grandma's trailer. They lived on the outskirts of town and were surrounded by a large set of woods and open cow fields. They had some neighbors, but they were pretty spread out because they were farmers. Behind their homes was another huge field for the neighbor's cows and a long barbed wire fence wrapping around it that seemed like it went on for miles, dividing the woods and the property lines. Directly behind his great-grandma's house was the large rusty metal gate. One day as we were getting ready to go outside, we overheard his grandma telling my mom how the neighbors had to move their cows out of the field behind her house because something was attacking and killing their cattle. We could tell by the way they were talking they didn't want us to know about it. Unfortunately for them, we had listened to their entire conversation. As we walked into the living room, they quickly changed the subject. We pretended to hear nothing and started going outside. His grandma spoke up, telling us to stay out of the open field. Ty took the opportunity to ask questions in hopes they'd tell us what was going on. But they didn't. She simply said it was their property and we needed to stay out. But we had other plans. When we knew everyone was asleep, me, Ty, and our friend Shay decided to go and investigate these mysterious cow murders. It was around two or three in the morning and the moon was bright and full in the sky, making it easier for us to get around. The field was very open, and there were hay bells pushed over to the left side of the fence. On the right side were the woods. They went on for miles, and they were very thick. The fence ended just in front of the tree line. We went in, leaving the gate open, and started searching for anything suspicious. For the most part, Nothing seemed unusual, beside the cows not being in there. Just before we got to the end of the fence, in front of the tree line, we found a dead, mangled coyote that looked like it hadn't been there for very long. We only started to smell its rotten stench when we got right up on top of it. We didn't know what it was at first. Ty and I shined our flashlights on it, and almost couldn't tell it was even a coyote. I had bent down to get a better look while Ty stood beside me. We had our backs turned directly in front of the tree line. Shay was about two feet away from the coyote because it made her feel sick, but she was still facing us. By this time, she was starting to get scared and she was ready for us to leave but we were too busy trying to figure out what had killed this coyote. She repeated herself a couple times that we needed to leave and that she didn't want to do this anymore, but we just kept telling her to hold on. At about that time, we heard something let out this deep, guttural, low growl. It was coming from behind us in the woods. We all stopped and got real quiet. I looked behind me, still crouched as they shined their lights into the woods. It was silent for a moment. You could hear a pin drop. Then we heard it again. This time, it sounded louder, as if it had gotten closer somehow without us hearing it. I finally stood up and faced the woods, shining my light in the same direction, but I couldn't see anything. What the heck is that? I asked. I was feeling pretty freaked out, but I didn't want to show it. I thought it was a big dog, maybe, but the growls were like nothing I'd ever heard before. It sounded really big and almost demonic. Before I had any time to react, Shay screamed at the top of her lungs and dropped her flashlight in a panic, running back toward the house. We panicked and took off behind her. I didn't know what she saw, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. All of a sudden, 
I heard rustling and crunching as something big and fast was coming out of the woods, followed by a horrendous, roaring growl. Pure terror struck me, and the adrenaline was coursing through my body. It leapt over the fence, hitting the ground hard and charging after us. I could hear the ground stomping under its feet as it kept coming. Shay was screaming ahead of us. I tried to turn back and see if Ty was keeping up, and I saw it, towering over the top of him. This enormous, black, furry creature was right there. I could see its black, furry mane and long, pointed ears sticking over its head like that of a wolf or dog. I couldn't believe the size of it. I know we were just kids, but Ty was a 14-year-old boy and he was pretty tall for his age. But this thing stood a good five foot something on all fours. I turned around, screaming for my life, trying to run faster, but I knew it was gaining on us. We were all screaming at this point, running across the field. I was hoping so desperately that someone would hear us and try to help, but we were so far out there it was almost impossible. The creature kept roaring that blood-curdling sound. It was like something from the pits of hell, easily the most terrifying thing I'd ever heard. I kept looking back in hopes that he was okay and to get a better look at this thing, but it never moved out from behind him. As soon as we made it through the gate, we slammed it shut and locked it as if that rusty busted up metal gate was going to do anything against that thing. We searched the area frantically as we gasped for air, but it was gone, not a trace of it. How could something so big, so loud, just disappear? It was possible it stopped and ran back into the woods without us knowing in our panicked mindset, but why? It could have easily killed us just like those cows. Either way, I thank God I was able to live and tell about it. We ran back to his grandma's trailer trying to be quiet, but got caught by his brother. We told him what had happened, but he didn't believe us at all, just made jokes. His attitude changed real quick, though. The next night, we heard something outside the trailer. Their great-grandma called their grandma and said she heard someone or something messing around her house. So Ty's grandma grabbed her shotgun and her and his brother went out to see what was going on. It wasn't long before they came back and he looked like he had seen a ghost. His face was pale and he was real quiet. That was unlike him. His grandma demanded that we stay in at night, but nobody would tell us what had happened. We tried to get him to tell us, but he refused to talk about it. It frightened him so bad that it gave him nightmares for a while. All he said was, I believe you. We never went back into the woods after that, and when it got dark, we got in the house quickly, especially during the full moon. That was the last time any of us saw it out there, and no one seems to know what it was. Everyone thought it was a bobcat, but I beg to differ. This thing was bigger than any bobcat I've ever seen and we don't have bears or wolves around here. So, what was it? My second encounter was a bit different. I was 14 and we lived in a housing duplex. We were surrounded by apartments on all sides. Directly behind us was a big open field, spacing out the other apartments. Two on the left, two on the right, and three directly behind us. Facing the ones behind ours was a road, and right on the other side was a huge field with a little old abandoned building sitting in the middle. A few yards away in the field to the left was a house that owned part of the property, and way on the end to the right, a few yards away from the building, was the football practice area. Beyond the field, just past the building, was a pond that was surrounded by tall grass and cattails. A little further out, surrounding the entire area, was deep, dense woods that led on to the next town. One night I was out playing a hide-and-go-seek tag type of game with my neighbor friends. 
Everything was normal. We did this all the time. After everyone was caught, we went to the front of the apartments by my place and soon realized that one of our friends was still out there hiding. We yelled for him and told him the game was over, but nobody knew where he actually was. So we started looking for him and kept calling his name. We searched all over the front area for him, but nobody could find him and he wasn't answering any of us, which we thought was really strange. I decided to go look for him in the field towards the woods because that's where all the boys would hide when the grass grew high. It was the perfect hiding place, especially at night. I made my way to the road and was looking around. I soon got to the streetlight. Just at the edge of the field by the road, there are a set of trees. Not very big and not very many, maybe about seven in all, placed in a row and spaced out about 12 feet apart. In between a set of two trees, I saw a figure that appeared to be crouched in the tall grass. I knew it had to be him. I walked up to him and said, Hey, come on. The game is over, you won. Everyone's been looking for you. But he never replied. I stopped directly in front of him about eight or nine feet away and stood in the gravel in the road. The grass was really high that night. Walking into it, it would have come up to my waist, or a little higher, so it was over his head while he was crouched, and it was hard to really see him. But I knew he was there by the dark figure. I said his name a few times, and asked him why he wasn't responding, but he never said anything. I was starting to wonder if this was really him or not. I leaned forward a little bit, staring at the figure for a minute, and I started to realize that what I'd been talking to resembled an animal, more so a dog. So of course, I started talking to it again. Oh, hi baby, what are you doing? I said, thinking that I'm now talking to a pretty good sized dog, just sitting in the tall grass. I talked to it a few more times, but it didn't move or make a sound. I looked around and was starting to feel a little creeped out. It was dark. I was alone, and I'd finally noticed how foggy the field was in the tall grass. Among all that, I also noticed I didn't hear my friends yelling anymore. I didn't like the atmosphere I was in, and I was beginning to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I looked back down at the dog, and I saw it start to stand up, but it didn't stand onto all fours like I expected it to. No, it kept rising. I slowly watched this thing stand straight up on two legs, and it went way over my head. It was hunched over, covered in thick black fur. Its arms were bent, and its paw-like hands were down in front of its waist area. Its legs were bent exactly like that of a dog, and it had a long, thick, black tail. It stood at least three or four feet taller than me, and I was around five foot one. It was strangely built like a person, but it wasn't especially muscular, just really tall and really furry. I knew what I was staring at had to be the same thing that attacked me and my friends four years earlier. I was frightened. I didn't know what to do. I just stood there and stared at it. I couldn't quite make out its facial structure, but I knew it had a snout. It didn't make a sound and neither did I. I slowly started to take a step back and it mimicked me, taking a step forward. I was horrified. I wanted to run, but I was afraid it would attack me right there and then. I slowly took a few more steps and watched it come a little closer. I finally got the courage to run and ran as fast as I could, almost falling into a ditch. I ran across the road, over the sidewalk, through someone's yard, and in between two apartments leading into the open field. I saw my apartment and kept running until I was almost in my neighbor's yard, before turning to look back. It wasn't following me, but I was too scared to stop 
and went around to the front where everyone else was at. I ran to the group of them and stopped in a panic, trying to catch my breath. They then asked me where I had been and that our friend was in his house the whole time. I was too shaken up to talk, and I was still out of breath. My girlfriends knew something was wrong. I calmed down a bit and finally told them what I saw, but the boys just laughed at me. I'm not kidding. I saw it, I yelled, getting mad. One of the boys laughed and said, It was probably just a big beaver. I couldn't believe it. Really? A beaver? Beavers don't stand eight feet tall, I continued. But they laughed and wanted to see what was out there. I was hesitant at first because I already knew how dangerous it was, if it was in fact the same thing I saw before. But they were determined to see it. We went out there, but it was already gone. I stayed alert in case it came back, but it never did. We looked around and some of the boys went further into the field, but it was too foggy and the grass was too high to see anything. I showed them where it was and saw that the grass where it had been crouching was disturbed. It was obvious something was here, but they continued to make their jokes. The next day... I wanted to go out there and look for any evidence that may have been there that we didn't see. But I had to babysit, so my girlfriends went instead. I don't know if it was true or not, but they swore they found huge dog-like footprints out by the woods. They found them in the mud by the pond and followed them until they stopped at a tree. When they took me to see it, the people who owned the property came out and threatened us, telling us to leave. I never saw anything else like that out there again, but I did notice strange sounds at night, out in the woods. Every so often, me and some other people would hear weird howls that almost sounded like a person screaming, but howling at the same time too. It wasn't like any type of howls I've ever heard, but everyone brushed them off as coyotes crying. I don't believe that for a second. I don't know what they were, but the best way I can describe them was they were, well, werewolves. As crazy as that sounds, I can't think of anything else they could have been. I haven't seen anything since that day, or heard any of those strange sounds since I moved out of the apartment, but I know they're still out there, somewhere, watching. During our honeymoon in the Smoky Mountains, my husband and I caught the attention of something unknown and terrifying for an entire week. From Reddit user Wolf underscore Dream. Trigger warning for suicide. About a month ago, a user by the name of Sniper6407 asked if anyone had ever had strange experiences in southern Tennessee and a few other nearby places, particularly in the mountains. I had too much going on to respond at the time, but my husband and I had an experience there that I think is worth telling, although most in our family don't know, because we understand how they would react, so we've never told them. While I realize this post relates many over-the-top experiences, my husband and I both experienced the following as described. I understand that not everyone will believe me, but since this post also contains deeply personal moments in my life, I ask that you please keep comments respectful, whatever opinions you express on the matter. Thank you. This story needs background to convey some factors that were potentially involved. I suspect the events leading up to the trip to Tennessee may have had a direct relation to the severity of the phenomenon we experienced while there. I had never wanted to marry, neither had my now husband. Then we met each other, and we were engaged at 30 and 28 years old. We had a two-year engagement. We wanted our wedding to symbolize our true soul bond and decided to go completely non-traditional. 
His giant family wanted a white dress Catholic wedding, so we were at major odds with the family from day one. My fiancé and I began suffering from a huge run of exceptionally bad luck and some odd poltergeist activity at home. Nothing too major, so we brushed it off. Except when we left the house once and came back to find a red clown nose sitting front and center on our bathroom sink. No one had the keys to our place and we didn't own a darn clown nose. That one was freaky. When I told a friend something weird was going on to the point I almost felt the wedding was cursed, he tried to explain it away. I replied, Watch, something's going to happen today while he's getting his tux, I'm telling you. I get one flabbergasted look before my fiancé immediately called to say there'd been a freak accident in the parking lot while he was getting fitted for his tux and someone had totaled the back end of his truck. That shut my friend right up. Another glitch was my refusal to have my father walk me down the aisle. I also refused a random stand-in for tradition's sake. I asked my younger brother to walk me down the aisle and he said he would be so honored. We'd had some problems, but he'd been clean for seven years and we'd made up our differences. Losing our middle brother to a drunk driver had driven us apart for a while but brought us back closer a little later down the road. Then, 40 days before the wedding, unintentionally, my brother committed suicide in his mid-twenties. My fiancé and I drove over 16 hours close to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to say goodbye. I knew my brother, and I knew he would not cross over easily with what he'd done, especially with my wedding around the corner and me counting on him. This really bothered me. His viewing was closed to immediate family only. He was not embalmed due to the complete autopsy required. He was covered in a handmade quilt to his chin. We were instructed not to touch him, although we ignored this stricture. After saying our goodbyes, I walked to the end of his gurney and lay my hands on his feet, a supplicant. I told him I understood it was an accident, and I forgave him. I told him that if he still felt he needed to make amends with me, then he could do so by calling forth my loved ones and those of my fiancé to come witness the wedding from the other side. I bade him bring our other brother, my fiancé's sister, grandparents, aunts, friends, and I began calling by name all those beloved souls whom had already passed. Do this, I told him and there will be no debt between us, and you can rest in peace. The looks on my family's faces were priceless at this point, but I felt this was something I needed to offer. I had a pendant made when I returned to New Orleans. On it was my favorite picture of my two brothers. I wrapped this around my bouquet, and although it seemed to the wedding guests that I walked the aisle alone, I knew that both my sweet brothers were right beside me in spirit, because they would never miss the wedding of their sister, especially with Hector, the one who committed suicide, actively dragging them across the veil to fulfill his last obligation to the living. Later on, my new husband, Eli, and I went to a rental cabin on Bluff Mountain for a honeymoon week. I don't want to name the specific cabin in case I'm not supposed to, but I will say it was very rocky with a raccoon theme. Bluff Mountain is in Pigeon Forge, outside of Gatlinburg, in the Smoky Mountains. I was living in New Orleans and had brought a double handful of fresh-picked gardenia blossoms with me. It was a type of symbolic offering to the mountain for having us on such a special occasion. No rituals or anything, I simply arranged them on a wooden box with a fake bird and nest that was sitting on the top of the railing of the cabin porch and sent up feelings of gratitude and joy. We went out to eat and grab groceries. Upon arriving back at the cabin, the wooden bird box had been smashed into a million pieces on the porch. It hit the ground hard enough to shatter so far and so thoroughly. We thought that maybe a raccoon or bear had done it. Then I noticed that there were no flowers. Maybe the wind. Leaves that had been scattered all over the porch, just like when we left, made me hesitate. 
Gardenias aren't super light flowers, definitely heavier than the leaves I saw. More curious than anything, I looked all around the porch, stairs, and walkway. I shrugged it off until the next morning, when I went a little way down the driveway to pick some honeysuckle. About 20 feet from the porch, I glanced down and did a double take. There lay my gardenias, all of them. They had been piled up and squished flat as crepes. There were no shoe prints, but it took more than one stop to flatten the pile like that. Unnerved, I walked away, wondering if the mountain didn't like my offering after all, then laughed at myself for the thought. Night 1 Eli woke up suddenly to what sounded like something big banging the support beams under the cabin. The cabin hung off the side of a hill, so the front half was supported about 15 feet off the forest floor by giant wooden posts. They were being hit so hard that the mirror on the wall was vibrating, which frankly should be physically impossible for anyone to do. Eli said every time he started to drift back off, there was another bang. He gets up, fully, and after one more cabin-shaking bang, he decides to wake me. Apparently, he was trying to see if I would wake from the banging, so he would know he wasn't dreaming. But now, he was 100% up. As he reached for me, he said the loudest bang or slap came from the area between the sitting area slash kitchen right at the bottom of the bed. It was a one-room cabin. He said it sounded like a giant book getting dropped from high up, but he was looking right there, and there was nothing. This bang was definitely inside the cabin. He began frantically trying to wake me, but he said I was so deeply asleep, he actually thought something was wrong with me. He said he could barely tell I was breathing. Then, this strange metallic jangling sounded from behind the TV, directly across the cabin from our bed. He said it went on forever, but he was too scared to go look for whatever it was, over there next to the huge windows past the spot where the noise originated from inside. It was this insistent buzzing that finally woke me. I remember it was so hard to come back to consciousness, I felt like I was literally swimming through blackness to get back to myself. I kept asking what the heck is that noise? I thought it was an alarm someone left set, cute. When I finally woke up enough to move and set up to go find and smash the offending noisemaker, the trilling stopped. Groaning, I fell backwards onto my pillow. Eli began telling me about the banging. I could tell how upset my husband was. I believed what he was telling me, but I was so numb and out of it, I was struggling to come up with any emotional response at all. There was only this debilitating fatigue, and I fell asleep on my husband when he needed me, when a man whom I'd never seen afraid in seven years was completely terrified, I just zonked out until morning. Normally, I'm an extremely light sleeper, especially in new places. This trip, however, almost every night was like this. No sooner did I put my head on the pillow than I was swallowed by blackness. It was extremely deep sleep, but it wasn't restful. Waking up was worse. It was like falling into a coma every night and slowly reviving every morning. It ironically left me exhausted. Day and night too. While doing my makeup in the infamous shaking mirror the next morning, I was able to get the full story and talk to Eli about it logically. Maybe a bear was rubbing against the post. He replies, it was solid bangs like a huge fist. No way a bear. And what about the one from the center of the floor on the inside? That reminded me of that stupid alarm. I told him that I was about to disable that thing. At the exact freaking second I mentioned it, that darn noise started blaring from behind the TV again. We both jumped like rabbits and laughed nervously. Heck of a way to time it, I joked. Punny. Looking behind the TV, I was surprised to see it wasn't an alarm clock, 
but a landline phone, an old one with a bell buzzer, which explained the horrid noise. Of course, I had to answer it. There was a minute of silence, then bursts of static. It really sounded like someone was talking, but static was obscuring their words. I told them to move to get better reception, then asked if this was cabin management. The silence garbled talk continued for a while before I hung up. I was amused, honestly, especially with the way Eli was gaping at me. When I hung up, he immediately unplugged the phone, said management had both our cells, so it was probably a prank call from someone who stayed here before, but we were not going to play along and end up in a deliverance scenario. Smart man, phone stayed unplugged for the duration. That night we were in the hot tub on the deck. It was around the back, had a gazebo type cover around three sides, and no lights too close, so bugs wouldn't be swarming you. As we're relaxing, I'm sitting on the open end, facing the enclosing wooden strips, and Eli's facing me in the forest. I kept admiring the blue light behind the enclosed end. It was large, about the size of a cantaloupe, and seemed bright. But the glow over us in the hot tub was very muted. I figured it must be LED of some sort, but I'd never seen a light that shade of blue anywhere. All the other lights in and around the cabin were bright and orangey, so I remember saying how it was sweet. They went all out for mood lighting for the hot tub. Eli both looked at and commented on the light as well. When we decided to get out for the night, the light blinked on and off in what looked like a purposeful sequence before shining a few more seconds and going dark. We commented that it was strange how the light burnt out like that, and how we were sad to lose our mood lighting. I decided to call the next morning for a bulb. When I woke up, I first walked around the rear of the cabin to see what type of pole or other fixture was the one we needed surfaced. But there was no pole, no fixture, no other light source behind the hot tub, no cables, no wires. The main office later confirmed the instability of the soil back there prevented anything that wasn't heavy duty from being installed, so no lighting was ever put back there. Whatever that light was, we both saw it, and it was apparently just eavesdropping because we were out there about two hours, and so was it. And if it wasn't turning off or burning out, that means it was straight up disappearing. Starting the second night after coming in, my skin started to crawl and every hair on my body stood on end every time I passed the open bathroom. The bathroom was next to the bed area. Lying in bed, you could see the bathroom sink and the small window above it. The window had no curtains, as it faced into the woods behind the hot tub. At this point, I still thought the blue light was man-made, yet I could swear there was something looking in the window. I'd been leaving the bathroom door open, because I liked looking out at the forest from the bed. But now I tried to keep it shut, without Eli noticing I was being weird. Eli told me the next morning that every time he began to drift off, a resounding bang on the posts under the cabin would jolt him. He said he was freaked out, because no matter how long or short a time he waited to lay his head down, it was like whatever it was knew exactly what he was doing, even though he never got out of bed. Once again, he was wide awake and terrified, and nothing he could do would rouse me even the slightest. Night 3 After scrubbing ourselves as best we could in the highly stinky sulfuric water of the cabin, we were getting ready for bed. Walking from the bathroom to the bed, I realized I forgot to shut the bathroom door. Since Eli was already lying in bed looking at me, I just kept on toward my side of the bed, telling myself to stop being ridiculous. Even though I could swear at that moment, Something was looking in that window. I'd already looked out several times and couldn't see anything out of place, but I could still feel it. Eli quietly asks me if I can shut the door. Why? 
because that window gives me the creeps. Talk about validation. That night I had some disturbing dreams, but I can't remember them. Eli, however, suffered a severe bout of sleep paralysis that night, although he swore it wasn't sleep paralysis because he says he sat up, kicked, and yelled at her. Now, however, he says it probably was sleep paralysis. Either way, he woke up to eerie laughter and saw what he described as a grudge-type woman standing at the end of the bed, laughing at him. I wouldn't wake. He said she wore a white dress, had pale skin, black eyes, and a horrible mouth. She had long black hair partially obscuring her face and was surrounded by a swirling black mist. She reached for him, and he sat up, yanking his legs up to his chest. This is when he started yelling at her to get out and kicking at her. Laughing, she faded out. He said he was awakened by her grabbing his ankles and giggling throughout the night and would also wake just long enough to catch glimpses of her. I was still no help. Night 4 A repeat sleep paralysis experience for Eli, but he said it was even more intense this time. Same lady in white. I had also realized a trinket I brought for luck and put on the shelf next to my side of the bed was missing. It was a tiny cabin, and we tore it up looking for the next two days, but I've never seen it again. It was worthless except for personal reasons, and no valuables were missing, so I don't think someone came in and snagged it. Night 5 Whenever I sat up out of the water on the side of the hot tub, I started to get the same feeling of being watched I'd felt from the bathroom window. I would literally break out in goosebumps. It was Friday, and we could hear a group of, educated guess here, college kids, partying hard some distance out, but close enough to hear their screams, whoops, and cheers. Not wanting to give an intrepid, wood-savvy creeper a show, we went in. Not much else happened on night five, but troubled sleep. At one point, Eli woke to frenzied banging on a support post, but it didn't last long or repeat. Night six, final. This was an extra night we received due to the piercingly sulfuric water in the cabin. The filters needed replaced, and so they comped us a night. The water wasn't dangerous, just really, really stinky, like eau de la terre de la rotten egg, bad. And although our nights were weird, we were on our honeymoon and had just been through a tragedy. We spent our days having massive amounts of fun and doing so many awesome things, plus eating great food and drinking the good wine for dinner. Gatlinburg is an amazing place to visit. It was our last night in the hot tub. It was wonderful. Until I began to feel that intense regard from the tree line for the second night in a row. This time it was worse. I could actually feel the ill intent in this gaze. Whenever I came up to cool off, I literally found myself unconsciously wrapping my arms around myself and slipping slowly back down into the water. I reminded my new husband how many years he'd known me and asked how many times he'd known me to be scared or paranoid. I tell him, there is absolutely something aggressive in the tree line looking at me, and it is not a college kid. We could hear them again that night. He scooted over, and I moved to the covered end with him. Within five minutes of me moving, we hear a tremendous crashing from the brush behind us, and then something big stomping around directly below us. This is followed a few seconds later by more crashing and a second pair of footsteps stomping around. They sounded like human steps, but no one could make such a loud noise on the packed earth below the raised deck and cabin. We jumped up and booked it inside, soaking wet. Eli said that night was the worst for the banging. He said there was banging on at least three widely separated posts, and it went on all night. He said when they did let him sleep, the woman would come. I slept like the dead, though, 
unresponsive to everything. Morning of Day 7, Leaving Day Something was demanding my attention, pulling me back towards consciousness. At first, I thought it was the mounted police or one of the mule-pulled carriages that sometimes passed my place. No, this was definitely a whole plethora of horses. Was there a parade I didn't know about? Slowly, I remembered I wasn't in New Orleans, and although what I was hearing sounded like hooves, there were no paved roads anywhere near me at the moment, just the small gravel driveway out front. Quickly snapping awake, I realized the sound was coming from the roof. I checked my phone. It was a few minutes after 8 a.m. I groaned. Why the heck would nobody tell the roofers that the cabin was booked until 11 a.m.? I looked over at Eli. He was pale and breathing very slowly. I half-heartedly poked him a few times, but he was out. Ruefully, I thought of all he'd been dealing with while I slept as deeply as he seemed to be now and left him alone. I'd been with him nearly a decade at this point, and he had never spoken of things like this before. Whatever had been going on, he deserved sleep. At least it was roofers in the sunny morning and not weird crap at 4 a.m. At this point, it crossed my mind to wonder what roofers worked on Sundays. I listened closer. It definitely sounded slightly metallic, but I decided my initial impression held. It sounded like a horse was kicking the crap out of the cabin roof. Well, what the heck do I know about roofing equipment anyway? I'd have to ask them to stop until we checked out. I pulled back the covers and swung my legs off the bed. The instant my feet touched the floor, the pounding on the roof stopped dead, and the handle to the main door, which was about three to four steps in front of me, started jiggling violently. Two things. There was no pause between the noises. They went from on the roof slightly towards the opposite side of the cabin above where Eli was sleeping, to the doorknob in front of me without a time delay. Also, the top half of the door was glass with a sheer curtain, which the sun was shining directly through. I could plainly see that no one was near the door. Yet, I could also see the handle rattling wildly. I yanked my feet up and dove under the blankets up to my chin like a kid. I'm ashamed to say... As soon as my feet left the floor, the doorknob stopped rattling, and the incessant pounding on the roof resumed in the same spot, again with no pause between them during the switch. I'm now staring at Eli, wondering if I should wake him. I'm scared I won't be able to, but I'm also just as scared he'll wake up and won't hear it at all. His eyelids flutter open, taking the decision out of my hands. I ask him if he hears that, and thank all the gods he says yes. I'm hesitant to talk about the door when he just opened his eyes, so we talk about what it sounds like first. He also immediately goes to roofers. I ask if that sounds like a hammer to him, and he says no, actually. We agree that it does sound like hooves, or something slightly softer than metal. This whole time I realized we've automatically been whispering and this pounding just keeps going on and on. Looking around the cabin, we see the mirror shaking, glasses in the kitchen area rattling, the cabinets quaking. Whatever was on the roof shook the walls of the cabin repeatedly. The pounding lasted about 35 minutes, because I checked my phone right when it woke me, and right after it stopped, from about 8.02 a.m. to 8.36 a.m., although I'm not sure how long it'd been going on before it woke me. It was loud and strong and absolutely terrifying. We lay whispering for a time. No way was this a person or people. We started thinking, whatever it was, was trying to bust in through the roof, although the glass doors would surely have been easier to get through. When Eli said he was getting up to look, I told him about the doorknob shaking when I tried to get up. After a brief hesitation, he threw back his covers and sat up. The pounding stopped. He and I both froze. A terrible grating noise sliding on the roof broke the silence. 
we both looked at each other with big eyes and pale faces. Was that Claus? I hissed in the quietest voice I could manage. He leapt back up onto the bed, and the banging resumed. The quietest discussion ever followed about if we had really just heard claws up there. We thought it was exactly the sound huge claws would make, but really it could still be anything. Eli grabbed his legally owned firearm from his bedside drawer before quickly standing. The pounding stopped for a second to allow for another grinding rasp to sound across the roof. That is definitely freaking claws, I said. The pounding immediately resumed, twice as fast and even harder if that were possible. I could now feel the thumps reverberating through the bed. Eli told me to stay inside and listen. Whatever it was, it sounded huge, and he needed me to let him know what direction I heard it move in if it ran out of his view up there. He burst out the door and aimed his gun at the roof. The pounding stopped. There was absolute silence. There was no sound of running anywhere on the roof, and the roof didn't have a darn thing on it. In addition, being perched on the side of the hill as the cabin was, with no trees nearby, there was nowhere anything up there could have gone. We packed at mock speed, but did have one last smoke in the driveway to help with the shaking and nerves. It was open, so it seemed relatively safe. While we smoked... We could hear the people who had been partying the last few nights. They were all out yelling for a missing friend. We heard them yelling about the last time they saw him, which was apparently the night before. We could hear their panic as they screamed his name over and over. Eli and I tried to find the group to help look and ask if they had seen or heard anything weird. However, the winding one-way dirt roads were confusing and we ended up lost. We actually think they may have been locals, and we couldn't get to them because we were on rental cabin roads, which don't connect to local roads and driveways for obvious reasons. I really hope they found him passed out drunk in a bush somewhere. I regret not being able to locate them and help them look. I have no idea what this was. Nearly every major paranormal MO showed up from orbs, weird calls, and poltergeist activity, to cryptid-type goings-on and the lady in white. Yet it all really did seem like one thing in different outfits, if you will. After coming home, we had no more weird activity at the time. I did request for the departed to stand witness from a deceased brother who owed me a favor, but I specifically requested only the blessed dead and only for the wedding ceremony. This didn't seem like protective ancestors to me, though, so I don't think it was necessarily related. I actually lean towards some type of nature or elemental-type guardian spirit personally, but that is just conjecture. Even though he said differently at the time, Eli now thinks it was a Bigfoot, although I think not. If you made it this far, thank you for your time and listening to my oh-so-memorable honeymoon. Any ideas on what we may have encountered are welcome. I'd love to hear what everyone thinks. Thank you, and best wishes. A Change of Habit From Phil Not often do unexplainable things happen to me. It was this one occurrence, however, that stuck with me ever since it had happened. Sure, scary things have happened to me, like getting pulled over or going to the hospital, but that stuff is relatively common, if ghosts and unexplainable creatures are out of the picture. Anyway, to give my story some background, I live in Kentucky, and I've always been a car enthusiast. Along with that, I've always aspired to be successful to the point where I would not have to work the standard 9 to 5. I've been in a self-made business for the past few years, and I think it's nothing short of a miracle how successful I've been. The first few years were absolute grinding without a doubt, but now I'm at a point where cash flow runs my budget. I'm thankful for all the blessings I've been given, but along with these blessings, crap has happened too. This happened when I turned 35. 
when I went ahead and bought my dream car with the money I had to spend. A 2018 Nissan GTR Nismo. Man, is it a fast car. So fast and fun that I didn't feel one ounce of regret in spending the money I did for it. The wife wasn't exactly approving, but she's grown to enjoy driving it from time to time. Michael, my lifelong buddy, had owned a 2017 Mustang GT350 at the time. With the aftermarket exhaust setup he had, you'd go deaf being right next to it while redlining the machine. To say we liked cars would be an understatement. We loved them. Only thing that teed me off was when he ragged on me for driving an automatic, as his GT350 was manual. But I'd come right back at him with a classic Mustang joke. Just stay away from crowds and you'll be just fine. Anyway, this incident happened one night while Michael and I were on a drive, cruising through the local back roads that we'd normally take on the weekends while neither of us were busy. I live in a country-oriented area surrounded by forest, which isn't too far from the suburbs. It's great having peace and quiet while also having the convenience to be able to drive 10 minutes to your local supermarket and whatnot. It was around 10 o'clock at night at that point. I was waiting for Michael to arrive. Finally, I heard the faint yet familiar roar of his engine a few miles away. The guy just loved flying in that thing. Honestly, I was surprised he hadn't gotten a ticket in the past two years of owning the car. He arrived and I went into my garage to fire up the GTR. Even though it was a six-cylinder, it still had an excellent tone to it. I backed out and he led the way down the long stretch of driveway. That day we took a route about 20 minutes away. This route was located in a really dense area of woods. Plenty of curves and turns for us to enjoy. We'd often come here during the day to drive around solely because of the views as well. That night, we decided we'd drive around this area for fun, and I would see if I could keep up with Michael, which was no problem. Looking back at it, I should have been the one leading. After driving for some time, it was midnight. We were on our way back to my house to finish the drive. We eventually came upon a mile stretch of straightaway back road, and this is where Michael tore away. He was full on sending it straight down the road, and I kept on his tail. I slowed down after hitting about 90, out of fear of hitting a deer or some sort of wildlife. Michael, however, disregarded anything that could stand in his way, because he wanted to prove he was more daring than me. He had gotten a considerable distance away, when I heard his brakes screech all of a sudden. He almost wiped out as he downshifted to a halt. I sped up a little at this point to catch up and see what the heck just happened. I thought to myself, that idiot had it coming going that fast. He probably almost hit a deer. As my car approached his, he sped off once again, driving like a psychopath. I called him on Bluetooth and he picked up in an instant. He said, Dude, my brakes just stopped working all of a sudden, and I saw these two figures in the road ahead. I was only able to brake as I swerved right past them, and then they dissolved. I had no idea what he was talking about, especially how he said, them. Who were they? I got goosebumps as he said this, and I wasn't sure if he was trying to screw with me, but that just wouldn't have made sense. So I took him seriously. I asked what these figures looked like. Michael just said, They were in the middle of the road, just staring right at me. I couldn't really make out how they looked, I was going so fast, but they matched the statures of an adult. The two silhouettes appeared out of nowhere, and when I noticed them, I felt a feeling of dread wash over me. It was nothing like I'd felt before. The sinking feeling in my stomach was multiplied by a thousand. My brakes suddenly wouldn't work as I was slamming down on the pedal. As I was about to hit them and swerved, they... Uh, they went up into thin air. The two of us drove on for another minute, still on the phone, just trying to make sense of what happened. It was at this moment Michael said, Ah, oh, crap. 
I see two people walking along the side of the road opposite of us. They were walking in the direction we were coming. As we drove nearer, the two silhouettes continued at their pace. We were going at a crawling speed of 20 miles an hour now, because Michael had been so shaken up at what just happened on the straightaway. He didn't have it in him to speed up as we passed these two now recognizable teenage-looking kids. They were ghostly pale, and their faces were emotionless. One boy and one girl with ripped and tattered clothes on. It looked as if they'd been in an accident. Their bodies were disfigured and mangled, and yet they were walking flawlessly down the road. I swallowed hard as we passed them. These must be the same two people Michael had almost crashed into a few minutes ago. But I couldn't stop thinking of how they had gotten here. They stopped and stared at us as we drove by. As I rode past, I looked at them in my rearview mirror. They walked into the tree line, out of sight. I was holding back tears at this point in disbelief and nervousness. Suddenly, out of nowhere, two bright lights began to shine behind me. They belonged to some sort of car. I'm pretty sure it was an older Mercedes, but I wasn't quite sure. It was just too dark out to be completely certain. Whatever the car was, it had begun to ride my bumper. Michael noticed the car too and was exclaiming, What the heck is this guy doing? I responded scared out of my wits. I don't know, man. Let's just get to the main road and off this back road. We had eventually gotten to the main road, and that's when the car made an abrupt halt. As we got onto the main road, we saw the car sit there motionless with its high beam still on. We drove on until the car became faint, to the point of us not being able to see it. It had never moved. We soon got back to my house and started a fire in the backyard. I brought out my wife and we explained the whole incident to her. She was clearly just as disturbed as us once we had finished explaining the whole thing. We all kind of just sat there, contemplating all of this. It had grown real late at this point, and Michael had decided to go back home, emotionally distraught. I quietly led him out to his car, and we had made plans to meet up at some point in the future. Fast forward a few days later, I was driving on the very road where everything took place, just to check things out. It was around noon, when I noticed something I had never seen before. Even though I'd driven this road many times, I was not aware of the cross I'd seen on the side of the road as I drove through the straightaway this time. I stopped the car and studied the cross through my window. It was a roadside memorial, yet it didn't seem to be for one person. There were two people, a boy and a girl. Tears were streaming down my eyes at this point, and I felt an unnerving feeling of unease as I sat in my car, which was stopped, in the middle of the now desolate straightaway. I didn't hesitate to drive cautiously out of that area. I shivered so hard the way home that I had trouble driving around corners and keeping my hands firm on the steering wheel. Ever since that day, nothing has really happened to me. I told Michael about the cross, and he vowed he'd never be going on that back road again, whether it be day or night. When I think about it, all I feel is confusion and apprehension. I tried reading the names on the cross, but the whole memorial was just too worn down. I haven't been back on that road since then, neither to check on that cross nor to see if anything strange would happen. Quite frankly, I'm just too scared. The way Michael reacted that night shook me. He's a confident guy, but the way he reacted on that road was like none other. It really made me realize the emotional toll that experience had on him. When he vowed to never drive that road again, he also vowed to never be as reckless as he was that night ever again on a public road. Sure, a promise is only a promise, but it ultimately comes down to the man who made it. I've seen something incredible happen. My friend has stuck with that promise ever since he made it. The whole incident messed with him to the point of selling his car. That's how much it reminded him of that freakish night. 
I really don't blame him. I get goosebumps whenever I think back to it. Since then, he's transferred to a simple WRX. Still fun, but not at all as fast. Especially with his younger daughter now, he figured he might as well get a car that is more family friendly. In a way, what happened humbled each of us. No matter how hard you try, you can never be 100% ready for the unknown. We've done our best to make peace with the event, and all I can say personally is I've been a more considerate driver since that day forward. The caution I now exercise on the road has made me realize something. Call me crazy, but I believe they saved our lives, even if it wasn't their goal that night. Reckless driving destroys people and their families. As ominous as the incident seemed at first, I've started to look at it in a different perspective. They saved us from ourselves, regardless of what they were attempting to do that night. I've taken my lesson out of it. I've no idea where I would be today if this hadn't happened. More importantly, I don't know where my best friend would be. With the way he had driven before that point, he was bound to have something happen to him. Bad habits carry on throughout life, and only serious events and dedication can change those habits for the better. Always be aware of the lessons we're given throughout life. These are important and teach us to be better people to the ones around us and ourselves. Owl's Hollow Road, from Level Zero. When I was in high school, my friends and I loved to ride around at night and explore new locations around town. We tried to find roads that seemed to go nowhere. Sometimes we'd try one and it would only go a mile or so to a dead end. On other occasions, we would ride for an hour before we'd gone far enough then we'd find a way back home. Keep in mind, we lived in a decent-sized city, surrounded by nothing but mountains and farmland, so we had no idea where we'd end up when we took a road on the outskirts that led off towards some mountain or field. It was often exciting, sometimes boring, but nothing major ever happened. We just smoked our weed and drank our beer while driving in the middle of nowhere with no fear of the cops. It was around 2006 we discovered maps on the internet, and we thought we might try to find a decent road to take that we'd never gone down before. After all, these maps would show us the approximate length and where it would lead to. We chose Owl's Hollow Road. This one was strange because we had never noticed it before, even though it began near the middle of town and branched off of a main road near some apartments, which we already knew well. Nonetheless, we grabbed our weed and drinks and jumped in my old blue Chevy truck for what looked like a pretty long drive. We weren't too worried because the road ended on the main highway by a gas station that led straight back to my house. We were driving down this road that we had discovered, enjoying ourselves to the fullest, but eventually things turned out to be a bit creepy. It was completely wooded on both sides, with branches hanging over the road like some sort of tunnel. There were a few small homes at the start, but human dwellings soon stopped showing up after a few miles. We were about 30 miles in when I questioned my friends if they had any idea how long the road was. It had been quite a long time, and we hadn't seen a streetlight or even a house in miles. Their response was, no, how are we supposed to tell by the lines on this map? I then decided to inform them that I was going to be needing gas soon, as the warning light had been on for about 15 miles now. Quickly, they flogged me with questions of, Why didn't you tell us before? We should have just turned around. I myself was enraptured with the spookiness and nothingness of this location, nestled in the valley of the mountain. It was all completely unknown to me. There turned out to be no gas stations or any homes on this road before we ran out of gas. Everyone freaked out considering no one knew where we were, and neither did we. 
I told my friends to calm down and at the very least we could just sit and smoke some while we waited for someone to pass by. Then we could ask them for help. Immediately, they reminded me that we had not seen another car, house, or light in 30 miles. If for nothing else but to calm them down, I told them they didn't make roads for nothing. And about that time, we actually saw headlights in the distance for the first time in nearly an hour. My best friend Sam immediately jumped out and flagged down the truck that was heading towards us. The driver was a burly, white-haired, and bearded man, whose face looked like it had been cooking in the sun for 70 years. He politely asked if he could help. Yes, we ran out of gas and we're hoping you could help us out, Sam shouted. We thought no one would come. The man then informed us that he had a gas can at his house about 20 minutes down the road. The man asked if anyone would like to go with him rather than just sit out here. He claimed that some weird things went on out there. Obviously, I wasn't leaving my pride and joy in the middle of nowhere alone, and my brother and our friend John decided it would be more fun to just sit and get messed up while waiting. Sam, however, decided to hop into the bed of the man's truck, claiming he wanted to ensure he came back to help us. Sam was gone, and he wouldn't be back for a while. It was then that I noticed a fire in the woods. I pointed the fire out to John and my brother, who asked what the deal was. People probably camp out here since it's so secluded. I guess because I was high and a little drunk, I decided to go check it out, and told them they could come with me or stay here. They came along, and that was a huge mistake. I had been bluffing about going alone. If they had just stayed in the truck, none of this would have happened. We followed the fire through thick brush and brambles. We even crossed a small creek, which I thought in hindsight reminded me of the one from The Blair Witch Project. Yeah, kinda creepy. We were just about to the source of the flame when it completely disappeared. Not a trace of smoke or anything as soon as we were 20 yards from it. I looked around, and I saw my companion's faces in the moonlight, stunned as I was, because another 50 yards ahead was another fire. We looked back and could still see the moon reflecting off the bright blue of my Chevrolet. At this point, we decided we had come too far and should investigate the strange fire further. Maybe we had been high and misjudged the distance. Nevertheless, we continued after the fire, which further led us into the woods. Yet, each time we got close, it would disappear and reappear further in the woods. I'm not joking and have witnesses to this. To this day, we still talk about this moving fire. So, about the fourth time we finally caught up to the fire, at which point we were 200 yards into the woods at least, the fire didn't move. It had stopped moving. We were able to walk near it. But that's when we saw a masked figure surrounding it, chanting something in some language we could not understand. We had been quiet and not talking at all since the first instance, so we were not noticed, not right away. As soon as my younger brother caught a glimpse of the scene, he whispered to me, They were trying to lure us here. We are meant to be sacrifices. Before I could tell him how dumb that sounded, almost as if they could hear him, every head in the ceremony turned right towards us. There must have been twenty of them. With a roar from each of them, and a scream from us, we turned and ran back the direction we came. With no fire to guide us now, we were guessing, running into trees, tripping over logs, tearing our clothes on briars. We fled as fast and as far as we could, as we were undoubtedly pursued by these people. We could hear them coming, and they most certainly were human because, like us, we could hear them injuring themselves just as we were. Finally, we all made it to the truck. I saw Sam to my delight, 
pouring gas into my truck with no sign of the man who had helped him. He waved and shouted, asking where we'd been. Is there enough gas in the truck? I shouted. Uh, yeah, I, I was just pouring in the rest, he replied. Get in the truck, now! I screamed frantically. Without question, maybe because he could hear the commotion behind us, he hopped in the passenger seat and opened the back door for the others. I ran around to the driver's seat as fast as I could and started the truck, or I tried to. After about five seconds of prayer and trying, she fired right up. And right on cue, a man stepped out into the middle of the road to block our way. If that's how it was going to be, it was either going to be his death or mine. And I chose his. Right before I hit him with the truck, he jumped to the side and, surprisingly, let us go. On the way, explaining everything to Sam was very simple, because the man had told him he wished the others would have come too, because of the devil worshippers. The man said they go into the woods at night, and we weren't the first people to disappear out there. Sam believed us right away, because the man had left his gas and gas can with him for free and told him it was too late to be out there. And then, of course, Sam saw the cloaked, masked man try to bar our way. Not only that, but he kept swearing he could see cloaked silhouettes staring at us the rest of the way through the woods. The road turned out to be only about 10 miles further, and we were home in about half an hour. Everyone was fine, except for some minor and a few major cuts, scrapes, and bruises. One thing is sure, I now keep my tank full before going down any unknown road. Cross Country From Spence Part 1 The Runners from the 80s to late 90s, I worked in the sales end for a printer company. Exciting, right? My job wasn't simple sales, though. It was corporate sales. This had me driving to different cities or states to meet with executives of companies to demonstrate our printers to convince them to use our printers throughout all their offices in the region. A successful sale meant a lot of money for the company. They provided me a company car and eventually a company credit card for flights and rental cars, but for several years I was required to drive. The company didn't want to pay for flights that frequent at the time, so for a while I would routinely drive nearly from coast to coast. I'm talking anywhere from 30 to 40 hour drives every month. I might have been paid for each of those hours, but I'll be darned if that much driving and alone time doesn't get to you. My constant road trips brought me across various sites and encounters, some of which have kept me on edge even now. At a certain point, it filled me with dread when I knew I'd be forced to drive through certain roads or regions because of what I had previously encountered there. On several occasions, I would find myself driving back and forth through endless miles of fields in Nebraska to demonstrate some model revisions to a company in Wyoming, a company my higher-ups thought were almost ready to buy but it ended up being a series of wasted trips after the company in question never made the switch to our products. But they really liked those demonstrations, I guess. Anyway, these had to be among the most boring drives I'd ever taken in my career. Much of it was just a straight drive with samey-looking fields for a couple of hours. And the drive back was the worst part. My schedule had me driving back through these fields after dark, which was somehow worse, I didn't like driving in the dark, and by then it was around 2 a.m., and it'd be another three hours before I could make it to a decent place to finally sleep, then get some early breakfast. So imagine my shock one night, when I was driving back after yet another failed sales meeting half asleep, when several silhouettes began to emerge on either side of my car, about half a dozen of them. Whatever they were, I saw them emerge from the stalks of vegetation that made up the fields. The stalks bent sharply, many breaking under the weight of these large silhouettes that then came forward 
and began to bound along the road, keeping pace with my car. I was driving about 40 miles per hour. I'd always been a stickler for obeying speed limits. But that's still pretty fast for an animal, right? Especially for a land animal in North America. I'd lived in cities and suburbs forever, but I knew about coyotes and even wolves in certain parts of North America. But these things, they didn't look like that. They didn't look right at all. And as I sped up, terrified, to 55 miles per hour trying to outrun them, they matched my speed without so much as a misstep. They never got directly in front of my headlights, so I didn't get a perfect look at them. But I did glance dozens of times from left to right, trying to get some kind of details. The first thing I noticed was that these creatures' shoulders were two to three times taller and more broad than their hips. Their front legs looked far and away more powerful than their back legs. Their shoulders were their highest points, with the head tucked a few inches lower. That being said, their shoulders came up to the halfway point of my side window, which I think would have been about four and a half feet. I could see floppy ears atop their low heads, as well as extremely long snouts. That was probably the weirdest part. Take the snout of a greyhound and double it in length. It was like crocodile proportions. While I kept driving along, heart pounding, turning the radio up as I now sped up to 60. Only when the speed approached 65 did I finally start to see these creatures lag behind, but it was steady. When I heard the scratch tear along the passenger side door, I shouted a curse. One of those things had attacked the car. That convinced me to flatten the accelerator. I must have hit 90 going down that road and I didn't stop even after the silhouettes lagged behind and disappeared into the darkness and fields behind me. I sped all the way to the first gas station I could find, absolutely grateful that a cop didn't pull me over along the way. The memory of the trouble I got in when I got back to the office with the company car is just as vivid. I tried to explain that some animal had swiped at my car after coming out of the fields, but they still deducted the damage from my next check and warned me that if it happened again, I'd be using my own car for a while. A few months after that, I had to go back to that same company for yet another demonstration. That first run-in with those creatures was fresh on my mind. So when I took the day trip through Nebraska on my way to Wyoming, I was terribly on edge as I passed through those fields. Luckily, nothing happened but I'm afraid my anxiety about passing through on my way back after dark got the better of me during the demo. I ended up stuttering a bit when I hadn't messed up my presentations in ages, not since I was new to the demo meetings. After the usual we will call you from the execs after the demo, I got back in my car and sighed. Did I really have to drive back through there? I wondered. I began to brainstorm alternate paths, but I wasn't very familiar with the surrounding roads and detours. And if I got myself lost, I'd get back later than expected with the company car and I might lose it. If I was forced to take my own car, my clunker, back at home, I couldn't really afford all that gas for these trips at the time. I resolved to just get it over with. I told myself the first sign of nonsense out in those fields, I would just speed right up to 90. Police or speeding tickets be darned. I made my way back to and through Nebraska. My stomach was doing flips, and admittedly I was getting gassy, which usually did happen to me when I got severe anxiety. I just wanted the trip through Nebraska to be done. Soon I was driving through those quiet, almost motionless fields. For a while, nothing happened. Everything seemed normal. I wished my visibility was better as there was a new moon that night, but everything was going smoothly otherwise. Then, I saw it. Instead of speeding up, I found myself slowing down. I was flabbergasted. It was one of those things, those runners. It stood on the right side of the road, between the asphalt and the fields. It was focused on something below it, tearing into it the way a dog would, one especially massive paw on the carcass while pulling at the meat with its mouth. 
The creature it was eating appeared to be smaller, with some dark fur and some light fur. Probably a possum. As I got closer to it, it calmly turned and looked at my car. It was the first time I'd seen one of these things right in front of my headlights. It looked like a mutated collie. Extra long snout as I described before, long but messy hair and floppy ears, but it all had a collie sort of look to it. It didn't look menacing like it seemed the first time. I watched it lick its mouth like a dog who had been distracted from his kibbles. It didn't seem angry or bothered, it sort of just looked at me. It appeared to be around 400 pounds, that's how big it was. I remember shaking my head and wondering if this really was the same thing I'd seen before. The shoulders were broad and the hips were thinner. The snout was unusually long. It had to be the same creature. I pressed down on the accelerator, reminding myself that one of these things had in fact clawed the door last time, meaning that if I hadn't been in a car, it might have wanted to eat me. As my speed climbed to around 50 miles per hour, I began to see more of them on the side of the road. Like large dogs, they were sleeping on their sides. One was panting and lying down. It watched me as I passed through. All this was so bizarre, seeing something so weird looking, acting so typical. My heart rate rose even still, and I drove on out of there, only realizing I'd sped up to 90 miles per hour again when I began to see the lights of civilization ahead. I couldn't stop thinking, if these things were so nonchalant about hanging out on the side of the road, I couldn't have been the only person to ever see them, right? Part 2. Touched Long before the encounter with those runners put the fear of the nighttime road in me, I'd been keen to nap at truck stops when my eyes got too heavy, and accommodation was few and far between. On a particular trip, I was driving through Missouri when I stopped at a payphone to call in and check with my boss. I think the call was to ask if I could swap one of the models out in the demo with an older one, as that newer model kept jamming. But my boss was happy I called because they'd received a call not too long ago about the demo being cancelled. My boss was noticeably upset on the phone because cancelling something like this cost them money. As for me, I didn't mind. It was less for me to do, and I was still getting paid to turn around and drive back. Sadly, though, I was too far from home to drive back without rest. I ended up stopping at a truck stop, one of those oddly big ones with a fast food chicken joint built into the side, and at least 20 types of beef jerky on sale at the counter. I got the gas refilled, bought some coffee and beef jerky, then found a nice spot away from the customer lot to rest. You might be wondering why I got coffee if I was about to sleep, but coffee had always made me more tired if I drank it afternoon. I don't know why. After my snack, I turned on the AC and adjusted the radio to some late night talk show. I crawled in the back where there was more room to lay down, and I lowered the window closest to my feet, letting my feet sit and hang on the open window sill. I've always had trouble cooling down and the night was cooler than my AC, so I thought having the window down would help me get cool and let me accommodate my full length. After some time, I fell asleep. I can't say it was very good sleep. I'm a big snorer, and I ended up snoring myself awake at some point. As one usually does after waking up in the middle of the night, I was about to readjust myself to get more comfortable, when I suddenly felt some resistance at my feet. I looked down at my feet hanging at the window, and I stopped breathing for a moment. I saw a large man's hand, pale and veiny with bitten nails, loosely holding on to my left foot. It was motionless. Whoever it belonged to seemed to be crouched down as the arm went downward below the window. For the next several minutes, I sat there, staring at the hand and thinking to myself, this can't be freaking real. Who the heck is grabbing me in the middle of the night at a truck stop? I pumped myself up. I figured some homeless person might have been trying to get my attention and perhaps they'd passed out near my car. Gathering my courage, in a split second I shot straight over to the window and I looked down. 
The ground was bare. My heart began to pound. I'd sat there for several minutes staring at what was clearly and unmistakably a hand, which I could clearly feel on my foot, and yet it was gone. The owner of the hand was nowhere to be seen. I jumped out of the car then and went prone on the ground, searching the underside of the car. Nothing. No one was there. I stood up and looked everywhere in the distance. There was only one other vehicle here in this lot, a semi-truck, and it was parked too far from me for me to have not seen someone run over there to hide. Now wide awake, I circled my car and practically jumped back in, carrying on my merry way back home, on what was probably less than half an hour of sleep. <laughs>